Okay, maybe uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, workshop on cross community fabric learning. This is a four day uh, hybrid uh, workshop. And where the in person part will take place in this room uh, in uh, Santa Clara uh, Co Convention Center. And the virtual part will uh, be on the Zoom and the uh, gather time. Uh, I'm Tian Yi Chen, uh, one of the organizers of this uh, workshop uh, with my uh, fellow organizers, Ping Yu, Nasli from IBM, and Kali from CMU. Uh, we have put together this uh, workshop today. And in today's uh, uh, workshop, we have in person. Uh, session, we have our um, workflow chair, uh, Yu Hang, and myself to host the in-person part, and the Ping Yu and Kali will be on the uh, Zoom to host the uh, sessions. Um, so our workshop gets a generous uh, support from um, FedML, a new startup company on the area of federated learning and machine learning in general, and the Fed machine learning system organizing committee. Uh, without them, our, uh, we cannot make uh, this program possible. And uh, our hybrid workshop co contains uh, three parts. Uh, one is uh, uh, keynote speakers, uh, keynote presentations, including both the in-person and the virtual speakers. And the in-person, uh, and also we have the in-person uh, live do uh, uh, de demonstration on the cutting edge uh, federated learning library uh, supported by the federated learning uh, ML um, company. And we also have the uh, post session at the end, um, which includes um, uh, roughly uh, 14 uh, excellent posters. So the first part, the keynote speakers, um, we, we, as our um, the name of our workshop suggests, we invite speakers from uh, two, three different communities. Um, we have two speakers from uh, optimization, mathematical optimization uh, community, uh, they are uh, Professor Peter uh, Richtarik and Professor Wotao Ying. And we also have speakers from a signal processing and uh, information theory uh, communities. Uh, they are Professor um, Sama Estimir and Professor Yunina Eda. And we also have experts from uh, uh, com uh, computer assistant and architecture communities, uh, such as Professor uh, Radu uh, Makuleski and uh, uh, Professor Yuan Chen. So the second part is a uh, uh, live demo uh, sessions. We will uh, this is presented by uh, Chao Yang uh, from FedML, and he will present in person, which roughly includes, uh, 45 minutes to introduce uh, the federated FedML, um, and also will include 45 minutes uh, session to run a demo on uh, federated FedML products, and it will also leave uh, roughly 30 minutes for Q and A. So in the uh, third part, uh, we will have post sessions. Um, which will be um, on the gather town and the uh, um, audience who are in this room and also the uh, virtual uh, audience can uh, using the QR code to uh, enter this uh, gather town to interact with uh, um, host presenters. And we will have um, a FedML sponsored uh, best poster uh, award uh, where each awardees will receive a $500 cash uh, award. So um, let's see. So now it's 9 a.m. Uh, the time is very uh, good. So we will have our uh, first speaker um, today, um, Professor Peter Richtarik. And Professor Peter Richtarik is a professor of CS uh, at the uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology Coast and Saudi Arabia, where he um, leads the optimization and machine learning lab. Prior to joining a course, uh, he was uh, an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he received his PhD in 2007 from Cornell. Um, so th through his work on randomized and distributed optimization, he has uh, contributed uh, significantly to the foundation of optimization and machine learning. And he is also the one of the uh, original developers of federated learning. Professor Rich Tariq's uh, works has attracted many international awards, including a best paper award at the New York's uh, Federated Learning Workshop, and also received the Distinguished uh, Speaker Award at the uh, uh, International Conference of Continuous Optimization, and the SIM uh, SIG East Best Paper Award and the IMA uh, Leslie Fox uh, Prize. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Rich Tariq. So the floor is yours, you can share the screen. Good 
Great. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And let's see, is this working? Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, it works. Okay, very good. So let me, I try to hide these videos, otherwise I don't see my own slides. All right, so um, so it's a great pleasure to, to, to have been invited to this uh, beautiful workshop and to give a keynote talk on a topic which I think uh, has been bothering a lot of researchers in the federal learning community for a while. So we're happy that we have contributed to some sort of uh, theoretical understanding of what's going on. So the, the title of the talk uh, is the same as the title of the paper, which uh, I hope you won't think badly of us as authors for having way too many exclamation marks in the title and so on and so forth. Normally we don't do that, but we felt like coming up with a funny title this time around. Uh, so it's called Proskip, there's the algorithm name, and it's something about uh, local gradient steps and the relationship to communication acceleration. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the title that we would have chosen if we didn't feel the way that we felt at the time of submission, which is Prosky breaking the communication there of local gradient methods. So if you don't like the original title, this is maybe more scholarly title. So this is joint work with uh, some amazing collaborators. Uh, first of them, Konstantin Mishenko, who is a former student from my team, Grigory Malinowski is a current student in my team, and Sebastian Stich, a longtime co collaborator uh, now located in Germany. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. So first I'll spend quite a bit of time introducing uh, um, the, the, the question that we're trying to resolve, but maybe not too much because I believe all of you are familiar with the background. And then I'll start talking about the, uh, the, the, the solution uh, and the algorithm, the theory, and, and have a few, few experiments and extensions in the end. Uh, so the introduction. So let me first uh, explain what distributed gradient descent is, which I know this is not necessary at all, but I'll have just a couple of slides on this. Uh, so we want to solve the following uh, very standard uh, fairly learning problem, optimization formulation of fairly learning problem. So you can think of this as, uh, as uh, the average over many loss functions, over finitely many devices. Now, I would want to say that even though normally in, uh, in uh, cross-device fairly learning, this n is infinity, in practice, of course, uh, there are not uh, infinity of devices. So this could be a way of modeling even cross-device uh, setup. Uh, but uh, for the sake of concreteness, let's think this is cross uh, silo fairy learning and, and, and could be big, could be small. This is not the point of the talk. The point of the talk is uh, communication efficiency and the, uh, the way local training and local gradient type steps uh, affect it. Uh, so we work in the setup where the number of, number of parameters or features is very large. And for this reason, uh, we do not want to communicate too much. Uh, we will not have any assumptions on any type of similarity of these functions, which means we don't have any assumptions on any type of similarity of the underlying data stored on these clients. So the data could be arbitrarily heterogeneous or dissimilar. Of course, we'll have assumptions on, on the functions themselves. Uh, so distributed gradient descent is nothing else than just gradient descent applied to the problem of minimization of average of uh, n functions. And since gradient of an average is the average of gradients, uh, distributed gradient descent can be written in this way. Uh, so each client can compute the gradient uh, of uh, their own loss function, but in order to compute the average uh, the clients need to communicate, and this could be bottleneck of any kind of an efficient system, especially if D, the dimensionality of these grains is very large. And this is really what uh, federal learning is trying to resolve, one of the many ways federal learning is trying to resolve. Uh, so distributed grain descent could be also rewritten in an equivalent form, and this of, uh, will be um, important in order to uh, introduce the next method, which would be distributed local gradient descent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the same method completely, but the written a little bit differently. So let's say we have three workers. Each worker receives a current uh, model from the server. 
let's call it XT, a deterioration T or communication around T, and uh, creates own copy of this model so that this copy could be evolved uh, and into, into maybe different copies and takes a local gradient step, single local gradient step. So now these gradients are different uh, on each worker or client because everybody has different data. So these uh, models that uh, each client or worker arrives at after one gradient step would be different. So X1, T plus one, X2, T plus one, and X3, T plus one. Then these models are uh, shipped to the server and this is uh, um, uh, the difficult operation because it takes a lot of time because it involves communication often through uh, uh, weak uh, net net networks. The server averages these models, which is the same thing uh, as uh, performing one uh, gradient step. So this is really just distributed gradient send or gradient send written in a funny way. So why did I do this? Uh, well, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. So, and then this XT plus one, uh, this new model is uh, broadcast back to the workers, and this process is uh, repeated. So, why did I do that? Because I now want to dis uh, want to uh, introduce the local version of this, this should be local gradient send, which does essentially the same thing, except after a copy, local copy is created of all of these models, and a first gradient step is taken by all of these workers. Uh, these uh, models are not uh, sent to the server, but uh, another local gradient step is taken and yet another and so on. So let's say capital K local gradient steps are taken before communication takes place. And the main reason behind this in all the literature on federated learning is uh, to avoid communication. Because if let's say one gradient computation takes, uh, uh, let's say a minute for each client, and then communication takes an hour or several hours or something like that, then, uh, then obviously the, the, this is not an efficient way of uh, using resources. So maybe there is this hope that if you do more local training, uh, then perhaps then when uh, you do uh, the algorithm and you run it this way, then the local training will be effective, will help you to train faster so that you need fewer communication rounds. So that is the hope, however, uh, existing theory does not uh, quite support uh, this hope. So the uh, the models are averaged and broadcast back. So this is distributed local gradient send. So let me very briefly outline history of uh, this idea. So let's start several centuries ago, which is gradient send. So this is known to everybody, but local gradient send could be traced uh, at least uh, uh, 20, 30 years uh, ago to uh, this paper by Ovi Mangasarian. So one can argue that uh, local gradient send in some form was already proposed there, but, uh, but we know it mostly from the paper, very famous paper, a federate averaging paper by Brandon McMahon and, and co-authors. So there were some earlier papers from maybe 2016, 15, which proposed the idea in, in a different setup. Um, so federated averaging, uh, as all of you know, is a combination of three ideas. One of them, the key idea is this local training. And uh, two more ideas is uh, client uh, sampling or partial participation and data sampling or stochastic approximation. Uh, so it took uh, quite a bit of time for uh, methods which take multiple local steps to be analyzable without any data similarity or homogeneity assumptions. So a couple of years, and in this paper by Colin and, and, and Constantine, who is also co-author of this paper that this talk is based on myself, uh, we gave analysis of local GD without assuming any type of uh, data uh, homogeneity. However, what we got was a result which said that uh, these local steps don't help, that in theory, the method is worse with local steps than without local steps. And that, of course, uh, is a problem because in practice, local steps do help. So what's going on? So this paper certainly didn't resolve that issue, but at least it resolved the issue of, at least we had some analysis of local uh, gradient method without assuming homogeneity. So why this helps is because uh, uh, numerically, if you look at uh, local gradient ascent, it behaves roughly like this. So if you take just one local step, which means GD uh, on each client, then you get this kind of uh, linear rate. Let's say this is a strongly convex uh, setup, very simple uh, problem. But if you take, let's say, 32 local steps instead, so that's the other extreme, then what happens is that uh, convergence is much faster in terms of communication runs, but it also more quickly converges to some local neighborhood of the solution. 
So if all that we need is a solution of this type of accuracy, then obviously taking 32 steps is much better than taking one step because we save in communication quite massively. However, this is not exactly supported by theory. Theory doesn't quite uh, explain this and we don't have any quantification of uh, this improvement. And, and that, that's a problem. And another problem, of course, is why do these uh, methods get stuck at these local um, neighborhoods uh, rather than uh, keep uh, converging to the solution? So these are two main challenges uh, which remained after, after this work from uh, roughly five years ago or, or three years ago. Okay, so, so, the, so, so one of these uh, challenges was overcome very recently in a sequence of three papers by three different sets of authors who, who came up with variations of local gradient scent which do not get stuck at local optima. So this is the scaffold paper that was the first of them by uh, Karim Reddy and, and co-authors and uh, S local GD by, by uh, two students of mine and, and myself and, and Fedlin uh, uh, earlier uh, last year. So all of these methods uh, remove the problem of convergence just to a neighborhood of the solution. So you get a linearly convergent method in the smooth, strongly convex setup. Uh, however, uh, when you look at the theory of all of these three papers, what happens is that the theory is worse than the theory of gradient descent, or at best uh, equal to it. So um, that means that we don't see any improvement in theory from taking local steps. So, so while this, these are the best uh, results uh, that we had at the time and that we have uh, so far, uh, they do not explain the power of local steps. Uh, but of course, that, that, that is the state of the art uh, um, at the time of writing of our paper. Uh, so so, so the, the second question remained. So local gradient steps, they do help in fairy learning. That's why uh, all the methods that I use in practice use local training, uh, all of them. So in, in, in to, to that extent that uh, whenever a paper has federated learning in the title of federated optimization, it, it almost is synonymous to, to a method which takes local steps. Uh, so local steps improve communication efficiency in practice, but in theory, they do not. So what's going on? So maybe we're misunderstanding something. Maybe the situation is hopeless. Maybe we're just lucky with the data sets that we see. It's, it's unclear what's going on. So, so this is really the problem that we try to resolve uh, in our paper. So here is a summary of the results that we get, and I'll spend a little bit of time here and then just unpack the details. So the, in the first row, you see GD. So this is a method which doesn't take uh, any local steps except for one. So, and, and it takes uh, O kappa communication runs, where kappa is a condition number, and this is smooth, strongly convex setup. Uh, there is uh, step size one over L, there's classical GD step size. The full dimensional model is sent, and there's just one local step per round. Then we have these three methods. Okay, we have local GD in between. So that's the method which converges to a neighborhood only. So the rate is much worse than the rate of gradient descent because there's also division by epsilon behind the logarithmic dependence on epsilon. So this one over epsilon here shows that the, this actually doesn't converge to the solution just to a neighborhood. So this is much uh, quite similar to the behavior of SGD. And then we have these three methods, scaffold, S local GD and FedLin, which have uh, linear rate, and the linear rate can be as good as gradient descent, but it's not better. So, so that is really uh, the state of the art uh, before our uh, work. And uh, what's going on is that in the analysis, uh, when, when we look at it, uh, these uh, algorithms take tau local steps. So there was the capital K uh, in, in, um, in the picture that I had before. But then because we take tau local steps, the step size has to be divided by tau. And this kills uh, really uh, uh, the, the number of local steps. So somehow these taus get canceled out and roughly you get the same theory as if you took just one step with the step size one over L. Uh, so there's some question perhaps. I've heard something. No. No, no, we, no. Okay, but I welcome any questions throughout. So maybe maybe this is a good time to just pause a little bit uh, and I'll take a question or two. Any questions? Maybe we can leave the question at the end. I actually prefer them being taken throughout the 
talk. So if there's any questions, I'll wait. I'm okay waiting. Sure. No question from the in-person audience. Okay. Uh, so be, please do do interrupt me. I like being interrupted. Uh, okay. So in our work, uh, uh, we propose this Proxkip algorithm, which we also call SCAFNU to for the confusion of everybody, including us authors. So, so Proskip is a more general algorithm than uh, algorithm applied to federal learning. And we actually apply it to federal learning. We call it SCAFNU and we call it SCAFNU because it's very similar in structure to Scaffold. Okay, so that's really the story behind the naming. So when we look at the theory of SCAFNU or Proskip applied to federal learning, what we see that we take multiple local steps, but the step size is a one over L. We don't have to diminish the step size by the number of local steps. So the general result says that we take one over P local steps where P is a parameter we can choose. The reason why it's written this funny way and not just tau is because we don't actually take a deterministic number of local steps. We, what, what, what we do in each iteration or in, in each iteration, we flip a coin and with probability P, which is very small, we're going to communicate. And with probably one minus p, which is very large, we're going to continue taking local steps. So the expected number of local steps is one over p. Okay, so if the actual number of local steps could be a little bit larger or, or smaller, depending on, on the coin flips, but the, the one over p is what is comparable to, to tau. Uh, we still send full dimensional uh, vectors, but we take these larger step, large step sizes. And then what our theory says is that uh, the, the number of communication rounds is no longer kappa, but it's p times kappa plus one over p. Okay, so, and, and that this is true for any p between zero and one. We can choose uh, the p ourselves. And uh, when, when, you, when you look at this function, this is a very simple convex function of p, univariate. One over p is convex and p times kappa is even linear. So you can just set the derivative of this to zero and find the optimal p. It turns out that the optimal p is exactly one over square root of kappa. And if optimal p is one over square root of kappa, then one over p, which is the number of local steps, is going to be square root of kappa. So our theory predicts that the optimal number of local steps is square root of the condition number. And when you plug in uh, this p back into this general uh, uh, bound for the number of communications, we get square root of kappa communication complexity, which is accelerated communication complexity. So this is, uh, we're quite excited when we obtain this result because this is the first result which says that local steps actually probably lead to communication acceleration. Of course, the result is limited because this applies only to smooth, strongly convex problems, but even in that setting, we didn't have any results uh, which uh, say that uh, local steps are uh, useful in terms of communication complexity compared to just one local step. So, so this is really the main result. And maybe here I'll just uh, pause again and uh, and uh, give chance uh, the audience to, to ask some questions before I move on. Any questions from both uh, virtual and uh, in-person speakers? Uh, audience? Oh, so maybe I have a question. So here, um, you mentioned these results only hold for smooth and strongly convex uh, problems. Right. What is the difficulty of extending to a non-convex smooth case? Uh, well, acce acceleration in non-convex setting is a completely different phenomenon than acceleration in convex setting. So we know that let's say nestor of type acceleration works for convex functions and strongly convex functions, but not really for non-convex. For non-convex, e even GD, is uh, optimal and, and so on. So in, in, in some settings. So, so somehow acceleration is not the right kind of a thing in, in non-convex regime. So one would have to come up with very different analysis and uh, it's, it's, it's just a different world. Mm -hmm. So we focus on the simplest possible scenario, which is smooth, strongly convex. And in the non-convex, the, the question is uh, very different and, uh, and would require different algorithms. So, um, but but this here it not uh, it, it skip it does, uh, does not equivalent to the acceleration, right? So, no. So this is not a nestor of acceleration. So we get communication acceleration through a new mechanism, which is not nestor of acceleration. And this new mechanism 
is exactly taking local steps. So somehow the idea, which was uh, proposed in federated leveraging uh, algorithm, one of the three ideas that take multiple local gradient type, type steps, actually is the acceleration mechanism. If you take the right number of local steps, that's the acceleration mechanism. However, it only accelerates the number of communication rounds. It doesn't accelerate the total number of uh, gradient type iterations. Because uh, you see that we have square root of kappa uh, communication rounds, but each uh, client has to take square root of kappa gradient steps. So if you multiply the two, it's still kappa gradient steps, but only square root of kappa of those involve communication. So it's in, in some sense, one can think of this as the sem semi-accelerated method. It accelerates the right thing, which is the communication complexity, but doesn't accelerate, accelerate uh, gradient accesses. I see. Then, uh, do you think it's possible to extend to the smooth convex case? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that already was done in one of the follow-up papers, which uh, I will list at the very last slide. I see. Okay. Yeah, there are one question in the from in person audience. Can you speak louder? Oh yeah. So for that's a computer wrong, right? So if you like computer science, maybe science. So if you could repeat it to me, because I cannot really hear from the audience. If you could repeat it to me, always there'll be. Yes. So the question is that whether you have client selection or you involve all the clients in each round whenever mm -hmm. you want to compute. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So we only know how to do this with full client participation. Uh, so we tried for quite a bit of time and uh, we failed to do partial participation for Proxkit. So there is some fundamental issue here, or maybe we're missing something simple, but uh, at the moment, that's uh, a major uh, open question. Okay, yeah, the audience is satisfied. Okay, so I'll keep going. So, so since I mentioned that this is somehow related, at least uh, at the surface, to nestor of acceleration, because we see squares of condition numbers, which is what what we are used to seeing for accelerated uh, methods, uh, uh, we produce this uh, plot which compares proskip to nestor of accelerated. Uh, Gradient ascent, and we see that Proxkip can be substantially faster than nestor of acceleration. So these local steps uh, can can uh, accelerate um, more. All right. So let me now start talking about how we actually think of uh, federated learning in order to propose Proxkip. So the way we think of it is a, probably a little bit non-standard for the federated learning literature but very standard for the distributed uh, optimization literature. So we reformulate this uh, finite sum problem into a finite sum problem in a lifted space where each client is allowed to have a different model XI. So before the model had to be shared, now uh, the models could be different. But then we immediately introduce a penalty which says that the penalty is infinite if the models are different and it's zero if the models are the same. So this is completely equivalent so-called consensus reformulation of the original problem. So then uh, uh, once we do that, uh, we work with this particular penalty, but we don't stop there because we're interested uh, here beyond these particular penalties. We want to do something more general than what applies to uh, distributed training or federated learning. So we work uh, with uh, any kind of a indicator function of a convex set, not just this convex set, which says all of these XIs are the same. And as soon as you uh, assume that the set is a closed convex and non-empty, then everything is going to be fine. However, we go uh, yet one more step beyond, and we assume that this uh, penalty is simply just a proper closed convex function. Uh, and this is just one example of a proper closed convex function. So in fact, we work with this uh, reformulation minimize sum of fi's xi's plus a proper closed convex penalty and since we don't need to carry all of these xi's around so just for simplicity of not notation we just have a simple composite optimization problem in this lifted space so that's why there's d prime and not d so d prime would be n times d minimization of the sum of a an l smooth and strongly convex function f and a proper, proper closed convex function. So this is a very well-known and highly studied uh, optimization problem. And one of the key methods for solving this is proximal gradient sense. So let's start there in order to 
see how Proxkip actually was born. So uh, first uh, I'll mention some assumptions. So we'll assume that F is uh, L uh, smooth and the mu is strongly convex. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this uh, regularizes proper closing convex. So I'm not going to mention too uh, in, in much detail what these things mean. I'll assume the audience is familiar with these uh, concepts. And proximal gradient ascent uh, simply alternates a gradient mapping with the, the proximity mapping. So we take gradient step with some step size. Uh, this is the gradient mapping or gradient operator. And then we take the proximity operator so of, of the regularizer or proximal operator, proximity operator. People use different terminologies for this. So this is proximal gradient ascent. All right, so now uh, a key uh, idea here is, uh, or key observation is that if we look at the proximity operator of this particular penalty that we use for the federated learning application, for, so for this one right here, this is just averaging of the models, of the local models, which involves communication. So if you apply ProxGD to federated learning, then what happens is that whenever this uh, gradient step is taken, local gradient step is taken, and when this prox is taken, then communication happens. So one gradient step, communication. One gradient step, communication. So if we want to model local gradient type method with this kind of a prox GD algorithm, that we, we have to skip the evaluation of prox many times and do gradient step many times and maybe prox only very rarely. And this is really the basic idea of prox skip. Just don't do prox at every iteration, do it uh, rarely. So that's uh, the very high level what prox skip is. Okay, so let's first uh, very quickly review the theory of ProxGD. So the theorem, the classical theorem says, if the number of iterations is at least condition number times log one or epsilon, then the square distance to the uh, necessarily unique minimizer is below epsilon times the initial uh, distance uh, under L smoothness mu strong convexity. And I'm mentioning this because we'll contrast this with the proxkip result, uh, which will come soon. So how do we... Uh, uh, how do we uh, construct the Prosky algorithm? Well, we somehow, as I mentioned uh, just a while ago, want to want to not calculate all the proximity operators. We want to skip them from time to time. And in order for me to explain in the easiest way I know possible how uh, this can be done, I'll I'll use two approaches. The first will be a very dirty approach, where the method uh, will skip. And I see I have double P here. There should be just single. We'll skip all the proxy evaluations, all of them. So this would be essentially skipping all the communications. However, the method will be not implementable at all. So it's just a theoretically interesting method, uh, practically absolutely useless, but it will have at least that one use. It will motivate the true approach of ProxSkip, which I'll mention after that. So let's look at the first approach. And the first approach is this. Let's solve this problem instead, which doesn't involve the uh, psi, so the regularizer at all. And since it doesn't involve the regularizer, it doesn't involve proxy evaluation, which means there will be no communication. However, there's this linear perturbation here, which is where the uh, trick uh, lies. So the linear perturbation uh, has gradient that is equal to the gradient of the smooth part of the function at the optimal solution of the regularized problem. So obviously, in order to know h star, you need to know uh, psi. In fact, you need to know the optimal solution, which is what we're trying to find. So this is a catch-22. And of course, this is only of theoretical interest because this uh, linear perturbation is not known. But if it was known and, and we could solve this problem, let's say using gradient ascent, then it turns out we'll find the right solution. This follows just from first order optimality conditions. Let's just set gradient of f, uh, uh, perturb f to zero, and we see that this unique solution will be x is equal to x star. And if you apply this to the consensus reformulation of the uh, federated learning formulation of, um, sorry, optimization formulation of federated learning, we see that this method would be method which purely only takes uh, local gradient steps at each uh, client without any communication whatsoever. So in other words, you can just perturb all the local losses using this very magic uh, perturbation, linear perturbation, solve uh, local problems, these perturb problems, and then no communication is needed. However, these perturbations are simply just not known. So this is impractical method. So what Proxkip does, Proxkip tries to do this. However, it tries to learn this perturbation on the fly and tries to learn in such a way that the number of communications uh, will be uh, massively reduced. Uh, it will not be zero as in this method, but it will be not 
uh, kappa as in, uh, let's say, gradient descent. So, so if we applied gradient descent to this uh, formulation, we get the method of this type, right? Because the gradient will be shifted and this will be just repeated. Um, all right. So in Proxkip, we'll have a shift, HT, and we will want to learn the optimal shift, which is the H star from this idealized uh, first approach. Uh, so that's what uh, Proxkip will do. Uh, however, we cannot uh, learn that without access to the regularizer because H star is supposed to be the gradient of the uh, the gradient of the smooth uh, part of the function of f at the solution of the regularized problem. So somehow uh, we need to have accesses to the uh, regularizer, which means we need to be communicating. However, it turns out you don't have to communicate in every iteration. So the proxy method from a, from from a high level can be described this way. So it's almost the same thing as I described. The only difference here is that there is a hat on the left-hand side, okay? Otherwise, it's the same method. Um, and then what we do immediately after this with a very high probability, one minus P, we do something. And with small probability, we do something else. And what we do with a high probability is that we just repeat this. So we remove the hat and the shift doesn't change. So one just keeps doing these shifted gradient steps with the same shift. So in terms of federated learning, this just means take another local gradient step for all clients, take another gradient step with local clients. And as soon as we hit this 2B part, that's exactly when communication happens. So with very small probability, we communicate. And at that point, we have to evaluate the prox, which means uh, we have to communicate. The XT plus one will be updated somehow and the shift will change. And once we fill in these three question marks, that's exactly what proxy method is. Uh, so proxy method in details is mentioned here, but I, I like uh, this kind of bird's eye view better because uh, it, it gives uh, the true insight into what's going on. Okay, so let me uh, pause here before I uh, go into the theory. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Any questions from in person? No, not, not here. Any questions from virtual audience? No, 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 no. All right, so I'll continue, thank you. So the main uh, theorem for Proskip says that if the number of iterations is at least the maximum of the condition number and one over P squared, where P is the probability of evaluating the prox, and remember this is small number, which is equal to the probability of communication, then we have solved the problem in a certain sense. And there is a Lyapunov function, psi t here, which is a combination of the convergence of the model to the optimal model and the shift to the optimal shift. Okay, and, and if, we, if we just stare a little bit at this max, we realize that in fact, if p is uh, one, okay, which means we uh, don't skip any procs, then of course, maximum of condition number and one will be always the condition number. But the, typically condition number is a large number. So we can take uh, P being smaller than one and the max will still be the condition number, right? So, so the idea is to take, take P as small as possible so that one over P squared will actually be equal to L over mu. And then that choice of P has absolutely no impact on, on the number of iterations. However, it has impact on the number of communications. So if you choose a p exactly in that way, so that one over p squared is L over mu, that's exactly the choice p being one over square root of condition number. And that tells you you have to, you, you will have square root of uh, kappa communication runs and kappa iterations. So here, this is uh, what I said is a little bit unpacked. So the expected number of uh, proximal evaluations or expected number of communications, the probability that we uh, communicate times the number of iterations, Right, so t is the number of iterations, p is the probability that we communicate. The number of iterations is max times the log just from this previous theorem. So we just multiply the two, we put the p inside and we get this uh, expression and then we minimize the expression over p just by uh, minimizing the maximum. But the, the maximum is just maximum of a linear function and one over p and the solution exactly when these two curves intersect. And in this case, of a problem with condition number two. This is just a very simple problem. The optimum probability is one over square root of two. So it's one over square root of condition number. So the optimum probability is one over square root of condition number. And if you plug this all in, then we see that the number of iterations of this method is still 
proportional to the condition number. So number of gradient evaluations is proportional to the condition number, but the expected number of proximal evaluations or communications is squared of that. And that's where the acceleration really comes from. So this is the slide that I uh, mentioned be before. And uh, maybe this is uh, uh, yet another chance to just stop a little bit and, and uh, ask whether there's any, any questions. Any questions before we move on? No, yeah, maybe we can move on. Okay, okay, good. So I have just a couple of slides on experiments. So this is just repetition of uh, the comparison with nestor of acceleration. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, so you, you can ignore this middle uh, plot. Uh, so what we have here is we compare Proxkip to the uh, best uh, federated learning uh, baselines in, in terms of theory. So the ones that have linear convergence rate under arbitrary data heterogeneity. So those are the three methods that I mentioned, scaffold, uh, FedLin, and S-local GD. So all of them have linear uh, convergence rates. Uh, so, and we run all of them, and this is fair and un unfair at the same time, I'll explain. We run all of them exactly as the theory says. So we set all the parameters based on theory. And when we do it that way, then we see there's a massive, massive difference between what SCAF knew, which is Proxkip Applied to Fair Learning uh, performs, and all of these other methods. And these are the state of the art uh, methods in terms of theory before. Uh, however, and, and this, this gap is because we have squared off condition number communication complexity, and these methods all have uh, just condition number or worse. For local GD, that's worse. However, as soon as we start fine tuning uh, various parameters of these methods, you can see on this left plot that the scaffold has virtually the same performance to, to, to our method. Uh, the reason is because these methods are actually very, very similar. Um, and so in, in sense, uh, one, can one can say that uh, scaff new is almost the same method as uh, scaffold, except uh, it's not exactly the same. It's almost the same. It's some sort of randomized version of it. Uh, however, the theory is very different, and it allows for much uh, larger step sizes. They don't have to be divided by the number of local steps. And as local GD and FedLin have kind of similar performance, but somehow, uh, somehow worse by maybe one or two degrees of magnitude still, in a certain sense. Um, well, no, not degrees of magnitude, but uh, factor one or two or something like this, then, uh, then, then scaffold. Uh, so we also have a, a stochastic version of this. So that's why these uh, lines start wiggling. So we can replace the gradients with stochastic gradients, but then convergence only goes to some neighborhood. Uh, so beyond this, we have some extensions and I only spent uh, you know, 30 seconds on this and, and they'll be over because I know my time is up in this very minute. So the first one is from gradients to stochastic gradients. We can do extension to almost arbitrary type of stochastic gradient. We can do all of this in a decentralized setting on a, on arbitrary connected network. So this is in the Proxkip paper. And then we also wrote uh, three uh, extension papers, uh, which go in very different directions, all of them. So the first one extends uh, Proxkip to, to a more general uh, randomization of the prox, which, which is compression of the prox, and says this in a prima dual framework. Then we can do variance reduction uh, inside each client, and, and this leads to much faster practical convergence. And we can also reduce the number of local, local training steps through a very different method. So this is not uh, at all prox skip type method. It's more or less based on shamble POC. So thank you very much. That's everything I had to say. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, any uh, questions, quick questions? There's one question in the chat box. So in terms of algorithm, what's the difference between uh, Proxkip and uh, Federlin? Uh, well, it's uh, different algorithms. <laughs> uh, there are many differences. It's, it's hard to say what is the difference. Uh, maybe it's much easier to say what is the difference between 
proc skip uh, uh, and scaffold because then the difference is very small. So one can think of of uh, proc skip or or scaf new when proc skip is applied to further learning as a version of scaffold where instead of a fixed number, deterministic number of local step, we take a random number of local steps. Mm -hmm. so, and then, and, and, so that's really the, the, the right comparison. So Fedlin, Fedlin is a method which is very similar to this as local GD. It's almost the same method actually. And that method actually came, uh, uh, was developed first. Sure. Um, let's thank um, Peter again, uh, because of the time limitation, we need to move on to the second uh, keynote speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So our second speaker uh, is um, Professor Sama Avastamir. And uh, uh, Sama is a uh, uh, professor at uh, uh, USC, and he is also a director of USC Amazon Center on Secure and Trusted Machine Learning. And uh, um, he also leads uh, information theory and the machine learning research lab at USC. So, uh, professor uh, Avastamir is also a co-founder uh, and CEO of FedML our um, major sponsor of this workshop. And he also received his uh, PhD degree uh, in 2008 from UC Berkeley. And prior to that, he received his bachelor from Sharif University of Technology in 2003. So uh, Professor Avesmail's research interests include uh, information theory, decentralized federated machine learning, and secure and privacy preserving learning and computing. Um, Professor Avesmail received uh, numerous awards for research and teaching, including a PK uh, award from White House, uh, Young Investigator Award from uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research and uh, NSF Career Award. He's also a fellow of IEEE. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Asama. Hi, Tianyi. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thanks for the kind introduction. And thanks for you know putting such a nice workshop together to you and also your uh, co-organizers. So Peter started the workshop with a great talk talking about the optimization angle and convergence analysis of federated learning. Maybe my goal was uh, to talk about, uh, you know, going on the theme of the workshop to bring in various perspectives on federated learning, perhaps talking more on other aspects, in particular, the privacy challenges in federated learning and, you know, other algorithmic aspects, for example, label deficiency, as well as scalability. This, uh, you know, the presentation is gonna be various works that I'm gonna talk about in collaboration with many collaborators and co-authors that I have listed them here. And as the previous talk, whenever you have questions, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Again, we are all uh, excited and familiar with federated learning. I think for this audience doesn't need much uh, motivation. Uh, you know, the big information here is that there is lots of personal data being born at the edge of the network. For example, the data of the users on the phone, security cameras collecting uh, personal videos of people, the data collected across IoT devices, data at hospitals, banks. And what is happening is that a lot of this data is untapped for machine learning development and training models for a variety of reasons, such as privacy regulations, or maybe size of the data, you cannot keep bringing it to the cloud as well as uh, you know, the excitement on Web3 and content monetization that the users want to be in charge of the data, their data and being rewarded if somebody else is using that. That's why I see federated learning is a very timely research area that enables learning from the data wherever it is and overcome these challenges for accessing the data. And what we are seeing is that uh, you know, federated learning is of use in many verticals. For example, it has seen a lot of adoption in healthcare. That's where there is a lot of uh, sensitive data at different hospitals you wanna learn from. In finance, for example, the transaction history of uh, people and the accounts for identifying fraud. In retail and advertisement, a smart home, a smart city, lots of uh, sensitive data, personal data being collected at the homes. In manufacturing, autonomous driving, metaverse, virtual reality. So essentially it's an exciting area both from a research perspective as well as from practice and its impact on machine learning ecosystem. As we all know, federated learning at a high level is uh, simple. It has two main steps. The first step is each device does local training of the model based on the data that they have. And in the second step, they aggregate globally the locally trained models that they do maybe several iterations or several epochs. 
And in federated learning, you either have cross device training across devices or cross silo training across data silos. Okay, so typically these uh, iterations of local training and global aggregation goes several rounds until uh, you, know, you, you, you continue doing that until the models converge and you reach the performance that you wish. While at a high level, it is simple. We all know if we look at it more detail and we want to work on federated learning, it is in fact very challenging. For example, on the algorithmic design and the theoretical guarantees, understanding how to do model aggregation, dealing with data heterogeneity, et cetera, are very challenging problems. From system perspective, this is a very large scale system with loss of resource constraint at the edge nodes, potential stragglers and resource heterogeneity. And even one layer above, once you make uh, learning systems federated, trustworthiness should be a big component. For example, how to deal with potentially bad models or bad data in the system, how to give security and privacy guarantees for federated learning, and perhaps in the future, if there are adversarial users, how to deal with them. That's the reason, you know, uh, in the, you know, when you want to work on FL, there are many problems to work on and it's a challenging research area. But for today, I thought, uh, you know, I briefly discussed some of the questions that are less explored, at least from the optimization perspective on federated learning. For example, a key promise of federated learning is to provide privacy to users because their data stays wherever it is. For example, your data stays on your phone while somebody is training an advertisement or recommendation system on your data. But how much privacy can you really guarantee with federated learning? So that's one question. Another question is, it is true that there is lots of data at the edge, but often this data is not annotated, not labeled. So you cannot just feed it and leverage it for learning at the edge. Okay, so how should we deal with lack of labels at the edge? The third one is that typically the edge has a lot of resource constraints. For example, maybe you have only one GPU or even a small uh, you know, phone or an IoT. So how would you fit this local training to the edge devices? And finally, how would you scale it to millions of users? I think these are some of the critical questions in order to lead federated learning into the practice. Okay, so that's why for this talk, I will spend a little bit on privacy and security guarantees for federated learning. The idea is that can we formally prove uh, privacy guarantees to the users without resorting on adding noise and differential privacy just by federated learning itself. And the second part, I will talk a little bit on lack of labels and self-supervision, in particular, using perhaps interactions with the users as a way of understanding the labels and feeding that into federated learning. Time permitting, I will also talk a little bit on the scalability and resource constraints at the edge. We will see how it goes. So let's start with the first angle. What is it that we can formally guarantee in terms of privacy in federated learning. So as we discussed in the vanilla federated learning, privacy is ensured by avoiding data movement from users to the cloud or to a central entity, meaning that you know, a model owner can train a model on your data without the need to move any of your data out of your phone. So at a high level, it is great. Nobody is getting your data out of your device. But as we all know, there is potential for model inversion attacks. What it would mean is that there is a lot of computations in the form of locally trained models leaving your phone. And it's possible to invert those locally trained models through model inversion and try to reconstruct, let's say, a data point in your training data set. Okay, so there are many work series, uh, you know, one paper that discusses how, for example, an image in the middle or the right can be recovered by inverting a model that is trained on a data set and is matching one of the actual data sets, training data sets very well. Okay, so that's why, and this, this is at a high level uh, understandable because a lot of computations living, as we all know, the models try to, you know, to some extent memorize the data. So your information about your data is already in the locally trained model and it's possible to invert that. So you should be careful about it. Uh, that and by just keeping the data where it is, you are not automatically guaranteeing privacy. So as a remedy to that, in federated learning, secure model aggregation has been proposed to overcome that problem. 
Okay, so the idea of secure model aggregation is that at the end in federated learning, we are interested in the aggregate model of the users, right? Not the individual models. Remember the two steps are local training followed by the aggregation. One way of doing aggregation naively is that you get the local models, you sum them. This way you have access to the local models. But if you apply secure aggregation, then the goal is that through secure aggregation, the server only learns the aggregate model across the users, but not the individual models. This is typically in cryptography referred to as multi-party computing, where your goal is to just compute what you want and nothing beyond that. Okay, so that's why there has been a lot of, you know, early on uh, work on uh, secure model aggregation as a remedy to make sure that even the local model of the users are protected. And there has been a variety of works. I mean, this problem by itself is a challenging cryptography problems because you have to solve it at a larger scale. And also there is gonna be dropout users. Okay, so it's not just the users are staying, some of them may be dropped and you have to make sure you're resilient against that. So you have to solve a larger scale multi-party computing with user dropouts. And that's where there has been a lot of work in the literature to make it efficient and scalable. For example, earlier this week on Monday at MLCs, we presented LightSec Ag. That's one of the fastest algorithms, most efficient algorithms for doing secure aggregation and also the only one that you can apply it even in a synchronous setting. There have also been hybrid approaches, perhaps leveraging differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, trusted execution environments for doing the secure aggregation. Okay, so a lot of work on secure model aggregation. But what we have seen is that in secure model aggregation, you make sure that each round of federated learning is secure and doesn't leak privacy. But over several rounds, it is possible to still leak. Okay, so that's something that by just secure model aggregation in one round, you cannot address. So let me show you like a cartoon of what could go wrong. For example, let's say you have two rounds of federated learning. Okay, so these are two consecutive rounds. In the first one, maybe users one, two, three participate. You apply your favorite secure aggregation and make sure that the server only learns the aggregate model across user one, two, three. In the follow, following round, maybe user three doesn't have access or doesn't participate in uh, federated learning. Only users one and two participate. And still you apply secure aggregation and the server learns the aggregate model across users one and two. Now, what you can see here is that the structure of these two are such that if you subtract what the server has learned from these two consecutive rounds, it can approximate the model of user three. The reason being that typically the models from one round to the next typically don't change much. And you can see X1 and X2 cancel out and you get to see X3. Okay, so while each round was secure, across two rounds, it leaked the private model of user three, and then you can apply model inversion attack and learn the data set of user three. Okay, so this is a cartoon demonstrating it. We have actually applied this attack in real world. And in this case, we have looked at federated learning with random participation across 40 users. On this plot, what you can see is that after going several rounds, we have tried to apply a linear estimator based on the models that are securely aggregated at each rounds of the federated learning. Okay, so it's kind of you apply federated learning, you apply secure aggregation in each round, but at the end you try to see, can I estimate the local model of the users via a linear estimator? The result of this estimation error is the you know, histogram here, where on the x-axis you have the normalized reconstruction error and the y-axis you have frequency. What you are seeing is that actually for many users, the reconstruction error is like very small, below five over a thousand. And for all of them is below 0.025. Okay, so what it would mean is that, sure, you secured each round, but then I learn across several rounds, the local model of each user. Now that I know the local model, I apply model inversion. And then you can see, for example, this was a original image that was used. Here is the reconstructed image, so it's terrible. So what can you do? That's where you know, uh, there is a solution around that, which is by multi-round secure aggregation that you can uh, you know, access the paper uh, on archive. And the idea of multi-round SecAg is to make sure that there is a structure on the user participation across several rounds 
so that the server cannot figure out individual models by combining them across different runs. Okay, so think about what is learned at each round as an equation about the models. You wanna make sure that there is a structure on those equations in a way that you cannot combine them to obtain a sparse equation. Okay, so if you apply the scheme, now you can see by just putting a structure, you can bring back the reconstruction error to be very large, larger than an order one constant. Again, remember these are normalized error, meaning that your signal and noise are proportional. And then once signal and noise in the estimation is large, then it's very difficult to uh, further invert it. And in fact, if you apply the inversion attacks that I mentioned to you before, now you can see by applying a, a structure on the selection of the users, there is really nothing visually that can be recovered from the original images. Okay, so the story was by just keeping the data where it is, that's not good enough. You wanna apply secure aggregation to protect individual models, but that's also not good enough. You have to protect it across several rounds. And that seems to be very good. But the question is, how good is it? And that's where I think there has been a big gap in the federated learning in terms of understanding how much leakage would we have at the end of a federated learning and collaborative training. Okay, so let's say a bunch of users participate. They apply federated learning. We apply secure aggregation. We make it secure across multiple rounds. And at the end of it, they only learn the global model, right? What secure aggregation and multi-round secure aggregation guarantees is that you only learn the global model and nothing else. But it doesn't tell you how much leakage would that global model have about the local data set of the users. Okay, so that's the you know, missing information. And that's the guarantee that the user you know, is interested in. If I participate in collaborative learning, right? how much would it be leaked at the end about me? Not just making sure that only the global model is there. Okay, so that's, I think, a question that has been bothering us for several years that there is no guarantee that we can get. The only way you can maybe give a guarantee for that is perhaps putting a DP noise on the models that are sent out by the users. But as we all know, once you add a DP noise, then you will start trading privacy and performance. Here, the idea is that if you don't apply any DP noise, you just resort on securing each round and making sure that through collaboration, only the global model is learned, is there a privacy guarantee? Okay, so then you would say, why, why should there be any uh, privacy guarantees? At a high level, the intuition is that maybe the users can protect each other. Okay, so it's kind of your model and your collaboration is already masked by many other users participating. So perhaps there is a phenomenon like blockchain systems as more and more users join the system there is gonna be more privacy guarantees. Okay, so maybe key questions here would be, how would I quantify information leakage from the aggregate model? Is this leakage affected by the number of users, training rounds, model size? How would I set these parameters to get to the desired level? How would the heterogeneity affect it? And is information leakage, for example, through mutual information a representative metric in terms of success of attacks? For example, if we have less leakage, we can guarantee that the existing attacks in FL won't work. That's where we have a recent paper coming up in uh, PETS, uh, which is a primary value for privacy enhancing uh, technologies. What we have done, we have given theoretical guarantees for the first two questions, how to quantify the leakage and some experimental on assessing the impact of these leakage guarantees on the success of attacks. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit, a glimpse of these results. The paper is on archive. If you are interested, you can take a look for details. So first, let me start with the theoretical guarantee. What we have been able to do is to bond the mutual information. And if you recall, the mutual information is a metric on the average number of bits that uh, you know, two quantities give about each other. This is the mutual information between the local model of each user and the aggregate model that is being learned through secure aggregation at each round of federated learning, condition on the previous rounds. What we have shown is that this leakage that we are interested in is upper bounded by a term like that. So what is this term? This term C is a constant, D is the model size, N is the number of users, B is the batch size. Okay, so the important thing here is that as the number of users go large, right? this term goes to zero, 
1 over n. And this one also going to log of 1 goes to 0. So what you are seeing here is that a very promising result for federated learning in the sense that as the number of users get larger and larger, the amount of leakage about the data of each user by just learning the global aggregate model will go to zero. Okay, also there is other parameters here. For example, you can see that, of course, the larger the model size, the leakage would be larger. That's also understandable because there are more computations living. The larger the batch size, this also helps to some extent until the first term is the dominant term to reduce the leakage. Okay, so you, there are these parameters that you can play with. Now, if you also apply a multi-run, not just a single run, there is going to be multi-run, then this leakage is going to be added up across several runs. And what we see is that the total leakage end-to-end -end in uh, federated learning, we can bond it by the term at each run multiplied by the number of runs. Again, if you have a fixed number of runs, as n gets large, number of users gets large, the leakage goes to zero. But nevertheless, as you continue running federated learning for more and more runs, there is gonna be potentially more leakage. Like each round of it, there is a cost to be paid. So you have to be careful on how would you set the number of runs in your FL. All right, so now, uh, you know, given these theories, let's see how does it look like in practice. Again, these are uh, theoretical bonds. And again, we can only derive the theoretical bond for Fed SGD. Okay, not for example, for more, uh, you know, popular algorithms like uh, federated averaging or Fed prox. That's where theory would lack, but you can imagine a similar kind of guarantees could be applied. Okay, so here, just to show you some experimental validation and dependence on the number of users, we have looked at the training across, uh, I believe, uh, 20 users, uh, sorry, across a certain number of users ranging from zero to 50. And what we have been doing is we have been looking at uh, training for MNIST and C410. We have looked at various models, like a simple linear model, SLP and MLP. What you are seeing here is the phenomenon that we saw. On the y-axis, we are seeing the normalized mutual information, how much leakage we have, and on the axis, number of users. For all these algorithms, we see this one over n phenomena, meaning that as the number of users increase, the amount of leakage decays as one over n. So as I mentioned, this is a very promising result, like similarity to blockchain systems. As more and more users join, they protect each other. And in fact, it's going to grow linearly with the number of users, the amount of uh, you know, leakage guarantees that you can give. As I mentioned, there are also other parameters. For example, uh, if you care about how much leakage you're going to have for a given accuracy, like to reach a certain accuracy, you, know, you have to run federated learning several runs. And what we are seeing is that there is also a trade-off between leakage on the, on the y-axis and the model accuracy in the x-axis. To reach higher and higher accuracy, you have to run it uh, several rounds and the leakage may go up. So you have to be worried about that. And uh, you know, finally, you know, as I mentioned, this uh, theoretical metric is in terms of mutual information. In reality, you want to have guarantees in terms of the success of attacks. For example, let's say by applying secure aggregation as more and more users join, is it true that it becomes more and more difficult to attack? For example, here we have looked at uh, one of the effective uh, gradient inversion attacks in the literature. Okay, And what we have analyzed is how much, what is going to be the success of this attack? For example, recovering the original image from the global model that is being trained as the number of users increase. Now, what you are seeing is that at the beginning, it's possible to apply model inversion attack, and that's what these results would show. However, as the number of users increase and you are protected by multi-round and uh, secure aggregation, then these attacks would not be successful and the signal to noise ratio in those attacks would go become very small. Okay, so uh, let me wrap up the first part. As I mentioned, uh, I, I think this is the first result that would show that without resorting to any differential privacy and other in noise injection mechanisms in federated learning by just securing each round of federated learning by secure aggregation and keeping the data at the clients, whether it's possible to provide privacy. And here we theoretically analyze that privacy. Of course, if you want to get more privacy, then the only way is that you start adding DP noise on the models that are leaving the devices. And this result essentially shows that to what extent 
you have to rely on adding noise. So if you don't need it and you are happy with the level of privacy, then that's good enough. You don't add, need to add DP noise. Okay, so let me pause here before moving uh, to the second part that I don't have much time, but uh, I can help answering those questions. Any, question, any questions from the in-person audience? No? So maybe one quick question I have is that uh, in this uh, uh, privacy analysis, uh, is it assumed that uh, um, the uh, client index are known to the uh, servers each round of selection? Very good. Yes. So this is assuming that you know all the users. So actually, if I go to the mutual information, right? So mm -hmm. this, are you asking on the attack or are you asking on the theory guarantee? Theory. theory. Yeah. On the theory is the mutual information between the model of one user and the mm -hmm. aggregate model. It's okay. like the because you see, once you apply secure aggregation, the only thing learned that is learned is the aggregate model. Mm -hmm. And you want to figure out how much would that leak about my model. And then you can apply a Markov bond to say, this is how much it would leak about your data. Mm -hmm. right, so if you can bond that, that will also bond your data leakage. So no need to know the index of the clients being selected. No, exactly, that's right. So there is a one question in the chat box um, regarding the model inversion attack. What happened uh, when there are multiple local runs at each user? The gradients are not known. Maybe the difference in the model weights up to the user over multiple iteration is known. So uh, some- oh, Very good, that excellent. Uh, no, that's a great question. Typically, you know, model inversion is gonna be more complex as there is more runs, et cetera, right? What mm -hmm. we are seeing here is that, I mean, this is like a, I mean, on the theoretical guarantee is not for a specific attack. It's like, this is the number of bits that is leaked. Model inversion tries to use those bits and try to reconstruct uh, you know, the model. But nevertheless, uh, that question is good, meaning that there has been model inversion attacks that we have been discussing. They have shown they are effective, actually, even if you do several uh, local training rounds. But that's a challenging problem. The message here is that as there are more users and you mix the model of different users, then it's very difficult to apply that. And that's the promise, that's the guarantee that we are getting. Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So if no further questions, maybe we can move on. Sure. Uh, because Sama, we have another 10 minutes. 10 minutes maybe. sounds good. So then I can talk about the second part, which is, you know, the first wave of FL is that there is lots of data at the edge. Let's learn from it. That's the good news. Then you quickly realize this data is often not annotated, not labeled. And it's kind of, uh, you know, you have to worry about how would I make it ready for the machine learning pipeline. For example, this can be just your raw images or your raw, raw text, and, uh, or maybe the images sitting at hospitals, not annotated. So we have been uh, working uh, from a different angle. That's, uh, you know, our paper recently at uh, NACL on the, you know, NLP community that we try to leverage user feedback and user interaction as a way of resolve, as a way of resolving the challenge of lack of labels. Okay, so the idea is that once you are apply federated learning and you train a model, at the end that model you are gonna deploy it at the edge users. For example, maybe that trained model is gonna be the new version of Alexa that you install on the Echo devices and users interact with it, or maybe it's gonna be the new uh, you know, app that is gonna give you recommendations, help you with planning, etc. So you're gonna interact with that. And the question is that through that interaction, like implicit feedback, can we use that for overcoming or compensating for lack of labels, okay? So the idea is not like to ask the users to label, that's nobody wants to participate in that. The idea is that the users are gonna interact with the deployed model and that interaction can give user feedback that, is, uh, that can be potentially very useful in federated learning. So let me show you an example of it. This user feedback sometimes can be positive. For instance, let's say there is a model, Alexa model deployed on an Echo device, the user interacts with it, it says, uh, you know, Alexa played the song of Bohemian Rhapsody. Then the device plays the correct song. In that case, if the user is listening for a couple of minutes, meaning that after the device plays the song and the user keeps listening for a couple of minutes, that's a very good indication that the detected label by that sentence, 
right, was correct. Otherwise, why should I have you know user listen for it for a long time? This user feedback can also be negative. For example, in the previous case, let's say the user asks the same song, the device doesn't detect it, plays the wrong song, and then the user replies by saying stop playing. So that interaction is a good indication that the detected label was wrong. Okay, so it's kind of through those interactions, you are getting labels for new instances or utterances at the edge node. Okay, so in one case for this sentence, you realize actually the correct label for it may be actually the song of Bohemian Rhapsody. In the other case, it was not. Okay, and the idea is that how would I use these positive and negative feedback in the training? So for positive feedback, it is a, a bit simple because it's kind of, you can use the pseudo label and the, and the confirmation that you have from the label, from the user to treat it as a label and you know, treat it as self-supervised learning. For negative user feedback is a little bit more challenging. The reason is that right now you only know that the label is not what you thought it is. For example, in that case, the label wasn't Bohemian Rhapsody, but you don't know what it was, okay? And also to make it even more complicated, these uh, feedback can also be noisy. For example, maybe, uh, you know, user asks for a song, Alexa plays the wrong one. Nevertheless, the user likes it and keeps listening for it. And then you may think this incorrect label was, uh, you know, correct, which is not true. It's just luck that the user liked it. Okay, so what we have been doing is first trying to understand the amount of noise that maybe users can inject through this. So the idea is that you have a model, maybe you train a seed model by using only 1% of the data. Okay, and as a way of that seed model that you have, you use it for annotation of the remaining data sets and you show it to the users and ask them, is this label correct or not? To figure out how much noise we may have, we have done some MTurk studies. For example, uh, you know, there are two uh, benchmarks for text classification that we have looked at. One of them is the uh, sentiment uh, tree bank SST, the other one 20 news. Again, as I mentioned, we trained a model like a seed model by only using 1%. We use that to generate pseudo labels for the remaining 99%. And then we showed such tests uh, to MTurkers to acquire their feedback. For example, we said, this is the input text. This is the machine prediction for the context of the test. Text, for example, PC hardware. Do you think it is correct? Is it accurate, inaccurate, or you don't know? And what we saw is that actually for these, the amount of noise is very large, right? So meaning that uh, like about 20 to 30% is the amount of error that we have in feedback. So it's not something negligible that we can throw away. So you have to worry about when you want to model uh, user interaction to um, amount of noise that you have. And typically you can do it by a probabilistic channel so that the, for a correct prediction, for a positive feedback and negative feedback, it is still likely that the pseudo label may not be correct with certain probabilities, you know, proportional to gamma and delta. Now, once you had that, then you can start, uh, you know, formulating the problem that you have uh, you know, a machine learning problem in a federated learning that you have a seed model that has been trained. That model, you are using it for generating pseudo labels. That pseudo label, you receive positive feedback and negative feedback from users about that pseudo label, which with certain probability correct and certain probability wrong. And you want to use now that, that feedback from the users together with the pseudo label to improve federated learning. So as I mentioned, in the case of uh, positive user feedback, you can use the pseudo labels since you have affirmation that they are correct as new labels and just maybe train it in a supervised manner with the, super, uh, with the pseudo labels and maybe trying your cross entropy loss the same as before. Once you have negative feedback, then in that case, you know the pseudo label is not correct, but you don't know what is the label. And one way to overcome that, that's the approach that we have taken is, is like learning with complementary labels. It's kind of, you wanna create a confusion matrix that tries to tell you if the label is not class one, what other classes could it be? And try to understand that confusion matrix based on the validation data set, right? Some of the maybe other classes are gonna be more likely. For example, if you know the label was not a cat, but you know that uh, you, know, you had some confidence in it, maybe the cross ones could be a tiger or similar animals, not you know, a totally different category. 
And that's the idea is that you create a posterior probability of other classes and you try to minimize your loss with respect to that uh, posterior probability that you have calculated through uh, confusion metrics. If you're interested to know more, here is a nice paper that tells you how you can train from that. And then, as we mentioned, you have both positive feedback and negative feedback. Your overall loss is gonna be a mixture of the two that you try to minimize. And furthermore, once you have the noise, you should try to create a loss function that is noise robust. And there are uh, you know, recent works that uh, give you uh, recipes for systematic way of creation of uh, noise robust loss functions. And the high level idea is that you want to create based on the loss that you have, uh, an active loss and a passive loss. For example, here we use normalized cross entropy for the active loss, reverse cross entropy for the passive loss. One of them, maximizes the probability of landing in the correct label. The other one minimizes the probability of landing in the uh, complementary label. And you create your noise robust loss function as a mixture of the two with some coefficient. That's kind of, you have to tune it for your application. We realize the right coefficient here is a factor of two putting on the uh, passive loss. Okay, so now we have the setting, we have the algorithm. And let's quickly look at some evaluations to see how promising these results are. So again, the problem is text classification for two data sets. We trained the Stilbert across 15 clients. The measure is model accuracy. The seed model is the one that you have trained on 1% of the data only. You can see the accuracy is very low. Full supervision is that you have access to all the labels that are distributed you know, heterogeneously across the 15 clients. You can see the accuracy is gonna be much higher. So there is much more that you can learn if you have access to the labels. Self-training is a naive baseline that you try to use the seed model to generate pseudo labels and just use those pseudo labels. What we are seeing is that that's not helping much. Like you can just naively, a model cannot learn by itself. Now let's go apply the algorithms that we discussed. Whenever you have positive feedback and maybe on top of it, negative feedback. Okay, so first look at the noise-free setting. What you're seeing is that as you are adding positive feedback, right, the performance jumps drastically, so it's very uh, important. Once you add negative feedback, in the case of SSD2, since you have only two classes, positive feedback and negative feedback are kind of the same because I have only two categories. If I know it's not category one, it's gonna be category two. Then in that case, like you get the same boost. However, in the case of 20 news, the boost is gonna be a smaller. And uh, what we are seeing is that overall, by leveraging the feedback from the users in the noise-free setting, it is very promising and you can get very close to the full supervision. I know that I'm okay. running over. Tianyi, you are there. So give me uh, you know, uh, maybe one or two minutes and I will wrap up. Finally, if you add the noise, and you apply the you know, noise robust loss functions that I mentioned and the noisy, what we are seeing is that the performance degrades substantially. Okay, so that's where like you go back and uh, we have a, a significant degradation and lack to full supervision. So the problem becomes much more challenging once you have noise, especially high amount of noise. And what we are seeing is that the existing noise robust uh, loss functions are not able to tackle it. So with that, actually, let me uh, quickly wrap up this part. I think what we are saying is that uh, there is a lot of room for using user feedback and interaction as a way of overcoming label scarcity at the edge. We propose the framework for leveraging positive and negative feedback. However, what we have seen is that noisy, noise in the feedback becomes a bottleneck and the current noise robust learning algorithms don't effectively address it. I think that's a very important research direction to think about how to leverage user feedback, but in the presence of noise. Another interesting direction here that we haven't explored much is, what if you have heterogeneous users, right? It's kind of the feedback is heterogeneous. Maybe you have some users that are very uh, you know, accurate. For example, you can think about it. One site has done a, a lot of data annotation and they are careful, but you have the other ones that they do a naive annotation. How can they collaborate and benefit from the confidence of each other? Okay, so with that, let me quickly wrap up the talk and hand it back to Tianyi.
I had also plans to tell you a little bit for, about FedML. There is no time, but uh, you know, as Tiani mentioned, later today there is going to be a hands-on tutorial and demo on how to land federated learning in real world and applying a platform. That you are, uh, you know, welcome to join that. All right. So let me just conclude uh, rapidly. So as we saw, I think federated learning is very promising and uh, it can change, revolutionize machine learning ecosystem by pushing learning to the edge. There are still many exciting challenges. There is also a lot of push in industry to land it in real world and in FedML. We have a powerful platform that if you wanna deploy it in your setting, you are welcome to use. And we also have an open source community for pushing this area further. So you are welcome to join and help us push the area forward. I stop here, pass to you, Tiani. Thank you, thank you, Salman, uh, for the nice presentation. Yeah. Uh, so, because of the um, time limitation, we do not have questions uh, for Salman. But uh, uh, in the um, live demo uh, sessions, we can ask follow up questions with, uh, to uh, Chao Yang. So, um, our next speaker um, is Professor uh, Radu um, Makulaski, and uh, Professor um, Radu Makulaski is a professor at uh, UT Austin and. Uh, uh, before that, he, uh, he was a professor at the uh, uh, EC department at CMU, and he received his PhD from USC in 1998, and his research interest is in developing uh, new machine and uh, AI algorithms for uh, embedded systems, cyber-physical systems, and Internet of Things. And uh, without uh, further ado, um, let's welcome Professor Makulaski. <laughs> Is it possible to join the Zoom? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's supposed to, it's supposed to. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk. So it looks like I'm the only one in person, the only speaker in person is the most complicated to make it work, right? So that's the irony. Of we have also a live band first. Oh, okay, yes. great. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We're the brave first morning cats, right? Okay. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about something similar, but different. Okay. So our focus is going to be today on this side of the story. In other words, on edge devices where real things like hardware, power, memory, bandwidth are crucial for making federated learning work. 
So in addition to this, I'm going to bring the, for the end, the social angle to this problem for a concrete uh, setup uh, regarding the epidemics and see how um, federated learning on its devices can help. So again, the focus is on edge devices. We have limited storage, we have limited battery, limited bandwidth. So it's nothing like the classical setup in Google with the data centers and all these things. I just put this for completeness, but what I'm talking about is this area here. That's one clarification. The second one is that the aim here, uh, despite the current results, is to enable the future hardware that is uh, looming at the horizon, meaning things that are really tiny, really small, uh, like all these uh, wearables, all this uh, hardware that is um, very limited in terms of computational communication and storage resources. So the hope is that uh, if this kind of research is meaningful and uh, successful in a number of years, um, uh, meaning the focus on latency, memory, and power efficiency, uh, this will lead to a transformational uh, type of approach that will change the, the way we think about these um, settings nowadays. Now, just one slide to synchronize everyone on the same page. Uh, the previous speaker did a great job, so I don't need much introduction. So the federated learning uh, that I'm considering here uh, is the MEC, so it's the mobile devices that we have here, it has the same four steps of so downloading the model uh, and the parameters here, then uh, on, the, on these heterogeneous clients, then doing local training, uh, then uploading the parameters and then aggregating the thing in the cloud. This is the classical setup where we still have uh, a central server and we have the cloud to, to help us uh, solve the problem. What I'm going to bring uh, hopefully new to this table is shown in this part of the screen. In other words, uh, people are used to uh, with the challenges that the machine learning, uh, the federated learning put, meaning data heterogeneity. As you see in these devices, we have all these variations that uh, make this data look non-IAD in some situations. And because of this, there is a challenging to, uh, approach to, we, we, it's a challenging, idea to make this converge and uh, eventually prove the convergence. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is not this part, not because it's not important, it's important, but it's probably the most research topic in federated learning, but rather focuses on this model heterogeneity because we have a, a large spectrum of models that can be used and Typically, when you deploy something from the cloud, you'll not deploy an ident identical model everywhere, as is most of the assumption uh, these days in, in these papers, but rather you may adapt what models you deploy on the client resources. So this heterogeneity is uh, the, the model heterogeneity that I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to consider the hardware uh, heterogeneity because not all the devices are equally powerful, okay, or equally. Uh, strong when it comes to hardware resources that they uh, utilize. And just to give you a simple example, my phone here, which uh, it's an old model, may be better than a new model if this has 90% battery and the new model has 1% battery left. So this heterogeneity affects also this kind of situation. Now, what I'm going to talk about today also <clears throat> belongs to these three categories. So I'm going to talk about this multimodal assumption when we bring this idea of using model elasticity for, to accommodate the hardware heterogeneity in federated learning. Uh, then I'm going to bring the idea of mobility, okay? Uh, people typically move with these devices around. They are not in fixed locations like would be a data center so, or some uh, computing center for a uh, large area. Uh, and this the idea that I'm going to talk about is this dynamic community formation for this mobile federated learning. And last but not least, I'm going to touch upon uh, this social impact when we combine social sensing and federated learning and see what that uh, may bring uh, interesting from a research perspective. Again, everything is under the assumption of limited resources and small devices and uh, low power considerations. Okay. So the, uh, the first idea is, the, is uh, about handling models that are different on different uh, clients. So essentially, um, for instance, in this representation, the cloud that will need to deploy a model shown in black here as a complex model, let's say 
on a bunch of clients has to look at the resources that those clients have. So, for instance, we have here a laptop which has plenty of resources. Assuming that is plugged and powered and everything, this will be probably the most powerful device. So, we'll be able to accommodate the model as it is. Okay. Uh, by this black thing, I want to show that whatever the most complex model is will be able to run on the laptop. Well, on the other hand, if we have a device here like this, uh, we, or a device like this, which has far less memory here, or maybe even far less battery level, the model will need to be sort of simplified. So in this representation, we show a little bit uh, more lightweight models that are deployed on these devices. And this will happen with this phi one transformation. So a big model becomes a light model, lightweight model, if you want, here and or here. And this is the direct path from a complex model to a simpler model. So this is what, what we mean by this phi one going down. Now, in the opposite direction, we may do the opposite. In other words, phi one minus one. In other words, a lightweight model may be enhanced and improved. And for aggregation in the cloud. And in that case, this is the reverse part. And because of this kind of uh, elongation and uh, compression of the model, we call this uh, model elasticity. In other words, how can we make this work in uh, real systems such that you can uh, really account for the resources that you have on the devices? So again, this is about the machine learning model elasticity. That nothing changes on the hardware. We just account for the hardware when we compress these models. So what will look like in a typical convolutional model architecture, you just imagine one of those, I don't know, Conf7, Conf5, whatever models, you have these classical operations. This is the stage that is, has multiple stages, and you see the detail of such a stage, and you see the filters here, the, 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 the usual size, you see the filter, the number of inputs in the feature map, you have the number of outputs in the feature map. So basically this here, this arrow shows the operations while this Rectangle, uh, this um, uh, volumes show the, the actually feature maps when we get here. Um, I hope it's intuitive enough. And basically, what would be the idea in this case would be, for instance, if we start with such a model, if we use the direct path to basically remove this second convolutional layer, so we have one, two here, but we remove this one and we get something like this, for instance, and this will be the direct elastic transformation file that I was talking of, uh, about earlier. In the opposite direction would be if we have this to basically add one more layer, another convolutional layer, as shown here with a different color, comp three here. Uh, so one, two, and three. Then what what this means? This model will actually grow in size. So the idea is this is the phi minus one, meaning the inverse uh, elastic transformation, which will be used when the resources are not a problem and we go in the cloud and we can aggregate them. In general, this will work for families, okay? So in other words, we use this for convolutional uh, networks, but we can imagine that slightly different things will be, need to be done if we use a REST, something like this. Uh, so this is how this will look like. So it's basically an equivalent representation of this when we actually see where we started and where we ended up in stage one and what we did in stage two. And uh, so basically you see these additions that have been made here with this addition of the convolutional layer and basically the, the entire thing from uh, uh, all the way to the fully connected layer looks different because of this elastic transformation. Now, since I mentioned this, um, the ResNet, in this ResNet, say if we start with, rest, with a basic model, ResNet 14, okay, this is the, uh, the, the baseline here, so to speak. Uh, basically, when we move to say ResNet 20 or to ResNet 34, we, we have to add other things. So it's not just layers, but we also have to, for instance, add this skip connection if you want to create the ResNet 20. Say, so this skip connection to keep the spirit of the family of the uh, networks, in other words, will bring this point directly to the output and will bring all the benefits that ResNet skip connection have. Now, uh, as I said, in some cases, if we go even beyond this, we need to add another one here. So this kind of transformations, for instance, to uh, end up to a rest at 34, 32, I don't know if I have 34, it's just probably this four that annoys me. So uh, if we go to a rest at 32, uh, we'll have this kind of transformations that we have to uh, make in order to preserve 
the character of the family of the network. So for instance, in this case, is this skip list. Now, what we can do, which is kind of complementing the approach is we can even bring the sparsity as part of the game, right? Because uh, when we do these elastic transformations, we can also use the existing techniques that can be developed um, by uh, uh, sparse uh, um, research. So uh, basically, uh, as you see here, we have this model, but we can, you know, remove some nodes, links as a, as a, uh, an approach like um, uh, IMP will, 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 uh, will tell you to do in, uh, in pruning, or uh, we can do many other techniques that will work, will complement and will make the models even smaller to fit the device. So now getting back to the algorithmic solution that we have to this problem, at the end of the day, uh, this starts with the uh, initial phase when we basically communicate to the cloud with the resources. In other words, this would be you know the memory, the level of the battery, this is the uh, availability for each and every device. We can do this every run, or we can do this every few runs, depending on the settings. Uh, these are communicated to the cloud. Then there is a model omega zero that is an initialized uh, model, the initial global model that is produced by the cloud. And then basically we initiate this fam family of uh, networks. So as I gave an example, the convolutional network, we have COM5, we have COM7, uh, whatever, uh, COM3. And these are the ones that are belonging to this five set, okay? And then what we do, we have also uh, uh, local data that we have with me. We have, uh, we have also uh, a mask that we can use this M and we see the operations that we do with the mask on the model here in order to, to uh, reduce the complexity. And the optimization problem that we have to solve is shown here in the most general form. And it's subject to the availability of this budget VI that I was mentioning earlier that is available for each and every device. And then the elastic federated learning part basically works for each round, okay? Uh, and for each selected device, we do all this in parallel and we do all the local updates. At the end of the round, we do the uh, global aggregation phase, okay? Which you see the five minus one that is used because we go in the cloud here. And then um, at the end of this, we get, when, when we're done with this inverse elastic transformation, we get a better model in the cloud and that can be used for uh, the next round. So uh, in uh, this is a general formulation in actual practice, uh, meaning uh, for the sake of the results, experimental results that I'm going to show you, we implemented the very first version of this, the general problem to solve is quite complex. So we implemented a simpler version, which is based on a lookup table. And uh, this is because all these things can be pre-characterized and can be stored locally. They are not, there is not a lot of information. And all of our results that uh, actual now will follow exactly this pattern. So in other words, uh, we have this simplified version of this general optimization problem that we solve. And this is some examples based on CIFAR 10. Uh, now I have to remember the exact setup. I think we have three models of each, uh, three ResNet 14, three ResNet 20, three ResNet 32. So in other words, we have a total of nine devices that we used in this experiment. And this EEL means Elastic Federated Learning. So it's an abbreviation for this approach that uh, we propose. And basically we show here the accuracy as a function of communication rounds for both IAD and non-IAD data. Uh, for IAD data, uh, probably the results are not so spectacular. I mean, they are kind of expected, but for uh, non-IAD, it's interesting to see that if you decide, say, well, an accuracy level of, say, 50% is enough, the basic, uh, the, the red approach, that is the, uh, the, the one that I'm talking about primarily, uh, gets in one round, literally one round, close to 50%, while the other one will be, I don't know, I can say 100 rounds, so it will be significantly more rounds to converge there. So this is an interesting thing, and you see if you pick another value, so 65 or uh, whatever the value is here, 
uh, this will need significantly more rounds. Everything that comes to communication rounds means energy that is wasted and uh, eventually may render the entire system unusable if the energy is a significant limitation for the uh, setup that we're considering. So this is one example. Another example is when we, another setup is when we have different combinations of this model. So we don't have them uniformly. As I said here, we have three of these, three of these, three of these. So for instance, I consider this to be uniform in the sense that those three are the same. Uh, in this one, we have combinations. We have ResNet 14 and we have ResNet 20. Um, in this case, we have uh, probably, uh, yeah, I think it's the same uh, setup in, uh, when it comes to the total number of devices, but this is the most interesting one because it has a combination of ResNet 14, 20, and 32 at the same time. So in this case, again, there is a uh, interesting uh, combination here we, where we see the results are quite good and the, the convergence to the values is quite good. Keep in mind that when it comes to using the same devices, uh, this means if some, some model does not fit, we have to change that. So in other words, this may be a, a more realistic situation than any of these other scenarios because of the resource limitations. And the same for non IoT data. Um, an interesting combination here is that once we do, once we get this phase of the elasticity, uh, we can use any approach from federated learning uh, to uh, to aggregate this data. So what we showed previously was federated averaging. Uh, in this case, we show uh, integrate. Uh, how, how would this look like if we use other, other approaches? So FedProx was mentioned in the previous talk in, uh, at some point. So it's the one that has those structures that are allowed to do partial work here. Um, and this one, the FedMax is the one that actually has better results at FedProx in terms of heterogeneity, which uses, again, this is about data heterogeneity. So uh, uses um, uh, the entropy approach as part of the optimization function. So um, in this case, you see that they can work seamlessly. So in other words, this elastic federated learning can work with federated averaging, can work with pet frogs, can pet max. So whatever progress in this progress space is made, the health can benefit from this. So in other words, the elastic part will still work with them. Uh, you have the references for this to, to see more details, but you see the, the results are quite good, both for IAD as well as non-IAD data. So this shows the flexibility of the idea. Uh, I'm, at the end of the first part, if there is any question about this, I'd be happy to answer. If not, I can move to the more questions. I have a quick question. So uh, how do who will solve this uh, problem of adapting the fire at the end of the I'm sorry. Yeah, so there's a, a problem that we need to solve the fire at the last end. And not with the last? Yes. So there are many different problems. The yeah. server will probably own the local device to solve. Because it requires data the device. Yeah, each device has its own local data. Yes, right? but the, who will solve that uh, two master problem, which find the transformation file and the mask? And... The mask is applied to the Omega models. Yes. Right? So it's just assuming you have a mask. Yes. If the, the mask is given, it's applied to that and it simplifies the Omega. To say some omega prime, and from that point on, we go to the algorithm. Okay, but uh, but uh, uh, um, there is the uh, end mask end and the transformation prime also a little variable. Right? So someone needs to solve it. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, okay. for the, the of yeah, the paper that uh, for the masks, uh, you, we do imp. We obtain lottery tickets okay. with the basic imp iterative magnitude pruning. You train a bit, you prune, you train, you prune, but yeah. we use only 5% of a data set, okay. the proxy so data set. Yes, data. and yeah. we obtained all sorts of different sparsities up to 99%. And from all of those, we create a, a simple lookup table because you have the masks that are already uh, 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 yes. predefined, so to say, by the. So it's a very small process. percentage that we yeah. I don't think, in fact, we. Sure. Got it. Now I understand. Yeah. Okay. Very good question. So the mobility part here is the ongoing work in this uh, problem space, where essentially, if you look at this real scenario, so to speak, 
these devices will be wear uh, by different people in the cars, uh, on the bikes, or just walking. So they will move and they will change continuously their relationships with different access points. Okay. So in other words, uh, they will have, they will be sometimes closer, sometimes further apart. So they will need to communicate the, or use or benefit from Wi-Fi or LTE or whatever uh, situation might be. And also they will have the energy consumption as a limitation because the, the amount of uh, uh, options that someone has under this uh, limited battery lifetime is directly uh, dependent on the on the uh, each situation uh, individually. So the classical federated learning shows this big scenario that I showed. You take the model from the cloud, you download it on different devices by different forms and shapes. Here we try to show that there are different resources available. There is a local training and then the updating of the model and then aggregation in the cloud that um, will lead to a better model. And then the charging of these devices varies again. The connectivity varies because, you know, we talk about an access point, say, like Starbucks. Someone may be close to a Starbucks and may have uh, potentially access to Wi-Fi, but if that person or that user does not have the password, in case there is a password, then it's useless. So the communication will still have to happen, will happen in a different way because the Wi-Fi will not be available. Uh, now, in this problem space, we want to bring mobility in the picture. So the, the work in this direction is much more uh, newer. So for instance, in this 2020 paper, the authors proposed this hierarchical federated learning, where you see the cloud and different base stations uh, that are available, let's call them access points uniformly. And basically what's happening in this case, the approach assumes uh, that a number of devices will be a fixed number of devices will be allocated to each access point. So basically, in this case, you have two uh, devices. There are different capabilities here, but they will not change throughout the, the experiment uh, in this uh, in this kind of approach. And uh, obviously, things go the same way. You do training and you do aggregation here, and then ultimately aggregation in the cloud. And the results are very interesting and very promising uh, for this type of approach. Um, and that's why the hierarchical organization of this setup is a beneficial thing. Now, here there are two things to keep in mind. That one is that there is a certain parameter, for instance, K1 uh, here, which is used to, to do the local training, and another parameter, K2, which is used to do edge aggregation. Of course, K1 and K2 are not necessarily the same, and the, the, the way we play with this balance between local and edge aggregation has a significant impact on the overall behavior of the system. Now, uh, in this particular case, as I said, the, the setup is fixed. In other words, the two devices are allocated for each access point as shown here. And uh, in this case, we do, as I said, K times local training and then we repeat this k times before aggregation here, and uh, uh, eventually the model gets up, up, uploaded in the cloud when this aggregation is completed at the edge level, and this is uh, the the when the solution gets improved. So essentially, after k one times k two aggregations, the model will be uh, aggregated in the in the cloud. Now. Another solution that has been even more recently proposed in 2022 uh, looks at incorporating this mobility through uh, uh, local movement to the or local access to the uh, uh, access points. So, in other words, if this local device is connected originally to this uh, access point, it does the local training, and then in this setup at, ta at the next time step, it can move left or right uh, to a different access point. So if this is access point I, say it can go to I plus one or to I minus one. So basically it's like having these access points on a string, you know, like uh, the, the 
like linearly oriented. So you can move one step left or right to your left neighbor or to your right neighbor by neighbor, I mean access point. And basically this neighbor, some sort of mobility based on an a priori defined probability. So you could say, well, there is a 50% probability you'll move left or right, assuming that you have these access points available to you. And uh, this is described with this kind of Markov chain type of behavior when you see the access point I and you have access point J and K as neighbors, and there is a certain probability to move in either direction. Uh, and this is how the mobility comes into the picture in this uh, approach. Now, if we look at the real, real mobility, this is the real data we, uh, we have for Austin area. Okay, this is, a, you see here the time changing on an hourly uh, basis uh, on a particular day in, uh, in May 2020. So obviously we're talking about here of uh, 10,000 of devices that we monitor. And uh, you see some of them are uh, shown in blue. These are the real devices, people wearing these devices, so to speak, and moving around. And these are the access points that could be, you know, McDonald's, Starbucks, some school, some uh, uh, home for the user, so on and so forth. And this is just a snapshot of the data to see how this mobility changes. And again, this is at hourly level, level. So it's very hard to imagine that either the first assumption, when you have a fixed number of clients allocated to an access point, or the second one where they move only left and right to, to with a certain probability will hold true under these circumstances. So the mobility um, is a much more complicated thing when it comes to real people, let alone they move you know, leisurely, they move in the cars, they move when they bike. So it's a much more complicated picture. Now, what it means for us, it means from a communication standpoint that if this access point shown here, AP1, is uh, uh, available within a certain range, we just use here generically 100 meters for Wi Fi, um, then these devices in this green, light green circle will be able to access that and communicate very fast and very efficiently with the AP. If the device goes outside this range, then the problem will be a little bit more complicated. Logically, it's the same problem, one device connecting to an access point, but physically it's different because this connection may go all the way to Seattle and come back to Austin, depending on how the LTP is set up. And obviously there are many other things like the network bandwidth, the throughput and other things that come into the picture. So it might be more, much more costly. Now, what we try to see here, we try to see, okay, we have these two assumptions, two uh, different assumptions about mobility, one with fixed access point, one with Markovian type of behavior. Let's see how they perform under real data, under uh, real mobility data. So this is an example here when you have these access points and these devices and you see a time equals to zero, time equals to one, t equals to two. So there are three successive moments in time. And basically you see this first setup uh, with fixed assignment, two devices per access point, you see device one and two attached to AP1, three and four to AP2. So the thing works pretty standard. You download the model in one, two, three, four, in devices one, two, three, four, and then we print locally this, and that's how it works. Now at time t equals to one, as shown here in the middle, this device goes out of the, of the picture, okay? That could be the device ran out of battery. The device was accidentally turned off, whatever it is, okay? So in this case, the situation changes, you upload the model in one, two, three, as shown here, then we do aggregation in one, two, three, that's aggregation in uh, using these devices. Then we download the model and we train locally with one, two, three. Now at t equals to two, there is another move. So you see the device two, went off, so the one that was sh shown here, it becomes red now. And yet another change, device four, maybe is the scenario that I was just telling you, was accidentally disconnected, but maybe when that happened a little bit later, came back and gets attached to this. So the problem is, in this case, you see, you upload the model one and three, because these are the only ones that st stood fixed with this uh, scenario. We do aggregation. We, when we download the model one, two, one, three, and four, again, we include four because now four is available and we train locally one, two, one, three, and four. The point is that four is kind of wasted under this scenario. Didn't get the chance to 
get the model updated or improved. Yet it, it's training um, uh, again in this scenario, although it may, might not be included in the end of aggregation. Now, under the second scenario, the MACFL, when you have this uh, mobility with a certain probability, so this is an example of 50% probability to change the IP. We have a T equals zero, the same arra initial arrangement, and then a T equals one again, device four is out of, of uh, picture, uh, at the, uh, and you see the changes here. So you see the device three gets allocated here from, uh, uh, and the device one, remains to this one device three and four remain to this four is out of the picture and at t equals to two you see uh, 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 another change because device four came about and it's in this case allocated back to ap1 so a lot of changes that do not exactly match the the, the theoretical model so the 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 idea that came to us from this mismatch. The idea was to, okay, try to see if we can do dynamically. In other words, to do community uh, federated learning, dynamic community type of approach, which looks at the mobility and includes this when we create this clustering, if you want to call it this way. And our idea first was to start with the simplest topological distance, if you want, to connect devices to the closest closest IP. And you see in this scenario, at t equals to two, which is this one, okay? At t equals to two aggregate device four, we, this was disconnected temporarily, as I showed earlier, device four is connected to AP1. Uh, since the, 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 the global model did not change yet, okay? So we have, for instance, k, the, the edge aggregation being three. So at t equals two, it's still fair game. So the model is not uh, changed. So then we aggregate in the cloud only the APs that were trained in the previous K2 communication rounds. So obviously this guy is again a waste because he was not trained previously. So let's look at how the results, uh, uh, well, what kind of results do we get here when you look at first device availability and energy spent for communication. Uh, when we look at this, uh, percentage of devices that are uh, are uh, available. So we see here uh, in these three colors. Okay, we see the blue and the the blue and the orange uh, being the two approaches that I was mentioning earlier. The radical federated average blue, the MACFL orange, and the green one is the uh, community FM. So if you look at how this goes, you see here different uh, on a day basis, like a month for a. Uh, one day increment, how this, again, this is based on real mobility data, type of data that I showed. And this is the normalized version. So the green one will be available all the time. So this will be one and the others, you see how much they vary. So going all the way to these dips when none of them is available. So it just happened that none of them is available. And the implication in terms of uh, energy, again, normalized energy consumption here, you see how much variation do we have here uh, when we talk about the, the grid compared to the other one. So the grid saves significantly. So all these gaps that you see here is where we save energy compared to the other ones that are based on either fixed assumption or limited mobility probability to fix that. The, uh, another way to look at the same problem is probably uh, even more interesting when you look at this table here, when we show the comparison between the hierarchical approach, the MACFL, and the community one, in terms of, so to speak, resolution in, as a distance in meters here. So uh, you see the, the decrease here, okay? You see the decrease here in uh, order of magnitude, basically between this and this, which are very comparable otherwise, and this one, in other words, how much more precise we can uh, go about this and therefore exploit when we create this community. So it's a, uh, I said the order of magnitude, this is close to 80x, but it's uh, it's, uh, it's just a snapshot. So also in terms of energy, what does this mean? You see these ones are again very close to each other. This one is significant, it's half of this one. So uh, the impact is significant. Now, if we look from, um, uh, learning perspective. So this is the accuracy versus the communication rounds. Again, the same colors here. And you see the results for M is for a basic configuration of 5,000 um, devices, 100 APs randomly distributed, uh, K2 equals to five. And this is IAD data, and this is not IAD data. 
uh, again, you see the community FL trains much faster. So if you say, okay, it's fixed, we cannot afford more than 100 communication routes, this will be close to 87 accuracy, while this one will be barely 75 or something. And the same thing here. Again, from a different perspective here for IAD and non IAD, you see the, the communication rounds until we hit a certain threshold. So if we fix 90% accuracy, how many communication rounds will take, say, for instance, for the radical uh, approach to converge to 90% will be 445, this will be 180, or this one 400, and this, so these are the improvements. So it's a significant impact. Uh, the same thing from energy perspective. So uh, again, until 90% uh, accuracy, you see the difference here, it's quite significant. Uh, you see the improvements here. Um, and this is a continuation of the mobility in the area of uh, social uh, sensing. So essentially, if you look what we talked about in this generic graph, when you go from server oriented, basically the centralized approach toward a server, the serverless, basically the uh, centralized approach or ad hoc federated learning with different different colors and different shades showing the kind of things that we can exploit from a resource constrained devices perspective so essentially if we get to this point uh, where we want to account for this and go for serverless this will be some of the things that i had mentioned in the previous talk like the blockchain thing peer to peer uh, and act of federated learning which is what i was talking about but coming back to the example that i showed you meaning the austin city area or any other city large city you see, there are three levels at which we can talk about. We can talk at microscopic level where there is peer-to-peer -peer interaction between people in an area, some of them being sick, as shown with this red here, some of them being healthy, the green ones, and some of them being incubating, like the yellow ones. Um, and these interactions from microscopic level translate then to interactions at mesoscopic level, which will be the middle, when we have you know people gathering to a, a local cinema, uh, or people going to some restaurants or to a stadium, all the way to a macroscopic level, which would be an entire area like a county, right? And in this case, these are examples of how this uh, spreading goes and how this region color code shows the degree of infection. So what is the relevance to federated learning would be to consider federated learning for what I call socio-technical systems. So in other words, assuming that if, uh, people have individual devices that can trace interactions and there were some programs you know, that have been developed during the pandemic saying uh, who got infected and notify everyone else. Basically to work on these three aspects, basically to collect on device data, all these things, dwell time, location, if it's mass, not mass, so on and so forth then communicate across devices where this federated learning can be done. And then learning on device, meaning learning locally in a very similar manner to what I said. And the idea would be either to predict nodes, in other words, who's the next who's going to get infected, or to predict links, who may get closer to other people to um, uh, infect them. So in conclusion, I think there are three aspects that I would like to highlight. AJI needs principal design and optimization techniques to consider explicitly device uh, resources. We have a lot of map, we have an, a lot of algorithmic work, but we have to go closer to the actual hardware because all these things run on real devices. Uh, then modern cooperation and federated learning are crucial for inference and training of edge devices. Training is still behind, it's still a big problem. Uh, and elastic transformations hopefully provide a simple and efficient solution for harder to accommodate harder heterogeneity and robustness against data heterogeneity. And last but not least, applications need to go way beyond computer vision when we classify images, cats, dogs, and these things and consider human behavior at multiple scales. The, oh, the stuff that I mentioned with this dynamic community formation is essential for uh, moving toward online and continuous learning. And uh, finally, this is the team of people working on this, as well as our collaborators that have this project and these are the sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? So I got two quick questions. First one, probably I try to understand the model of the model for the like the model. Like why the mobility could 
why do you even have this get a sense to the new body like why it's a problem and how can it get more second question is it seems that only the theoretical variable that problem since if we use the like the neural variable or the device that can get that to the future theory and no device is right so somehow I feel like this problem is totally related to the theoretical uh design and why does that design is necessary um, I think that's okay. So I thought the first one is the first question. So, uh, the first question is about when mobility is a problem. So, okay, I think that's the problem. So, mobility is a problem because the first of all, people are not going to be able to confine to places unless they are sick. But very easy, and nobody wants to get that position. So everything is sort of inherent is mobility, and the point is to sort of in the account for this mobility of the variable value. Because the moment when you account for it, the device is availability on one hand, as well as the aggregation of the chain. In other words, device mobility is that uh, if you have an access to the this is a matter so right now everyone is fixed here. Right? I can say I can allow I have 25 people to access this point and to do whatever I mean we, we try to do together. Change data, whatever. So but the moment when people start moving, you cannot have this thing fixed or even uh, average, because when you talk about market things, you have an average value for several probability to 50 percent, 20 percent or whatever will be available. This won't work because in reality, if I'm telling you, you're not allowed to do that way to the hotel, but only this way because it satisfies my function, is that that's not fundamental desire for the reason. So, that's what people try to, you know, do at three and go about their business in the most convenient, the most efficient, or the most pleasurable way. So, it's not, so that's why so it affects the availability, it affects the energy that is involved because once you don't have access to that point, just imagine you walk in the street, right? And you look at your Wi-Fi. There are many places where you can access your Wi-Fi. So in that case, the communication between you on that on being close to me may happen only if you have LTE. And in that case, the communication cost is very different because it depends on the network to put it out. Never on that it could be 40, 5 and other different models. So it's a cost in energy. So it's availability, cost in energy. And we market the optimization, the optimal speed that it can sell because of the design of the right kind of access point. And then from access point, that would be the quality of the model that access point has and still not meet the requirements. This is the first question. The second question I think. Um, well, why is the interactive design for the presentation? Oh, that, that was uh, the one that was baseline for us. So we compared it again. And when they proposed that, they realize that that can way to increase the efficiency of that work class time. So their results are actually more than not more than that. Many of them are also very theoretical in nature. So the fact that they assumed a fixed configuration was uh, necessary to prove some analytical problems. That was it. So it comes from a slightly different angle that the machine learning is always about the very thing that it comes from people to try to derive analytical. And the same for the Markov chain. When you see a Markov chain as a function, pretty much always, it's because of the tractability of the model. It lends itself to a nice analytical formula. And it's a, it's a good thing, it's an important step. I'm not trying to minimize that it's a good contribution. It's only when you try to use real data. So, for instance, the data that uses four square uh, data. And uh, this data looks very different. Than what you can say when you say, okay, you have 50 percent chance to move, let alone that is only about neighboring. Uh, like those of you lined up on a, on a screen, the AT, the The basic, you saw those, uh, I think that was red, uh, I believe. There are points which are very dense on access points and whatever, like big shopping malls and like this area. And there are points where you have sparse. Uh, more uh, less available things, and uh, in that case, the access which is also limited if you have the right to connect to a network that is available. 
So it goes both wireless and cellular. So does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rodolfo. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. I thought you were speaking next. Okay. No, no, no. I, I'm just, I just wanted to ask a question. So, uh, I'm Shashank from my company. So, uh, one of the things uh, is uh, autonomous, right? Autonomous, right? So, uh, I see that there's a possibility for companies to still have a competitive strategy, but at the same time, it benefits the society for them to share of their models. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, for example, if they want to develop better pedestrian detection or pedestrian activity or prediction model, I think it benefits for everybody to have the same level of standard for how they uh, optimize for pedestrian safety and things like that. Yeah. So, do you see any uh, predatory learning architecture or courses or research in, in this area where yeah. you can still uh, uh, contribute to a global model that is that makes everyone uh, look like they're co yeah. uh, cooperative, but at the same time, they still get to keep the edge of that they do be cooperative? Yeah, thank you. Very good question. So, if I get you correctly, if you mention the autonomous driving, I assume you imagine of the cars that are on the path, like in this. So, in that case, just imagine some cars going to a city and they, they see what they see on that street. That's whatever it is, just objective. You take the vehicle and talk with the exam, right? So, this, if this federated learning is allowed at the city level or whatever, the cars that will be nearby will be able to aggregate this and create a model of the area that should be for instance used in a very meaningful way for traffic congestion, immediate traffic congestion. So typically when this happens, it happens in localized spots, like you know, three, four blocks or five blocks or whatever. So these cars on different streets will be able to get their data and just exchange the model and create a model that is better. But this can be also macroscopically. So whatever they see in Austin at this point in time is different than what they see in Seattle. But not so much over long periods of time. Probably eight to ten in the morning will be a problem in both cases. So there is way to aggregate this data at different scales in space and time and improve this model such that we can get better coverage from the time. So in other words, each of us can benefit if we it's similar to network computing and uh, what you use from different views. But at the end of the day, the Global model can be improved. So the split here is between space and time, uh, and the aggregation that happens can happen in real or near, near real time. For instance, we talk about cars moving at 50 miles per hour, which is, you know, that is probably faster than real time type of prediction. Uh, but uh, also, long time horizon, so at the end of the day, to manage the traffic for congestion in this city. So there are many beneficial uh, Another example that came to my mind is just now, if, for instance, if you imagine you have drones and each of them have cameras that can get into a building that collapsed or earthquake or whatever, and they try to reproduce different 3D spaces from different corners of the building. So a drone may get here uh, to this uh, hole here and try to map this to see if there are survivors or, or the, the, the damage. I said the damage, somebody may come on the other opposite end of the convention center and do that. So aggregating this will create a 3D model of the building and we'll be able to create an assessment, do an assessment of the damage at the global scale, in this case of the building, and see if humans can handle it or need to pull out more. And we could go on and on. We could talk more after the, the, the talks. Or you can scan. Uh, there was a yeah, there QR code. We, we could give you our contact and uh, yeah, we could So can you can, can the audience hear us now? Yes, yes, we can. Hear. Okay, yeah. So so while you are setting up, let me let me do a quick introduction. So yeah, so the next speaker is Professor uh, Yonina Elder. So you know, as the uh, team mentioned, you know, the goal of this workshop is to enable cross community talks about federated learning. So we are very happy to have uh, Yonina, who is the uh, the leader uh, in the field of uh, signal processing and uh, information theory. 
So she's uh, currently a professor with the uh, Wilson, Wilson Institute of Science in, at Israel, and she got her, her, her uh, bachelor's degree from Tel Aviv University and PhD from MIT. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Yolina holds many awards and so many good things to say about her, but I know we are already beyond our schedule, so you know, I will leave the floor to Yolina. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the really kind introduction. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, let me just see here if I can share my slides, sorry. Okay, great. Could everybody see them? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Great, so thank you very much for this uh, invitation. Uh, I was debating a lot what to talk about, if to talk about you know some of our recent work in federated learning or a little bit more of concepts that uh, maybe have potential to be used in federated learning. And of course, I, I decided to just uh, mix them and do a little bit of both. So um, hopefully, you know, there'll be a little bit of something for, for everyone. So one of the themes that we've been working on a lot in our group, and also have been applying to federated learning, is this notion of model-based learning. So of course, many people are working on that, where really the goal is to try and incorporate models together with learning. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about kind of the basics or fundamentals behind this concept of model-based learning. And then, um, you know, with the time I have also shows some applications to federated learning. And then, in, in, you know, most importantly, I hope it will maybe open up uh, some ideas and, and discussions where maybe these ideas could be applied further in federated learning. So let me say at the outset, if there's anyone who's listening to this and, you know, thinks that it could be interesting or relevant to something that you're doing, then please, you know, obviously in the Q&A, but also after, please feel free to reach out and I'm always super happy to discuss ideas and, and to collaborate. So, you know, obviously to this audience, right, we don't have to motivate deep learning or how important it is in many applications. Uh, but I do want to point out that most of the applications where deep learning is, is actually employed in practice are really applications that are very difficult to model um, otherwise. So, you know, many, many applications, of course, in computer vision and speech processing. And these are really problems that were traditionally difficult to tackle using conventional optimization methods. So, you know, obviously we could do amazing things with uh, deep learning, we could do crazy things like spawn fake faces, which I'm not really sure is a good use of your time, but we could do, of course, you know, many more important things like develop, you know, very powerful detectors, classifiers, et cetera, et cetera. However, the good results that we typically see require, you know, very large training sets. Uh, the training could be computationally very, very exhaustive. Uh, you know, one of the major issues is that we typically don't have interpretability, so it's very hard to interpret the results. It's not clear how robust the answer is, how well it generalizes. And of course, even when we do get very good models, they could be super complex. So, you know, I think we're all familiar with GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters, okay? So that's kind of an unimaginable number from a signal processing perspective. And obviously that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's so hard to train, you need a lot of data, and it's also so hard to interpret. Now, if we look on the other hand at signal processing, which is the area that I'm coming from, uh, you know, traditional signal processing is based very, very heavily on modeling, right? Signal processing information theory, it's fundamentally based on models. And, and the nice thing about using model-based processing is that we can incorporate everything basically we know about the problem. We can incorporate structure and anything else that we know. It typically allows us to get inference from small amounts of data. And typically we have very nice analytical techniques that we could use to assess the quality of the output. So we could know in advance you know, how well we could do and if the problem is well-defined. So those are the advantages, but of course, you know, the major disadvantage, of course, is that we need to have a model, which we may not always have, or maybe we have a basic model, but we don't know it exactly. And even when we do have models, the inference itself could be complicated or slow. So one of the things that we, and of course, many other groups have been working on is how do we combine these two worlds? How do we combine the world of modeling with the world of deep learning? Where really our goal is to get, you know, compact networks that are interpretable, that are simple to train, but of course are also data driven. So to see kind of, you know, conceptually how we can merge these two approaches, I want to give a really high level bird's eye view on, you know, model-based processing versus deep learning, and then we can see how they could merge. So in, in a typical signal processing problem, you start with a measurement. We'll call it here Y. For example, it could be a blurry image. There is some desired output. Let's say your clean underlying image. And then you assume that you have a known relationship. So we assume that Y could be approximated by some function G of X. So we know this relationship in advance. And then once we're given Y in order to infer X, 
what we're going to do is we're going to set up some metrics. So it could be, for example, a norm difference, or it could be any other metric. And then we're going to use our favorite optimization method in order to optimize the metric. So in this case, we want to minimize the error. Now, you know, typically that's not going to have a closed form solution. So we'll use our favorite iterative solver. It could be, you know, projected gradient, ADMM, whatever your favorite uh, optimization technique is. And what we'll end up getting is an iterative algorithm, which typically looks something like this. So we have some pre-processing, some post-processing, and then we have the heart of the iterative algorithm where we iterate on basic blocks. And these blocks you could typically break up into two. One block that is really kind of generic computations doesn't really depend on anything specific about the, the problem. And then we have a block that's model dependent. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, pictorially what a iterative algorithm would look like. Now, on the other hand, of course, in deep learning, the situation is very, very different. So we have pairs in supervised learning. We have pairs of inputs and outputs. We have a fixed architecture that we determine in advance. It could be a ResNet, it could be you know, a, a CNN, whatever you choose to use as your network. And then what we do with this training data is that we learn the weights from the training data. And then when our new input Y comes in, we put it through this train network and you know, hope that it will give us a good output X. So these are two very different approaches. And the question is how we can merge them. And the way we're going to do it, and again, you know, many other people are working on this as well, is we're going to look at two basic approaches. The first is referred to as unfolding or unrolling. And here we basically use the optimization algorithm in order to infer the architecture. So instead of having a fixed architecture, these layers here are going to resemble this iterative algorithm. So basically we're inferring using a deep network, but the layers in this network look like an optimization problem. The second approach is, is kind of the reverse. So in the second approach, we infer using an algorithm. We don't infer using a network. But anytime there's a block that depends on something we don't know, we kind of plug in a network just to learn that block. OK, and in the next uh, two slides, I'll, I'll hopefully explain that in a little bit more detail. So the first method called unfolding or unrolling dates back to a really, really beautiful paper of Gregor and Lacun uh, from 2010 and since then has been expanded on by, by many different people. Um, those of you interested, we have a recent review that we wrote on the topic that you could go ahead and take a closer look at. And, and this idea is, is really neat. So basically what you do is you start with your iterative algorithm that we showed before. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write down a fixed number of iterations of this algorithm. So here we have, you know, t iterations, where t is typically a small number, so you know, five or ten. Now, this is just implementing right now ten steps of an iterative algorithm, which is typically not a good idea because you're not going to get a good output. But then what we do in the final step, which makes it a network and not just an fixed algorithm is that in these iterative steps, there's always parameters that depend on the model. What we're going to do is we're going to free them, meaning instead of keeping them fixed, we're going to actually learn them from data. So what we end up getting is a network where these layers look like the layers in an iterative algorithm, but instead of keeping them fixed, we learn them in each layer. And this is what's in for what's called algorithm unrolling or algorithm unfolding. So this is the first approach that we're going to use. The second approach is a very, very simple plug-in approach where we infer using the algorithm. But whenever there's a block that depends on something we don't know, we just stick in a very shallow network only for that block. And the reason why we use a shallow network is because we're only learning an individual block. We're not learning an end-to-end -end algorithm. So this is an approach we've used a lot in communication networks, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, but those of you interested, there's a review that we wrote specifically for communications because that's really kind of the main application where we use these ideas. So hopefully that gives you kind of um, you know, a sense of what we mean when we say model-based learning, where there's these two main approaches that we use. But, but of course, there's many other ways we could think of incorporated models uh, into learning. So I also want to talk today about how we could also do that in the context of federated learning. So I'm going to start by just you know, very, very briefly uh, pointing out where we may be able to incorporate models in, in federated learning. We'll then talk about different applications of unrolling and the plug-in approach to imaging in general and communications in general. And then we'll go back to look at specific applications to federated learning. And uh, depending on time, we'll end with maybe just a little bit of theory that establishes that these algorithms actually work better in practice than algorithms that are not based on learning. Uh, sorry, on models, everything based on learning, on models. 
Okay, so clearly I don't need to motivate federated learning to this community. Let me just, you know, very, very briefly kind of go over the basics just so we're on the same page and using the same notation. Um, so, you know, when we're talking, at least in, in this context of federated learning, we're thinking of a single machine learning model, theta, which is basically being updated at the server. We have many participating entities. So we have all our edge users that have, you know, different data sets, which could be heterogeneous. And the central server is, of course, maintaining the model and orchestrating the entire learning procedure. So the, the setup that we're looking at is where we can have very different devices. The devices could be very, very diverse. They don't necessarily have to be IID. We're assuming, of course, that each device has enough computational power to do their own individual training, but of course, not enough uh, data or power to do the to learn the entire model. Each one of the individual devices has their own label data. So we're looking at a supervised setting. And of course, you know, we have the local objectives that are gonna be aggregated to the overall objective at the server. And of course, because we don't have enough data in each of the individual links, and we don't have enough power, computational power in each of the individual links, this motivates collaboration, which uh, leads of course to federated learning where we have, you know, the central entity who's training this global model that we're gonna denote by theta. Um, but the central server, of course, doesn't have access to data, only to the function of the data that we're going to share with the central server. And at the central server, we have a global objective weighted uh, typically by, you know, the, the average or the relative uh, number of samples each one of the individual identities have. Um, and the goal at the server is to minimize the overall objective. So all of this, of course, is, is well known. I'm just, I'm just fixing notation and the purpose of this talk. Now, of course, when we look at the federated learning steps, and again, this is obviously well known, but I just, we're gonna use some of these points later on in the talk. So the there's the downlink, what I refer to as downlink, which is when the server is sharing the theta with the individual users. And then of course, there's the local update, right? Where each individual. And then, Sorry, there could be some background noise. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought there was a question. I'm sorry, okay. Um, I thought there was a question. Sorry. If there is a question, please feel free to ask. Um, and then we have, you know, the individual devices that are doing their individual updates, uh, going through the uplink channel. Oh, and and uh, okay. So sorry. So so can the audience be muted? I think someone is uh, yeah, muted. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Sure. And then um, through the uplink channel, we share the uh, the individual outputs with the central server. Um, now, for the purpose of this talk, and it doesn't really affect anything I'm gonna be talking about today, we're, we're going to assume that we're using federated average at the server, but again, it doesn't really affect any of the results. And we're gonna be using uh, uh, SGD stochastic gradient descent uh, for the local updates. Okay, so all of that, of course, is well known, just fixing notation in the context here of federated learning. So some of the aspects we're, we're gonna focus on in this talk today where models I believe are, are really important and we'll show some initial results is first of all, translating the, the training output and of course on the downlink as well, but here I'm focusing on the uplink um, into a coded output that's sent to the server. So, you know, we think again, when, when federated learning I think was devised originally, right? When we're, we're looking at the original papers, um, they, they really don't go too much into, you know, how does the communication take place, right? Is it over a noisy channel? Is it over a clean channel? What are the big constraints uh, we may have over the communication channel? And again, coming from the world of communication and signal processing, uh, this is these are really important concerns, right? At the end of the day, we, we have to orchestrate this federated learning setting over, you know, let's say a real wireless uh, communication channel. And then things like, you know, how do we code the individual thetas that are being updated at the local uh, devices um, how do we combat noise on the channel? All of these things become very important and using models to do that also becomes very important. So that's really gonna be the focus that I'm gonna uh, talk about here today. So one of the things that we really care about is the mapping or you could think of as the coding, right? How, how do we go from the updates into what we end up sending to the server? And of course the downlink has the same problem as well. So, you know, this is one very important problem. And when you think about this from an information theory point of view, this is really a form of distributed source coding, right? Because we have individual sources. These are the individual devices that wanna communicate their local update to the server. They're of course correlated, right? All of these outputs are correlated. I mean, at the end, they're all supposed to, in some sense, be the same. So they're definitely correlated throughout the iterations. They're, they're not equal, but they're highly correlated. 
They're distributed though, because the sources don't communicate with each other, right? The whole point is that each individual source only has their own data. So from an information theory point of view, this is really a distributed source coding problem. And therefore we would like to use distributed source coding methods in order to address it, taking into account that this is part of an iterative algorithm. So we'll see later on how we can do that. And clearly models here will, will play an important role. So the, the typical thing that, that people do, and that's also what we're going to look at here today, even though it doesn't really affect the results, is conveying the model updates, right? Not the theta itself, but the difference from the previous update. And, and typically here, what we're going to use as the parameter is going to be the gradient, okay? So that's just to fix ideas, but it doesn't influence any of the results really that we're going to show later on. Okay, so some of the drawbacks in conventional theta rooted learning, when we think about it in a more communication setting, which we'll try to address later on using models, is, you know, obviously the dimensionality, right? So if we're thinking about a communication network, we're going to be bit limited. So how do we convey um, these individual thetas? And if we think about a large parameter set, right, if we're thinking about a learning process, theta could be very, very large. Obviously, the dimension of the gradient is going to be the dimension of the parameters, which in general is going to be very large. And this is where using model-based learning is going to be important because that automatically will reduce the dimension. The other issue is that in standard federated learning, we don't really take any models into account, right? We have the gradient and we send it over the channel. But obviously, the gradient has a lot of structure. Furthermore, if we use model-based learning, then the network itself has structure coming from the model, and this will imply structure also on the gradient, which we could further exploit in order to do better in compression. Of course, there's the whole issue of privacy, which I'm actually not going to be talking about here, but I do mention it because it is something we're working on as well. You know, privacy, of course, is a big issue. We, we know that the gradients are leaky. They don't really preserve privacy. And, and here again, the question is, you know, by using models, could we exploit that in privacy preserving federated learning as well? Um, and, and of course, standard federated learning is agnostic of the underlying task, right? At the end of the day, you know, we're trying to solve a network problem, whereas where we're sending this information over the channel, we're not really taking into account what the overall network is trying to do. So here again, if we're using a model-based network, then the gradients are also going to be model-based and it's going to be easier to take into account, for example, the task, which could help us in several aspects. It could help us in coding, right? We could, we could do more efficient coding if we know the task. It can help us also in combating the noise over the channel once we know the task. So hopefully this gives you a sense of where models can be important in the context of federated learning. Learning. And what I'm going to do next is go back to the model-based learning, putting federated learning aside, but then we'll go back and kind of hopefully at least close the loop a little bit by showing how these ideas of model-based learning and these ideas of models in general could be incorporated to get these various benefits in the context of federated learning. Okay, so with that, let me turn to go back to some examples of model-based learning, which will hopefully show more generally how it's used, and then we'll end up with model-based federated learning. So if there's any questions before I continue, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so hopefully the setup is clear, and let's go back to the model-based learning. So uh, we started by saying that one of the major methods that we use is this unfolding idea. And in the original paper by Gregor and Lacoon, they actually developed this unfolding idea in, in the context of sparse recovery, which is kind of one of the basic optimization problems that you know people have been looking at in the past decade. So in the basic sparse recovery problem, you have a simple linear model, so you know that your measurements are equal to some AX plus noise where you assume that you know the forward model A, okay, so you know the, the linear matrix, and you further assume that X is sparse. So a standard approach, you know, to deal with these problems is to use an L1 regularizer to promote sparsity. And if you use just a standard projected gradient method, you end up with what's known as the iterative shrinkage and thresholding method. And basically what that does is in each iteration, you get your input Y, you perform a gradient step, which is what you get here in these green blocks. So this is just coming from the gradient where mu is the step size. And then the, the proximal part or the L1 part is gonna give you a soft thresholding projection operator. So if you were applying projected gradient, what you would do is you, know, you would take this gradient step, go through the soft threshold, get your next iteration, and then continue. Okay, so an iterative algorithm here would have this input Y and you'd continue to operate on this function F where F is all of this block. OK, and you would do this, you know, typically several thousand times and end up getting your underlying value X. When you look at unfolding, what you do is you take this basic block, you write it down a fixed small number of times. 
But now you allow yourself to learn the different parameters. So for example, instead of assuming that lambda is known and fixed, you could learn lambda in each one of the layers. Or instead of assuming that you know this A is known or mu is known, you could learn these individual blocks. Now, there's an art to this, not just a science, because you get to make choices like, do I want to entirely learn these blocks or do I want to use the known relationship between them? So there's some flexibility here into what you learn and what you keep fixed. And that will typically depend on what you know about the problem. But this gives a very intuitive you know, way of deriving networks, which come from the optimization problem. You know, clearly they have a small number of parameters, which makes them efficient in terms of data. They're also efficient in terms of uh, complexity and, and footprint. And, and most importantly, they're interpretable, right? Like, you know exactly what you're doing. And if you now have additional knowledge about the problem, you could add another regularizer, you could change the regularizer, and that will change the network, but in a very controlled way. It's not like you're guessing the network. It's just a result of the gradient approach. So the nice thing is that once you put this in an optimization framework, you can now use you know, all the many, many known optimization results um, to extend these networks in various different ways. So for example, one thing we looked at is trying to generalize networks better. So trying to get uh, you know, robustness to, to the training data if the training data is noisy. And the way we did that is in a very systematic fashion, we relied on robust optimization. So if you go back to this basic L1 problem, then in order to make it robust from an optimization point of view, what people have looked at in the literature is assuming that the matrix A has a perturbation to it. And then not only do you want to minimize the error and the regularizer, but you also want to minimize the perturbation to the forward matrix. And, and this is the well-known robust uh, lasso formulation. So if you just look at this as an optimization problem, you know, you could solve for this variable E and you end up with a new optimization problem, which is very similar to what we had before, but we have this additional normalization. Okay, now the nice thing is we're not guessing the normalization. It just follows from solving this robust optimization problem. So up until here, this is just optimization. But now, of course, in the final step, we're going to apply a projected gradient, which gives us kind of, you know, these iterations, which again is similar to what we had before, but now we have this additional normalization and an additional term from taking the gradient also of this denominator. And then if we unfold this, we get a network now that looks very different than the network that we started from. And the nice thing though, is that we didn't guess it, right? It would be almost impossible to guess this type of network. It really just came out of using robust optimization. And indeed we can show that when the training data is noisy, this network is, is much more robust. It gives us a much smaller error than you know, all of the competing options of doing deep learning on the same data set. So it gives us a very systematic way of extending networks in various different directions by relying on different ideas and results from optimization theory. Okay, so we talked about the underlying idea. We talked about one example of how you could extend it using different optimization ideas. And of course, you could extend in many other ways as well. So let me quickly just show some uh, applications and then we'll move on to, to some other ideas. So the first application we looked at, and this was together with a group of Professor Vishal Monga, was you know, the very, very basic image deep learning problem, which you know there's, there's literally thousands of papers that look at this problem. So when we started off by looking at this, to be honest, we didn't really think that we would do better than current results. We just wanted to see if we could do almost as good, um, but using a much simpler network. So here, we're assuming that we have you know, some underlying unknown image. It's blurred by an unknown kernel, and we have random noise. And what we did is we just set up a generic optimization problem where we're trying to minimize the error um, subject to L1 constraints on the features and L2, an L2 constraint on the blurring kernel. And we used a very simple variable splitting approach, like an ADMM approach, and just wrote down the optimization problem and then unfolded it into a network. And, and the nice thing is that by just following these very simple steps, we have 10 layers in the network, so something very simple, we actually could do better than all of the competing results that were tailored specifically to this problem. And of course, you know, the networks they use were much more complicated. So here you see our method, Dublid, um, compared to you know, the state of the art deep learning methods, which are networks that are much more complicated, have many more parameters. And what's interesting is that you see that by using the simple approach, both quantitatively, right, in terms of SNIR, SNR, ISNR, and uh, similarity metrics, and qualitatively, you know, we get much sharper images 
the, our, our images have much less blur in them. So it's it's a really nice and powerful result. And the important thing is also that it's uh, very systematic. Now, of course, in what we showed right now, we assumed an L1 regularizer. So we assumed we knew the, the regularizer. And more recently, we've been looking at also learning the regularizer together with learning the unfolding. So what we did in this case is that we used normalizing flow. So we characterize the regularizer by a PDF coming from a normalizing flow. And then we learned the parameters of the PDF as we went through the network. And, and the nice thing is that this actually gives us uh, much more powerful results because obviously it's screening a much richer class of problems. So this was work, sorry, I forgot to mention my collaborators. And um, this is work we did together with Professor Waldwin Sloan um, and Daniel Friedman from, from Google. And, and here you see that we could treat much more noisy images. So here we have, you know, very, very, uh, uh, corrupted image, very heavy noise. Here we have heavy blur. And here we just cropped out a part of the image. So these are much more challenging imaging problems. And therefore, we also learned the prior. But you see that using, again, the simple approach, we get uh, better results than more sophisticated networks. OK, so that was kind of more standard imaging. Uh, one of the themes that we've been working on a lot in our group um, is actually medical imaging. And one of the areas of medical imaging that we've been working on a lot is ultrasound. So I I'm just going to show, you know, one or two results here, but those of you interested, we have a review specifically on these ideas in the context of ultrasound, uh, together with Professor Old Van Sloan, who's my collaborator in these areas. And what I'm showing here is a cool problem where we're trying to basically separate uh, background clutter tissue from, from blood flow. So here, what you normally get in an ultrasound image when you're trying to image blood flow is that you get the flow together with the background tissue. And the tissue in the background is actually, its contrast is much larger than the blood flow. So when you see them overlaid, you're basically only seeing the tissue, which of course we're not interested in, we wanna get rid of. So to perform the separation, what people do in practice is they rely on SVD, but it doesn't really give a very good separation. Uh, what we did instead is we modeled this problem as having a low rank plus sparse, right? So we're assuming that the tissue background is low rank and that the blood flow is sparse. And then we used, um, you know, just this unfolding approach uh, to, to develop a network. So we assume that our data, this is real data, and you see that the clutter here is very dominant. The data is a combination of low rank plus sparse. We set that up as, you know, a low rank regularizer, a sparsity regularizer, Again, used you know, just a very simple proximal gradient scheme, unfolded it, and here you see that it gives really, really good separation. And again, it also leads to networks that you wouldn't have guessed in advance. So this is a very interesting looking network because it has two inputs, it has two separate nonlinearities that kind of cross over in this MIMO fashion. So it would be very hard to just guess this type of network, but from our point of view, it just followed from the proximal gradient approach. Um, we've also been using this to develop ultrasound devices that are smaller and more compact. So using these same ideas of model-based networks, we were able to develop probes that are very small that could create images from much smaller data. And, and those of you interested, we have a review that we, we wrote for the BITS magazine, which is the information theory magazine, where we go into this all in much more detail. So I'll just describe the high-level ideas. So basically today, um, ultrasound machines are, are very big and complicated, and that's because within the probe, there's 128 channels. So basically you could think of it as like a MIMO radar where you have many channels that have to be sampled. But using these model-based ideas, we were able to show that we can actually create the image from a much smaller number of antenna elements. And from each element, we could take much fewer samples. And that already allows us to do it within the probe. So instead of having a machine, all we have is a very simple probe that scans. The data could go over a standard Wi-Fi channel because it's at a low rate, um, directly to like a simple device. So Hello, here you see just a short demo like of um, Dr. Shai Kamen Yoden, one of our collaborators, who's okay. using this device. So here he's scanning my former student, Vega, and the data is going from the probe directly to a local machine, to a remote machine via the cloud, and to the tablet, where the idea is that because there's a very small amount of data, you could send it over Wi-Fi, and you don't need a complicated machine to recover it. We can see the nice motion of the leaflets. We can see that actually there is a good ventricular function, and there is no pericardial effusion. The picture itself is very good, very crisp, and we can demonstrate very nicely 
uh, this subject. Okay, now he's scanning uh, directly to the tablet. The, the other nice thing is that once we have the actual data available and not just the imaging, we could again do model-based learning to create higher quality images. So instead of using the standard beamforming that people use today, we use model-based beamforming where we learn the weights um, again in this model-based fashion, and we see that we could get images with much better contrast and much better resolution. We could also, using these model-based ideas, get quantitative parameters. So today, ultrasound is thought of as an imaging device, right? We get an image. But by using these model-based ideas, we can actually write down the physical equation. So we actually write down the wave equations and unfold them. And in that way, we can actually get maps of physical parameters, not just of images. And here you say very clearly, this is a phantom of a, of a tumor. And you see that in the regular image, you know, there's many black areas, but it's hard to see that there's a tumor. Whereas when you use unfolding and you get the quantitative parameters, here specifically we're looking at speed of sound, you can see that the speed of sound is very, very different in this area, which is indicative of a tumor. We've also used this for other imaging problems. I won't go into detail here. Uh, we've used this uh, in, in COVID. We started a task force in Israel. We were working with several hospitals on you know, ways where, where deep learning can help in COVID, and particularly here, we focused on COVID detection from X-ray and ultrasound. And again, using these model-based ideas, we could get really, really good performance to so over 90% accuracy um, in detection. And those of you interested, you know, all of this work has been published. So um, you could take a look at some of our work in this area. Okay, so let me switch gears. We're, we're you know, getting close to the end. So I want to talk very briefly about um, super resolution and then uh, we'll, we'll go back to federated learning. So one of the interesting problems in, in microscopy and also in ultrasound, anything that's wave-based, is that we know that we're limited by the diffraction limit, which means that we can't see details that are smaller than half the wavelength used for illumination. So if we're using an optical microscope, we can see um, cells and bacteria, but we won't be able to see proteins and small molecules. Now, in 2014, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to you know, super resolution uh, microscopy, where the idea here was to use fluorescent molecules, put them into whatever it is we want to image, and then control the fluorescence so that instead of taking one image, we now take thousands of images, where in each image there's only a small number of fluorophores. So if we have, you know, just three green blinking things, we can kind of pinpoint them, okay, just stick a Gaussian every time there's like a green blinking thing, and then if you sum over all of these exposures, you'll get one super resolved image. Um, so, so this is, of course, a very powerful method and led to the Nobel Prize, but we get here spatial resolution at the expense of temporal resolution, because now we need, you know, thousands of images or exposures to get actually a single image, which means that we can't do live cell imaging. So here we use these ideas of model-based learning in order to get the same resolution or better resolution, but do it very quickly. And we just set this up as a sparse recovery problem or sparse recovery in the correlation domain. And by using this unfolding, we were able to get really, really good resolution. In fact, even better than um, the storm approach, which is the method behind the Nobel Prize. But we did it with two orders of magnitude less samples. Now, what's nice is that once we've done that, we could really pave the way to live cell imaging. So we've been working now with Professor Bilal Duran, uh, from the Weizmann Institute for the first time to use these ideas to track um, the, the immune response of T cells and to really see them dynamically. So for the first time, we could see the dynamic response uh, with and a super resolved uh, limit. And what's even more exciting to us is that more recently, we've developed what we call autosparcum. So there's no training data. This is all done in an unsupervised fashion on a single input. And, and the reason is that they're looking at things that no one had seen before, so there is no training data. But here you see kind of the original movie, and here you see the super resolved uh, movie, and you could see that we could get much better resolution in real time, again, by using this unfolding on a sparse recovery problem. So those of you who may be interested more in the biological imaging, we have a review on that as well um, that you could go ahead and take a look at. Okay, so let me just end by saying that we can also use this in a clinical domain. So, you know, here I've been talking about general imaging, but we've taken this idea into the clinical domain, into ultrasound. And here, of course, we don't have fluorophores or we don't want to inject fluorophores into the body, but instead we've used contrast agents where you inject these bubbles into the bloodstream and they're FDA approved, so there's no problem in doing that. And mathematically, these play the same role as the fluorophores. So we basically applied the same idea in ultrasound. This is a clinical study we did together with uh, Dr. Huva Goldstein and her team in Valenson Hospital. And we took, you know, uh, 
breast cancer patients. And if you look at just a standard ultrasound image, you can see that all of these patients have a lesion, but you can't really see the differences between these different lesions. They all look the same. But after we used uh, this unfolding approach, and this is all done you know, without training data and in post-processing, you can see that these lesions are in fact very, very different. So here you can see that you know it's very homogeneous and that's actually indicative of a benign lesion. Here you see that there's fluid inside, which is indicative of a cyst. And here, unfortunately, this is actually a malignant tumor. You can see by the fact that it's very inhomogeneous, both in terms of its shape and in terms of the concentration of the blood vessels. So by using these ideas, we could basically see what you couldn't see before without having to use training data, but relying on these models. Okay, so as I've said, we've also used this a lot in, in different communication problems. So maybe in the interest of time, um, I'll skip I'll skip the communication part. Let me just say, you know, two slides about theory, and then I'll, I'll I'll wrap up with showing some examples in federated learning. So we've seen kind of many examples where this works really well in practice, and hopefully I've motivated why we expect it to work. But the thing is, you know, could we actually prove that it works? And of course, proving anything in deep learning is very complicated. But but luckily because it actually relies on models, in some sense, it's even easier to prove results. And, and recently, we've looked at two types of results that we could prove uh, in, in this unfolding approach. So the first result was looking at generalization error. And we were able to actually prove, um, I think for the first time, that the generalization error in this case actually decays if, if the parameters are chosen appropriately with a number of layers. So of course, this is very intuitive that it should, the generalization error should decay, but at least as far as I know, the bounds currently in the literature on standard networks um, don't actually decay as the number of layers. And that's one of the problems with many of these bounds. But by using uh, rather macro complexity on these model-based networks, we were able to prove that the bound does in fact decay. And of course, it's much lower than the bound that you would get uh, without using a model-based approach. So, you know, that's one result that we're kind of very excited about. Uh, the other results that we looked at are actually optimization guarantees. So that was a more learning guarantee. And here really our question was, you know, how much training data do we need to drive the error down to zero on the training data? So we were able to get bounds on that. And again, using these bounds, we can compare between the number of data samples we need compared to a non-model-based version and also between different model-based versions. And again, we can show that the model-based approach uh, needs less training data. So, you know, we do have some beginning of theoretical results that we're excited about, but of course, you know, there's many, many more results that you could think of trying to prove in this context. So it's definitely still an area where a lot of work could be done, but the initial results are encouraging and, and really establish uh, theoretically what, what we see empirically. Okay, so let me take the last few minutes uh, so that I end on time and, and kind of go back to the places that we pointed out where models could be used in federated learning. And I'll try to show some examples of how we used it. But, but really, I think you know this is really more of an open area. So I think there's many more areas where these model-based ideas could be used in the context of federated learning. And I hope I got at least someone excited about it. So uh, anyone who's interested in this, please really do feel free to reach out. And I'd love to talk more about this. Okay, so one of the things we talked about a lot, which is very important, of course, from an information theory or communication theory point of view, um, is the compression, is 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 the, the rate limit that we always have in the channel. And if you do a speed test, you know, regardless of where you are, if you do a speed test, you'll always see something like this, right? That the download is, you know, orders of magnitude faster than the upload, right? So it's always easier to download um, a file than to upload a file. So Therefore, here we're really looking at uplink, right, which is really important in federated learning because we're all going to be in the situation of uplinking, right, of uploading, which is really where we have severe rate constraints. And in standard, standard federated learning, you know, this is often kind of overlooked. So there's been quite a few papers coming from the you know, communication community looking at this problem, right? How can we do efficient compression? And the leading approaches are really based on uh, sparsification. So you could try to sparsify the data instead of, you know, sending the, the entire vector, vector try to transform it into a domain in which it will be sparse. And then of course you'll have less samples um, to convey. Um, one of the methods of doing sparsification is by using random masks or by doing a rotation and then subsampling using random masks or keeping dominant gradient. So there's various uh, kind of different versions of doing sparsification, but it's really kind of the leading approach to reduce dimensionality. But an interesting question here is, as we pointed out before, you know, this is really a distributed source coding problem. So, you know, rather than trying to use different approaches, which are very intuitive here, um, but, you know, they are heuristic, 
could we use information theory, which is based on models, so it requires kind of modeling the problem, in order to kind of address this issue from a more uh, information theory perspective and find out what the best compression is. So, of course, we don't want to assume any particular statistics, and in, in particular, we don't want to assume that we have an IID setting, which is the easier setting to work with in an information theory context, because we are assuming that the devices that we're looking at could be very heterogeneous. So here we rely on what's known as uh, universal quantization. And, you know, I won't go into it here because obviously it's a very rich and deep theory and there's been, you know, literally tens of years of work on this. But but just in a, in a nutshell, um, and I'll say a little bit about it, using different lattice quantization approaches, you can show that you can get universal quantizers, meaning that they approach the optimal quantizer without having to know the exact input distribution. So the nice thing is that you know, they minimize the distortion or, or approach the optimal distortion. They don't require statistical knowledge. They, they do require some sort of, of modeling, but not full um, statistical knowledge. And the way they basically work is by assuming some source of common randomness. So you assume that there's, you know, a random vector that you could distribute to everyone. And you know it because in, in the federated learning context, this is actually very natural since you have a central server. So the central server can orchestrate this common source of randomness. And of course, it knows what it sent to everyone. So it actually knows the randomness itself. And in that way, you could approach the optimal lattice coding, even though there's no uh, communication between the different elements. So, so the idea, and again, you know, I'm not going to go into this in, in full detail, but just kind of, uh, you know, just to give the main concept. So you, you divide the space into these lattices, and then you have this, this common chair, this common source of randomness that each of the individual users is going to uh, add to their update before they decide which cell they're in. Okay, so you add this noise, you then quantize the cell that you're in, but the uh, underlying server knows the source of the noise. So they could, of course, subtract it. You quantize it, the server will then subtract it, will remove it later. And the nice thing is that this really simple approach, you can actually prove, um, and again, and these are known results in, in information theory, you see here that they date back already, you know, 20, 30 years, is that you can prove that this approach has, has uh, very good statistical properties. It does have the one disadvantage that there's always noise left over from this common source of randomness, because when you quantize it, and then you subtract it, obviously, you're not going down to zero. And this is one of the issues with this uh, universal approach. But now the really nice thing in federated learning, and in particular in federated averaging, is that we actually average out the noise. So it's super natural to use this approach because kind of its only disadvantage is something that in the context of federated learning is going to be taken care of anyway. So what's nice, and again, I won't go into the details, but we can actually prove that by using this approach, um, you know, we, we get essentially an optimal recovery of the individual uh, updates. And we can also show that we could get, uh, at least an expectation, we could get an optimal recovery of the objective function as well. So this is a really powerful approach and allows us to really go down to very, very low bit rates. So here we're showing kind of this approach that even with you know one or two bits, we can actually approach the optimal performance, again, after doing the averaging at the server. So this is kind of one approach where, where the models really come into a play. And then just the last approach, and with this I'm, I'm wrapping up, is what's known as over-the-air federated learning. And this is super important. So in a true communication setting, um, of course, you're sending the data over a noisy channel. And if you don't, if you look at an analog version, okay, so if you're not coding, but you're just sending the data directly over the channel, you're naturally going to get this averaging, right? Because just naturally over the channel, you're going to have noise in each one of the elements, and it's going to be averaged uh, when it gets to the central server. So rather than looking at this as a disadvantage, you could think of it as an advantage and exploit this natural addition that you're having by the channel anyway to be part of this model-based network. Now, again, the nice thing is because you have averaging in, in FedAV, you can actually show that this approach will help you overcome the noise. Now, of course, in order for that to happen, there's something that you have to control about the process. And we can show that if you do pre-coding, so if you do appropriate pre-coding, on the data before you send it over this channel, then that pre-coding will have the effect of diminishing the noise after federated averaging. So again, this is a really nice way where you can kind of combine, you know, the model-based approach with federated averaging. And by doing the analysis correctly, you can show that by doing this pre-coding, you actually get faster convergence and you overcome the noise 
better than you would get if you were just doing federated averaging. So not only does the wireless channel not harm you, but you could benefit from it um, if you exploit it properly. And again, all of this, of course, uh, depends very much on the underlying communication models. And, and like I said, we can actually prove this theoretically as well. Okay, so hopefully I ran in time. So with that, let me wrap up. So we, we, we tried to kind of give a taste of how we could bridge you know, more traditional signal processing and communication uh, with deep learning in general and with federated learning in particular. Of course, you know, it's a tip of the iceberg. There's there's much more to be done, particularly in the context of federated learning. So hopefully, you know, some of you would get interested in this and uh, reach out and I'd be super happy to collaborate on that. Um, like I said, those of you interested, we have several reviews of model-based learning where you could see more details. And of course, you know, the work was done with my great team of students and collaborators that helped get to all of these results. So I'd like to thank them and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nina, for the wonderful talk. I was very inspired by this uh, model-based deep learning ideas. So, uh, good, anyway, good. That was the point. <laughs> yeah. Any question from the, uh, the audience, like uh, outside or virtually? Uh, well, I have a question from the Thank you for the talk. And I'm very interested to be in the number of the data. Uh, one question, have you thought of using a model-based approach to compress I, I am so 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 sorry. I can't hear clearly. Can you do yeah, you hear? I, I, I think Ke can 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 uh, describe that. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I just can't hear properly. Ask the uh, uh, audience come. Okay, that'll be great. Sorry. I uh, I was just saying that it's very refreshing to see single processing and deep learning come together. Um, uh, one uh, quick question which I had is that have you ever thought of using this model based approach uh, to compress existing models, for example, which are trained for a specific task like image uh, on ImageNet, like MobileNet V2 with a stripped down version just to compress it? Uh, yeah, that's a super good question. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, the short answer is no. I think, you know, what, what I showed you today are kind of beginnings of that, like we, you know, starting to look in that direction. And and definitely, I mean, you know, that is the natural next step. So I'd be super happy to talk more about that. I mean, I definitely think that, I guess, you know, the, the advantage of coming from signal processing communications is hopefully bringing the ideas. Of course, the disadvantage is that we're not used to working with these, you know, there's standard kind of data sets, like you're saying, that, that people use and standard benchmarks. So that's why I think collaboration here is so important, right? Like you have to know kind of the right benchmark and what to apply it to. So what we've applied it to, meanwhile, are really more problems in communication, which are obviously, you know, more naive and don't have kind of standardized benchmarks. So it, it would be wonderful and amazing, I think, to exactly do what you're saying, is to take that and really apply it um, to one of these applications. So I, I I think it's a great idea, and I'd be really happy to talk more about that. The other question is that on federated learning, you demonstrated that if you have a uh, a, a vector quantization method, uh, you could potentially have a better compression. Is there any compute implications of having such kind of uh, uh, a pre-processing that needs to be done to compress these? You mean is the you mean is the compression itself complicated? Yes, in terms of compression. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, right? Because you know you don't want to gain in one domain and then lose in another domain. So that's why we're particularly using this lattice coding because, as you've seen, it's super easy. So you know you just you add the noise, you quantize, and you subtract the noise. So this the lattice uh, technique is actually a very simple technique. You you could use more elaborate methods, but then like you're saying, I'll, I'll have the compute problem and probably the decode problem as well. So these are approaches that are very simple. <clears throat> like I said, one of their disadvantages is that they do have additional noise. But because you're averaging anyway, since you're doing the federated learning, that overcomes that. So here we could actually benefit from that and end up with a relatively simple method. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Irina. I know it's pretty late on your end. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. And again, if there's any further comments or questions, I'm super happy to take them by email. So thank you. And thanks for the invitation. Sure thank you. Thank you. So um, our uh, next uh, session is a, a live demo session um, by the Chao Yang Fu. And Chao do you want to uh, start right now or you want to take a short break? So uh, for audience, do you want 10 minutes break?
or we, we can directly report the next uh, part of the program. So they do not have any objection of moving directly to the next program. Yes, then we let's welcome Chao Yang to give us a live uh, demo on the federated ML library. Uh, so maybe you can join my uh, Zoom. Uh, no, I have to do my demo with my collaborator. Okay, but uh, they need to join my Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see. So sorry for the um virtual audience. We need five minutes to set up the live demo. Hello.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm CEO of FedML Company. I'm very honored to be here to uh, present a live demo, uh, especially how to run federal learning in practical system. And also, uh, we view federal learning, especially our FedML Company as a research and product integrated platform, means that you can run some research code and directly migrate to practice system without any uh, source code change. Yeah, so let me show you how to do it. <clears throat> uh, you can also access my slides by uh, this link. It's tiyurl.com, MLC's uh, 2021 uh, FL. Yeah, so let me briefly introduce our co-founders and our team. So this is a team effort. Uh, CEO is uh, Professor Sam Westmacher. Uh, he gave a talk this morning also. Uh, I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO. So my background, previously, I work in industry for uh, around uh, around 10 years. And uh, I started this company this early this year. Yeah, so um, yeah, this is a nice picture of our all-hands meeting uh, last month. Yeah, so uh, for today's talk, I'd like to introduce uh, five parts. The first part that I want to uh, introduce you, uh, how we view uh, the future of federal learning, especially uh, what's our roadmap to make it uh, land into reality. And, and also uh, I will tell you our progress in the first part. First part. Secondly, I will take, tell you a live demo how to use the open source library and and then I move to help you to migrate your source code to uh, open platform, meaning that we can deploy your simulation code into your practice. And uh, in the first part, I will tell you how you can develop more applications. So in the first few parts, you can see just a live demo, for example, minist uh, data set with logic regression. But in APP ecosystem, we can see a lot of advanced algorithms and models. For example, you can run it on even in graph learning and uh, latent language processing. Yeah, so let's start it. So uh, it actually, our company will uh, federal learning uh, in a different way, maybe a different flavor as research. So we view that there are three different segmented segments. The first one is data signals. I think uh, people already talked in this uh, workshop. And also we can see that a lot of computing and user resource are also disconnected. And uh, finally, we also see that uh, in the community, uh, when some researchers develop some uh, AI algorithm, but they do not have, do not have the source code, do not have the data to run it, or maybe do not have the resource and infrastructure to test it in practice. And uh, some uh, companies, for example, the uh, virtual AI industry, like the healthcare uh, financial industry, maybe they have a lot of data, but they don't know how to apply the data into infrastructure to uh, get some intelligence service. So we, we hope to make a community to collect all these uh, segmented device users and the sub communities. <clears throat> and also we view uh, FedML lies in the uh, three chains, the center of the, these three chains. And we fully believe this is a future in the next five and to 10 years. So hopefully our company can last longer and to make this happen. Yeah, so the first trend, as, as you must know, in this uh, MLC's conference, people talk a lot about the privacy and security concern. And uh, the second trend that people also talk about uh, how we can explore some earth data. So I think we have a gambling here that uh, a lot of the giant model of the GPT-3, BERT, transformers, they train on the cloud. But we believe the trend in the next five or 10 years is that we can train model on the edge. So that's we our belief here. And the third movement is that we hope the data has the ownership so that uh, you can change the data like running uh, some transaction like DeFi in blockchain so that you can get rewards. So currently I, I don't think any person can get reward uh, uh, when they contribute the data to Facebook and Google. So hopefully we can shift the, uh, shift the views and uh, change the trend here that that everybody gets reward when they contribute data to recommendation system. So these are the three trends that we fully believe here. 
Uh, so to even uh, to build the future, we have three layers in our company. The first layer, uh, in the lowest layer, as you can see here, is uh, it's about uh, open source and uh, MLOps platform. So this we call it Web2, meaning that we can have the uh, worker industry like manufacturing, healthcare, uh, and the financial industry to uh, directly deploy model, especially the earth training matter uh, in digital private data. And in the second layer, we also hope to support many industries uh, to run application uh, very easily. So you see the first layer, we, uh, we can have ML engineers. And in the second layer, we just have some application researchers, maybe some CV, uh, NLP researchers uh, who may not have enough expertise in running distributed system. So they can still use the same way that, as they uh, train model uh, in a centralized manner. And they even can set, have some uh, software engineer who does not have a, a machine learning background directly run the model just by turning some hyperparameters. Uh, in the last layer, like the Web3 layer, as I just mentioned, uh, we hope uh, the data economics can happen especially in a decentralized way because the web is fully decentralized ecosystem and many decentralized data on chain uh, or off chain and not, not all the data can be uploaded to the block. So maybe a lot of the decentralized there, we are still exploring this case. Yeah, so this is our, our vision here. Uh, but the progress of our company is that we already finished the first and the second layer. So like the open source library and the MLS platform. And for the third phase, actually, the progress is, is, a bit, uh, uh, is much uh, better than here that we already started a, a Web3 demo. Hopefully, uh, in next year meeting, we can show the demo for you uh, in a Web3 manner. At that time, you can see how we can contribute our data and get some tokens. Yeah, that's very funny. Hopefully, we can build it next year. Yeah, so uh, actually the first and second layer, we have three uh, key components. Uh, the first one is open source library. The second part is Earth SDK that you can uh, deploy the uh, uh, federal learning Earth uh, device, Earth library to any kind of device, including Android, IoT, and uh, some Earth servers like Linux and Windows. And the third part is about uh, MLOps platform. So in this platform, we can easily uh, build a group, for example, in the, in the meeting, we can have a lot of audience. Maybe we can just join the group and start the training on your laptop or on your Earth server, which has a lot of private data. Uh, for these three components, we have four scenarios, actually it's four solutions for different industries. The first one is simulator for researchers, uh, because normally you only want to simulate federal learning in just a single laptop, a single GPU, or maybe a small cluster that only has eight GPUs. So this is our target scenario for researchers. Uh, well, we fully believe that this uh, community is very active. You see in the last year, there are around 10K uh, publications in federal across different communities. So this workshop also involves researchers from uh, single processing, information theory, machine learning, and even CV and NLP researchers. So uh, I think, it's very important to enable researchers to do any networks of uh, research exploration. And second uh, solution, actually, we try to have researchers to smoothly migrate the simulation code to real world system. For example, if you have a algorithm, you don't need to ask the engineer team to really implement your algorithm and directly put it into the cross sino setting, for example, the hospital setting, you hope to try it. Uh, in our system, actually, it's very easy. You don't need to change code. Uh, you just upload the package to our MLOps platform, then you can uh, run the algorithm. So uh, later, I will show you how to do it. Uh, the third part, actually, is for smartphones and IoTs. Uh, especially in this case, it's very useful. I think the uh, previous professor already introduced the uh, IoT device setting, so I don't need to repeat here. So uh, in our company, currently, we have Android and uh, Raspberry Pi and Jason Nello. Uh, different IoTs and smartphones SDK. So I think you can download it and try it. And uh, the last part, actually, we haven't done it, but it's also very a uh, promising direction. Uh, we haven't wrapped it as a product, but we, we already support the first part. Uh, so in this part, we don't concern about the privacy, but we hope to uh, leverage a lot of Earth's computing resource. You see, 
Uh, in your lab, maybe you have some scattered GPU devices, maybe which are heterogeneous in system, for, for example, different hardware performance. And also maybe another lab also has some GPU device. Maybe you want to uh, enable this device in a group so that you can train like a GPU cluster. So this is what we can do, have researchers to train a model in a geo-disputed uh, group. For example, one person in LA, another person in uh, New York. So we can also build a group for that. Yeah, we also have a lot of applications and this is the application store. I will show you uh, the uh, live demo maker. And uh, hopefully, yeah, we are still doing the Web3 part that hopefully we can tokenize this application. Uh, under this application that we can involve a lot of, involve a lot of contributors to uh, train the model and contribute their computing resource or maybe just private data. So now you can see, uh, uh, that's why I mentioned that these three segments we uh, want to target. You can see uh, Phenomenal or Podcast try to target the data signal issue and user devices we use uh, Phenomenal Beehive product to uh, solve the problem. And also for uh, disconnected communities, we hope researchers, developers, enterprises, they can uh, contribute uh, and get some reward and to collaboratively uh, finish a machine learning project. Yeah, so here is a brief history of FANML. Actually, we start very early in this domain. We started in 2018 uh, when I was uh, doing a PhD at USC. Uh, actually, we have an internal version to support our labs on research, but until uh, 2020 to now, we, we make it open source and publish it on uh, Europe's 2020 Federal Learning Workshop and one of the best paper over there. And later we serve the open source community and we get a lot of insight from our users. Sometimes they uh, tell us they want to do, how about doing the graph learning? Yeah, that's a very interesting question and uh, enable us to think about whether we can support diverse applications. So that's why we later, you can see we publish further like uh, Fed CV, Fed NLP, and for graph learning. All these sub libraries are built based on FedMA core framework. Yeah, so uh, we learned a lot from the company and also we uh, share our, a lot of our results to simplify the development of battery learning in this community. And uh, later this year, uh, around March, we run Phenomia as a California-based startup uh, to develop industry-grade platform uh, for diverse workforce industries, for them as the uh, previous vision I just shown. So that's a complex vision. And today, yeah, this is the first time we present our latest progress that uh, in, in the research community, actually we talk a lot with our business customer, but this is the first time we share it to the academia. Yeah. Uh, so this is attraction, meaning that what we have achieved until today, as you can see, we run into almost uh, four years, but what happened today was the progress here. As you can see here, we have 1,008, Hundred users. So these are these are users from the GitHub. So they start as so they download, and they get clone and try to run experiment there. And we also have around ten more than ten industry collaborators. Actually, today there are more than this number. And uh, somebody, uh, some company, they use it, but uh, we don't have a uh, uh, private meeting with them, so we are not sure how many number there. And for the ML, uh, Final ML enterprise version, actually we have. Uh, uh, around 600 developers and a few big business contract. So uh, actually I can show you some insights, what kind of research is more realistic. Yeah, and this is uh, our curve of growth, as you can see. Uh, yeah, this is the data I, I, I made a screenshot this morning. There are around 600 platform users and more than 1,000 Slack users. Uh, I think this community is very active in both academia and the, and the industry is still growing. So uh, I, I can also see many open problems, a lot of software, especially in practice. And sometimes academia may not define the problem properly uh, because some constraints uh, are not well defined or put into the practical constraint. So maybe I can also share some thought here. Yeah, we have around 2K stars, 500 folks. And five uh, four thousand commit, especially ha happens when we uh, raise some funding to run the startup. We have a lot of engineers to work on it, so that's why we integrate a lot of uh, iterate a lot uh, in the past few months. 
Uh, I think for open source library, it's very important to have some fun to support it. If you just uh, make it like uh, uh, like your person uh, personal project is not maintainable, so that's why we hope to run test the uh, uh, business matter so to bring a lot of business insight into the open source library so that we can boost the research here and then research result will further look back to business case. Yeah, so that's what we hope. Yeah, and and some researchers and users may post some question into our stack. So after this talk, if you try find out meet any issues, uh, please just free for to ask questions there. And uh, yeah, we we have uh, as you can see each day many users uh, a few users reject there, and and also we have a, a beautiful map to visualize the users around the world. We can see there are users from uh, North American, uh, Europe, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, a lot of. Uh, different locations and users, and I also learn from uh, find that the uh, demands and requirements may be really different from different locations. Yeah, so later I, I will show you the, yeah, these are number of runs people already tried, it, meaning that the number of experiments they already tried in our platform. And this is a device people are binding our device uh, in our platform, they are around uh, 900 devices. So these devices are uh, mainly Linux based server. And a little bit of smartphone users. Yeah, for smartphone, we, need, we still need some big contract to get a lot of uh, users like Android, iOS. So we are startup, we may, we may not have such resource like Google. So that's why currently we mainly support the uh, cross sign all setting, but we do have the Android SDK for researchers to try it. Yeah, so uh, you, may have, uh, uh, you may have a question about uh, what's the realistic cases I just mentioned, what's the uh, correct problem. So here I have a short summarization. We can discuss more offline. So these are uh, eight industries that we explored and we uh, did a survey uh, according to our exploration in the past half a year. So there are six industries. The first one is uh, healthcare or medical AI. Uh, as you can see, the blue text I highlight here is the different uh, challenge and different key problems that we have to solve in this scenario. Uh, it means in different scenarios, we may have different constraints and different research problem. So there's no uh, such a universal that we learn always and our system can solve every problem uh, for all the workflows. So in each workflow may be different design, uh, but in, in, in our fundamental, we hope to make it as a uniform, universal platform uh, with a composable a APIs to meet different demands. So we have different, uh, all the building blocks, but in different, scenarios, we hope to enable different building blocks or progression blocks to uh, meet the demands. For example, in healthcare, we can see that small data and label deficiency, uh, at least in our business case, is a key problem that we have to solve because in those cases, they don't have, uh, they have some powerful GPUs. You don't need to uh, consider the computation speed and also the communication cost may not, may also not be a concern because uh, normally they are connected with high bandwidth. Uh, but they do have the uh, small data. For example, you may not have enough samples. And also in the earth devices, the doctors may not help you to label the data. So how you can train a self-supervised, semi-supervised, or even just unsupervised matter. Yeah. And the second industry like manufacturing and industry IoT, this was very interesting. As you can see, Orleans, uh, building construction, logistics, supply chain, there are a lot of smart cameras to do object detection, image segmentation, so they can uh, improve the operation efficiency. Uh, in this case, we find that uh, normally they have a server with GPUs, but, they, uh, but the communication normally the bandwidth is no, because you, ha you have to exchange it in, in, in the internet and the bandwidth and, and the communication may not that be that stable for you to train. So in this case, we normally may use asynchronous training and also some communication compression. This third case, I think uh, many people talk about it in financial industry. I think this industry screen and privacy guarantees uh, is very important. Yeah, because uh, financial and stocks market, banks, payments, these are very sensitive data, right? So we must guarantee the screen and privacy there. As for the other uh, constraint and communication, I, I don't think that's proper in that case because they can always uh, enable it with powerful devices and high bandwidth uh, equipment to accelerate training. So 
they concern security and privacy more than others. And in Web3, as I just mentioned, how you prove the contribution of each person, we cannot directly equally distribute the contribution and rewards. And also uh, in blockchain, uh, how to enable AI there, I think that's open problem currently, even in research, there are limited works there. So hopefully more people can explore there. Uh, the fifth explore, uh, case is like the multi-cloud and scale computing. Uh, I think here data management is very important, how you can manage the data across different cloud because they have different infrastructure APIs and uh, operation, operational UI, and also how you, how you can res, uh, do the resource scheduling according to the heterogeneous uh, database. And the last one is about almost driving like Tesla. For example, Tesla, let's say one day they want to train on the, uh, on the vehicle. And the problem there, we, we currently, according to our exploration in L2 and L3, and we find that the uh, con constraint uh, from the memory and computation, for example, how you can train a model on just without GPU accelerator and the memory is only one gigabyte, how you can do that, right? For example, object detection, that's a very challenging problem. So these are all the uh, problems that we try to solve. So we also hope the research community can think about it. And to, I, I don't think the current organization can perfectly solve all the problems here. Yeah, so these are realistic setting uh, what I mean here. Yeah, so next uh, I will go through a uh, really live demo to demonstrate what, what I mean in the first 20 minutes. So I will stop here a little bit to see whether you have question. If, if you don't have question, I will move to the live demo. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Could you speak a little bit louder, sorry. Uh, what was the last part, sorry, pardon? You mean from the business customer's perspective, right? Yeah, according to our exploration, you see at the first beginning, which uh, in this slide, I think it explained perfectly. You can see uh, here, yeah, we, we have three layers, right? So at first beginning, we only build the first layer and we try to set the solution like MOPS, a platform to uh, work for users uh, like healthcare, financial, and manufacturing. Actually, the normally many medium size and small size company they don't have AI team. Yeah, they may have AI team, but it's just uh, one of few, uh, a few engineers uh, who may not have enough expertise to run better learning. So we find that if you just pro pro provide this platform, that's not enough for them to solve their real world problem, especially some AI tasks. So that's why we further add a, another layer a, a AI Apple Store. We try to support enough applications in different industries. So currently we already support uh, more than 20 applications there. For example, if you are from uh, medical AI, you can directly run the X-ray classification to understand how it works for your real, real world application. So we provide so many example applications to help researchers and customers to understand how it works. So, uh, so from my perspective, there are two types of customers. For the first type of customers who may, may not have enough experience in machine learning, it's better to provide the AI app store for them. But those uh, team, for example, like Google, they don't want to use our product for sure, right? But for some other uh, big companies, maybe they would like to try federal learning. In that case, they already have a team understand federal learning. Uh, so that second user case, they just lead the first layer because they can have the capability to develop their own models on even training over them. Later, I will introduce you that we have some APIs to meet the demand. So yeah, this is, a, yeah, you asked a very great question. Yeah, this is according to our exploration. Now we understand the problem much deeper than six months ago. Yeah, 
there any other statistical factors like this other factors that we can do less power or do what you're doing standard um if you use an XYZ but they're not able to use that way. More of the twenty percent reduction in the standard. Are there any other indicators that uh, just uh, it's, it's important that under the easy route is important, but are there any other ways that more of the indicators that uh, you mean whether there's a, another type of uh, different from feather learning can replace the demands that we support for the market, right? Is that your question? Let's say there is uh, a software stack that we have developed, which is replacing the work of the space, 14 million units that can be on the space. So, um, and you don't have enough time to have resources, but maybe what is left is going to be a long time. You go and ask you to tell me. But is there any key secret sauce that even the under engineers and manuals are not able to um, replicate, uh, like where you need some specific uh, IPs in terms of compression? Uh, oh. You see whether we have some uh, uh, phenomenon on technologies that uh, disable other competitors to repeat the business, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, actually we do have some IP uh, and patent technology in this ecosystem, uh, like the last segregation one we published in uh, MLC this year, that's one, that's just one of it. We also have some platform wise patent, you see, when you start running a company, you don't normally directly write paper first. You, you need to write pat patent first to protect your technologies, right? So yeah, that's what we are doing now. Uh, in the platform-wise, we have the urge called collaboration algorithm. For example, you can have some uh, small model on your device and a, a, a bigger model on the cloud. So that's one of them. And also for the MLs, like the, how you can simplify the training and the system design and multi-tenant system and set of your server a bunch of patents and key technologies there. As, as you can see there, although we open source the library, but the public cloud and that part is closed source at the current stage. Yeah, yeah. You, you can develop any origin with the library, but you cannot repeat the platform. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I think oh, okay, let's, let me continue the live demo. Yeah, the first part I'm going to show to you how to use open source library, like uh, our open source version. Yeah, you can easily find it at Better Metal AI. Uh, so this is our uh, menu of the website. Yeah, the screen is a little bit short, but uh, let me try to adjust it. Uh, it's okay let, let's just use the small one okay so uh so here the introduction actually this is the vision and mission of our company you can open the documentation which is quite similar as what i present about the uh, three momentums here we like in the uh, in the middle of it and the second part is about open source library you can see here that we have uh, uh actually six uh, key libraries but the most important one is phenomenal core library and all the other ones already merged to Phenomena. So uh, maybe you only need to check this one. Uh, the other ones also has some stars and they started, uh, the project has started before we launched the company. So now we fully focus on the single one, which is Phenomena library here. So in this library, actually, uh, you can find uh, the readme has a lot of documentation like the open source link, uh, how you can find the platform and user cases documentation and even blogs and the product overview. You can also join Slack and Discord. Yeah, so uh, we have around uh, one four k uh, stars and and a very active issues here. People may run some bugs, and we we have to solve the daily, you know, daily base. Yeah, so uh, let me see. 
Yeah, we also for the documentation part, you can go to doc.fedmail.ai. Uh, we organize the documentation, keep improving it to make it easier to understand how to run better event there. Yeah, so next, let me, oh, yeah. So here's a high level feature overview. So we provide a lot of examples, uh, including how to run cross-signal feather learning, cross-device feather learning, and feather, uh, uh, simulation in a single device or even distributed computing matter. And we also have examples to support any kind of machine learning framework like PyTorch. Uh, maybe some researchers like PyTorch, but uh, in production level, maybe TensorFlow is better. You can choose TensorFlow, and also some quick example you can try JX and even MXLAT. So we support all this mainstream uh, machine learning framework. And also we have diverse communication backends like MPI, gRPC, PyTorch RPC, MQT plus S3 for wireless communication. And we also support differential privacy like central differential privacy, app, lo local differential privacy. And uh, very interesting, recently we tried to support the uh, audit system, meaning that we, we tried to audit uh, how much price is leaked in the system. So we need to first have some attacker and defense uh, defender in the system. So we provide a lot, uh, the unified APIs here for around more than 20 different baselines developed by academia. And also some uh, empirical one that uh, we have in our co own company. And also segregation, like for example, the segregation we presented the first day of this conference, like the light segregation. And we also have a lot of application and uh, to let you try. So now let me, yeah, I just use uh, a PyCharm ID and to show you how to try it. For example, you can, uh, so the order of uh, the, the folder are organized like this way. So uh, if you download the FNM library, uh, let me show you. Yeah, so first you have the Android platform. If you just focus on Python, you don't need to care about that one. You can open the Python folder, and Fenomenal here is a, a key folder. And then, if you want to have a quick start, you can have some three examples. Like the Parrot one is the one that you run simulation, and the Octopus one is the one that you want to try on cross-signal better learning. Behind is the one that you have to run combined with Android smartphones. So now let's start with some uh, simple example. First, let's start the simulation one. For example, you want to run a sim SP here means single process, meaning that you can run just one, uh, maybe a few calls, like, like my laptop, you see the, uh, the window here, I, I don't run remotely on some Linux server, I just run on my laptop, right? So this is a single process that can help you, especially some optimization researchers want to understand the convergence rate in a very small, com uh, comparing industry, I, I call it very small, but in research is still medium size, Data set, right, right. You can have a quick try and maybe just a few minutes and you can finish uh, the training. So here the live demo, in order to save your time, I just use mini stand logic regression and uh, run a few rounds to let you see uh, what's the flavor. So uh, let me ch check the folder. Yeah, so this is a folder uh, here we provide with me. For example, you have different uh, different ways to call FedML library. So I use the step-by-step -step one. So step-by-step -step one, uh, it means it have very high level uh, abstraction of the federal learning flow. For example, you initialize it and you have device and it knows the data set, it knows the model and directly run, launch it to its FedML rounder, right? This is a high level API that you don't need to care about the underlying mechanism. Actually, this is uh, very useful for CV and LP researchers who don't want to build a distributed system. It just let us to do the uh, engineering work and build the system. What you can, uh, what CV and LP researchers can do is just to uh, do the configuration here. For example, we organize all the hyperparameters of, of the running in a YAML file. So here, is the first part is the common argumentations. So in this argumentation, you want to specify it as simulator, right? So just tell us what the training type. And also you may need to specify the API so that you can uh, put your experience data to our ML's platform. So yeah, here I just tell you a little bit about our ML's platform. Yeah, so the part one is the simulator. So if you want to uh, record the experience that, actually this is the first similar to weight and bias and ML flow kinds of uh, experience tracking platform. So in FedML, we also rebuilt it because we hope to support federal learning much 
uh, easier than the other competitors. Uh, normally, they don't care about distributed training, and they only have a single log. But in our platform, we have the distributed login to help you check what's happened in each devices. I, I think I will introduce that one later. Yeah, so here, if you specify the key, so the key can also be easily find here. In your profile, you can find your key and copy your key here. Then your experiment can automatically, uh, result can automatically upload it to uh, our platform. You can see the result there. And for data argumentation, the second one, where you specify your data, maybe sometimes the privacy data, private data, or sometimes it's uh, a fixed, uh, a download from the cloud because sometimes it's just simulated. So here for single process, normally you, we have some script uh, we're wrapped it already. It will directly download when you want it. And we also have hyperparameters for training, validation, device management, experience trackings. Yeah, we, we try to make organize it. What you need to do is just turn the hyperparameters and we will test one to one line, uh, uh, line step by step APIs. Yeah. So here I run this step by step uh, experiment. Yeah, it's very quick. You can see how the logs going. So here you can see here's a login server URL. Actually, it's the server that I just show you. Uh, you can directly upload the log there. If you don't want to run it online, you can also switch off the extreme tracking and, and we will save the log into your local computer. You can also visualize it with other tools like uh, tech. The different dashboards yeah we, we don't force you to use our ml platform for at, at least for simulator yeah because different restrictions may have different behavior but if you want to use some advanced feature like the cross sino or cross devices I, I highly suggest you use our platform to simplify the deployment yeah i will show it later so you see here the, the this is the communication runs third communication runs and each round will log out the accuracy and and loss may, uh, maybe uh, in another log, we actually, this is just console log, right? But in another log, we actually, we have some uh, unified and, and well formatted log that you can process with other dashboard. Okay, this is the MPI one. Yeah. So, yeah, let me also uh, guide you through the MPI one. So, MPI one is a little bit complex, but uh, still very helpful for you to do, to run some simulation. Yeah, for this one, you can see it's already finished. You know, uh, simulation is very quick when you run uh, on some small scale data set. And, and for the MPI one, uh, it's very useful also for researchers to run a larger scale data set and finish the training um, 10 times faster sometimes but when you have four GPUs, for example. If you just run a single laptop, single, uh, single GPU, maybe you need three days to finish the experiment, but your colleague maybe just finished in a few hours. So this is very compatible feature, you can patch paper much faster than others. So when I was doing a PhD, actually I used, uh, uh, in our lab, we have around 100 GPUs. And I just run many distributed workloads there. I, I can quickly explore the result in just one day. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. One question. So here, you know, the whole application on your laptop? You mean SP1 is in my laptop, yeah. For MPI one, uh, you can run it on a uh, uh, GPU cluster. Yeah, and also you can run multi processing in a single laptop to accelerate training because uh, nowadays the laptops always has multiple cores, so you can accelerate, make it a parallel computing. So, what model do you use? In this example, as I mentioned, just logistic regression training on minis, which is very uh, uh, low resolution image. So let, let me show you the MPI, how it works, yeah. yeah I, I had to suggest you, you use some distributed computing to accelerate your research, yeah. If you have an idea, you could try it for three months, yes. In, in this age, you may see that you already published your idea, <laughs> yeah. So for MPI one, as me see, I also picked the, uh, Yeah, this one. So for this one, we also have a readme to guide you through, but the command line is a little bit different. different. So here the four uh, means you want to run four parallel workers to accelerate your training. Uh, I, I, I also use the, uh, let me see which example I should use. Um, 
yeah, I will use uh, simulation. Yeah, in, in this example, I just run the uh, one line, step-by-step step one, yeah, also step-by-step step one. Uh, but the configuration here is a little bit different. Uh, if you look at here, uh, we still run it as simulation, but we change the backend to MPI. You see, previously, we don't provide any backend, we only have a single process. But here, we need to uh, enable the communication across different parallel workers. So that's why we need a communication backend. In Fenomen, we support a, a bunch of communication backends for different scenarios. Uh, we test the latency communication calls for different backends. Uh, recently, we will release such a, uh, actually, it's a white paper, uh, maybe a workshop paper to guide you through which one you should pick when in different scenario. Yeah, we have a, a very intensive experiment uh, to find the optimal one. And besides the backend setting, uh, as changed as asked, maybe uh, you, you want to run on GPU, right? So the setting here that, for example, you have four GPUs, you can ask the first GPU run three parallel workers, the second and the third also three, and the last one is two. So here, you, the total number of the uh, parallel workers is around 11. So it means you have a server and 10 clients. So we we'll help you to accelerate in, in a bunch of GPUs. So this is, we call it dispatched uh, training matter. So here, uh, I, I don't want to access remote GPU servers. I just run on my laptop, launch for processes. So let's see how it's going. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it can be on different silos. Yeah, we tried it. For example, if you, uh, in this configuration, you can specify GPU mapping here, right? And also uh, the mapping configuration. Mapping configuration is the uh, one uh, specify how you uh, how you assign different uh, federal learning clients. So federal learning client is a machine learning uh, level concept, but for distributed computing, you have parallel workers as system level concept. So you, how you match the federal learning concept, learning concept with the client uh, with your parallel worker. Uh, if you use MPI, normally it's a, a just a cluster, maybe a, a few machines, uh, but if you want to run uh, like a cross silo manner, we support like gRPC to help you go across uh, different silos and also PyTouch RPC. So for that case, we suggest you try uh, our cross silo setting. Yeah, you see, I also have the cross silo demo. I will show you later. Yeah. So I have here yeah. two applications that I have. Uh, segregation is what you, uh, as you can see in this example, I will demonstrate it uh, soon. So here we have live segregation and in our core library we support, currently we have two. One is a baseline like segregation used by Google. Uh, another one is developed by FedML uh, called live segregation published in this year MLC's conference. So as you can see, we have a live segregation mechanism uh, like we call it, we shorten, shorten it as uh, LSA. And in our core library, uh, in this core library, we, we provide it as an MPC function like like zero gate okay, function, you can check out code there and run it, try it. Um, actually, we also have an internal business production level code. Uh, we remove a lot of engineering uh, code there because we hope researchers just in the open source library can fully focus on the origin flow. So we won't, we don't want them the code too dirty to have to simplify the understanding there. Yeah. So yeah, the MPI one as you can see also is finished when we when we just. When I just answered the question, so you can see the accuracy is about eighty percent. Yeah, you can turn the hyperparameters very easily. Just change the configuration file I just mentioned. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it's here. So, so, so you can see the. This is also the same, right? The the same source code. You, you don't need to change to migrate from single process to MPI distributed computing, right? For example, you have a single process, you, you can quickly start your idea with just minutes to to check the convergence. And once it works perfectly, you can directly migrate to MPI to run a larger data set. But what if you want to run a cross sign setting as the, uh, as the audience just asked? Actually, we, we also don't need to change the code, right? We, we still keep the same code. And uh, now let's move to cross sign which is more, more exciting because it's real-world running for real-world business case, right? 
the way to migrate to, uh, uh, but before that, let me also highlight some three difference of the, the difference of these three examples. Uh, the most liked one, actually just one line command. This is the, just a quick start for people to try how it looks like. Uh, but normally we use this one to distinguish one line to uh, four or five lines. But this one is very helpful because uh, you can customize your own data, right? Normally you want to run your own problem, not just the example problem. So the way you can do is to define your own data loader. As long as you follow this format and plug it into Fenema library, for example, you have the, this format plug in here, then uh, our system can help you to run in any flavor, like single process, distributed computing, cross sino and even cross device, right? And also you can define your own model. So there's low restriction. Yeah, it is three demo. Uh, later, I will show you how to even customize uh, your lo local train algorithm. For example, you want to uh, migrate from FedA region to uh, FedA OPT, FedA Fox, uh, whatever algorithm you, you, you develop in academia. Uh, actually, you can finish the version development very quickly by customizing your local trainer and aggregator. And sometimes maybe you even don't want to use Fed averaging like version, which train locally and aggregate globally. So what you can do is to uh, define different version flow. For example, light segregation, uh, segregation version I just mentioned may have different version flow in terms of communication back and forth and between the client and server. In that case, you can customize with our flow API. Uh, I will introduce that later. Yeah, so now let's move to the uh, cross sign example to, to tell you, yeah, still one step-by-step -step example. You can see here, uh, the client server call is still the same, right? But we only need to change a little bit of the configuration. So what need, we need to change to make it cross sign and uh, simultaneously we change the backend to MQT plus S3. So this is wireless communication backend to help you to exchange messages whenever, wherever you, you live and wherever your collaborator is. Yeah. So, uh, but the, uh, the command is a little bit different. You have to type one by one in different sign off. So this it, it is still a problem in practice because uh, for, for data sign offs, normally you can only access once. Once you finish the deployment, you cannot, oh, every wrong you start there, that's, that's not uh, practical. So that's why we need MLs to administrate the entire system. So here I just demonstrate how to type command one by one for different signals. So here I first run server with the wrong ID. If you check the wrong script, um, we, we, we provide the wrong ID to help researchers to distinguish the different wrong ID in, in our system. And also sometimes different wrongs uh, at the same time with the same wrong ID, maybe the message will go across of different wrongs. So uh, currently we solve this problem by just type the wrong ID and you, you type it. Actually here we, we have another uh, useful feature that you don't need to care about the, the order of this script that you type. You can type the, you can launch the client first or the server first, it doesn't matter. So here I launched the server first and then launch the client, client one. Uh, so when you, when you launch the server, you can see the server already uh, is waiting uh, for the other client. And yeah, so you can see the uh, collection is ready for t, uh, client two. And, and the client zero is still loading the data, right? So once you finish the loading data, you can see the server has a message that it received uh, client one's message. So it's already online. And, but not all the, uh, client online. So let's type, uh, let's launch client two. Yeah, you can see the server already get a message from all the other client and start to dispute uh, the model to all the other client and client with that local training and the server do aggregation and uh, even client sampling and do server side testing for global model. So this is the way we actually this is since I just mentioned uh, is the MQT plus S3. So S3 is object 
of object storage in AWS. And we, we try to support different clouds for wireless communication. So you can uh, type uh, the command in whatever the machine you like. So by this way, you can collect different machines to do feather learning. Yeah. So now let's move to other examples. Yeah. You mean how to distinguish different client ID or? Yeah. Oh, I see, I see. So this is called fault tolerance, right? How, how we can solve that problem, right? Uh, actually, we have different level of solution for, the, for it. Currently, uh, besides a single training, you can ignore that dropout. Uh, we have a lot of high uh, availability uh, development based on the protocol. So you see the protocol is, is not just federal learning averaging kind of protocol. We also have some other protocol to guarantee that you can send the message to from client to several server client. Let's say if it failed, you try uh, and to let the, we, we actually we have a monitor we call it DMAN to check the status of each client to force it to resend and the status manager to guarantee uh, as long as the network is, is enabled, we still hope the message can be uh, transmitted correctly. Yeah, that's more like this engineering efforts, not like uh, uh, Orison research. Yeah. Yeah, but in Orison, I, I think it's gen in general, we, we should uh, design some uh, for, for tolerant like, and drop out programs, for example, in, our paper this year, uh, like less segregation, we can tolerate a fraction of users to drop out. Even it doesn't matter what kind of reason to drop out uh, this round. It, so we, we can enable the training still converts. Okay. Yeah, uh, as, as I just mentioned, I have other uh, overs and I will touch it later with other, uh, when, I, when I introduce other features like the segregation one. So we also support uh, many other platforms like Android and uh, IoT, right? So here, uh, in order to launch this uh, platform, normally what you need to do, first you have, uh, for example here, we, we have also the library for your server because we, we can launch the server as a Python library, but for client, we need different engineering effort like Android and NDK. And we have a C++ engine to help you to run on device. So it's like mobile neural network engine, like PyTouch Mobile or Mobile NN and developed by Alibaba. And uh, in, our lab, in our company, we also try to develop our own library there. Yeah, so here, the way we do it is first launch this. Uh, also, we run the server here. So this is cross device, we run the server here. And uh, after this command, it means you already launched the server what you need to do to install this uh, Android application to your smartphone and specify the ID of this server. And then all the smartphone will connect you to this server. Uh, but also use user experience, user experience here, you can see just the CLI experience. Uh, later, we have a better experience just to operate with the UI and check some status of different devices. Uh, so here, in order to save time, I just uh, play a video of uh, how uh, the Android smartphone Training looks like. Yeah, I have a demo here. So you see, this is also run server, the command I just show you. And uh, we use your laptop as a server. By the way, we have two Android smartphones. Yeah, you see there's a progress bar in the UI. We can see. Uh, what the local progress of each uh, client. And you can see one of the clients faster than another one. But this is a problem people call it system heterogeneity, right? Yeah, the server is doing aggregation and send back to the client. You can see another round, uh, it started another round of training. Yeah, still the left one is faster than the right one. Yeah. So in this case, 
uh, we have a beautiful visualization later to see uh, what's the system gap for different device. Yeah, currently, you, you can just see the land progress here, but if you want to analyze the system curiosity, it's better to visualize it. I think these are some experience tracking feature that the current wait and buys and other platform does not support. Okay, so this is the next step of this uh, Android platform. And we, we do have the IoT platform. You can directly uh, check our library here. So you open the file and click this IoT folder. Uh, under here, we have some guidance to help you to set up the environment. It's also very easy, just log into the, uh, actually we set up an agent there, you, you do remote logging, because once there are thousands of the first devices, you cannot log in one by one, it may cost a few weeks. So uh, here we simplify the development there. Mm -hmm. Okay, next let me, yeah, so, so I already demonstrated the open source library experience. So. Uh, we do have other features like attacker and uh, defender, but before uh, before that, I would uh, check whether you have other questions, because that attacker and defender, I, I want to introduce in why I introduce the flexible APIs, because we wrap the APIs under that over the API. I will tell you how to decouple different components. Yeah. Any questions? No. So are all the available for the high-cost framework? Uh, not necessary. Yeah, I will introduce later like this one, for example. The, yeah, next I will, that's exactly what I will introduce next. I will tell you our system design. Yeah, for example, the mobile engine, we have C++ programming in backend surface. We use uh, Java programming and even Go language to uh, for blockchain. Yeah. Okay. But for... Yeah, for federal learning core, then we just use Python for Crossino simulator. Yeah, at least for these two scenarios, scenarios we use Python because we hope it's a uh, user of researcher friendly because most of researchers in machine learning, computation, machine learning processing, they just use Python, right? Uh, but for the uh, other system level effort like platform, since it's just a, a, a software I just use it, so it, it doesn't matter what kind of language, we just use some industry practice there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For installation, you can see here. Yeah, this is a very great question. Actually, we get a lot of feedback from business user yeah, and, and the community feedback. So the most likely way is just PIP install PNML. And also you can extend to different, as I mentioned, like PyTest TensorFlow. Uh, you can add extra library like TensorFlow, JAX, MaxNet. But by default, it's, it's supported as PyTouch because we hope it's research friendly. And also, you can create it in Conda environment and specify different Python version. And also, you can install it as a debugging mode because sometimes you want to dive deeper into our library. And to, once you edit the code, you, you hope it can be effective automatically. So this is the way you can see it to Python folder and as the editable mode, editable mode. And also, you can install FedML from source. That means it will uh, get for the latest code. And we also support many other uh, ways to do it, for example, run in Docker. This is recommended in business case. We hope to operate that Docker so we have uh, easier cross-platform capability. We don't need to uh, solve a lot of uh, capability issues there. And uh, also we have other ways, for example, let me see. Uh, and we have some guidance for Windows user, Raspberry Pi, NVIDIA, Jazz, and Nano, and um, yeah. I think the guidance so we hope it to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, yeah, but I think I would often look at the people not get back. Yeah, we, we normally receive quest uh issues like this installation. Yeah, if you look at PyTouch, they also receive such issues very frequently. 
because use. people use Windows, laptop, uh, laptop, and I uh, Mac OS, Linux, different flavors of development environment. Yeah, all the people Yeah, yeah, yeah. In general, just one line comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, if you make some issues, uh, uh, let, let let me demonstrate here. Let's say uh, if you uh, have some uh, encounter any issue, you want to give us feedback. The most easy way you just type Batman environment, Batman E and V. So by this way, we know what environment you are running. For example, here you see my version of Batman and the path I'm running. So by this, we can see uh, my Python version. And also here I, we have some C version because we, sometimes we need to call some C library. And, and also PyTorch version, whether MPI is enabled, and what's your memory limitation. So by this way, we can, we can quickly target what's the issue there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for all these packages, all the uh, uh, free to the uh, user. Yeah, totally free to research. Even, to our, even in our platform, you can reject your account and use there. It's free. Yeah. We, we make perfect by providing service to business customers. For example, they want to use our platform to deploy to your their private environment. So I recently make it private, for example. It's not that easy. Okay. You are expert in federal learning. Of course, you, you can read it. You can uh, develop it as to meet your demand, right? But for many medium size and small size companies, they even don't do not have machine learning engineer. They just want to use it and to help us to set up everything. Yeah, and sometimes uh, interesting that they also have need us to develop the application. For example, they need they need a new model for it to improve the efficiency. Especially, actually, a library not uh, may not be uh, may not fully solve all the problems in industry, as I just mentioned here. Uh, there are six kind of different challenges, right? Even you have the library, you have light situation, you have a uh, dog and model transformer, you deploy there, right? Then six problems comes. How to solve it? We can solve it, then we get revenue. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's more like a consulting. Yeah. And this is a good business question. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, this is very yeah, great question. In research wise, I know the most important multi mortality problem is autonomous driving. You have to incorporate HD maps and uh, cameras, radars, different signals to uh, build a sub model first and then incorporate the representation into another backend and then do a full training. Right? Uh, currently, in federal learning, I what I can see is that the challenge is that if you want to make it into reality, you have to first do uh, for example, the mark task learning, the most likely way to input one task data into one place, right? Like the mark head mark task learning new architecture. Uh, but the issue is that you, in federal learning matter, if you turn the hyperparameters, uh, you have to turn it remotely, right? You have to turn one by one. But in, in centralized matter, it normally is quite easy. And uh, the data also is not uh, heterogeneous, it's homogeneous. So that's why you can. Uh, split the data and make it equally for different tasks. And there are some CVPR papers talking about a uh, multiple modality, how you can distribute the data for different tasks so that you can get your coverage faster. So I think this uh, problems in federal learning because uh, data is heterogeneous and uh, the system is also challenging when you want to run different parts of the model, the memory is constrained. Uh, but also depends on the scenario. As you can see, the six scenario we, we, we summarized here. Uh, I believe the uh, the last one, like the ultimate driving current is a problem. Uh, but for other scenario, like the manufacturing, the communication costs may, if you have some compression of them, may not be a problem. But for healthcare, how you can do a label deficiency based 
uh, mud class or mud modality problem. Yeah, the open proposition, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, because e e each modality you have different uh, input feature, right? You cannot incorporate, maybe there are different modal architecture, you can incorporate all the features. Uh, the most challenging part of how you can do feature engineering on device. Yeah, that's, uh, there are a lot of engineering gap here. So currently we are trying to have a more remote monitoring surface so that you can control the raw data remotely. Uh, that's why it means uh, maybe some researcher has the access of this data. So for example, the best paper award in this year ML uh, this conference in the first day of, of this conference, there's a paper called ML X-ray. So there I just try to monitoring uh, what's happened during the inference phase. But for training phase, we don't have such library to see uh, what's happened there, right? To layer layer by layer and fine grain. I think these are interesting research problem. Maybe you can write paper to answer it. Yeah. ML X-ray, you, you can find outstanding paper yeah, of this conference. Yeah. Yeah, for research, you can also run in simulation environment to try any algorithm. Yeah, but to deploy it, I think it's it's not that easy. Okay, next. Uh, so next part is about help you to understand a little bit about our underlying uh, techniques, how we can achieve the experience. So. Uh, the left part is the open source library and right part is the urge cloud platform. So uh, let me see. Yeah, so let me see. Yeah, in, in, in the left part, as actually as just mentioned, uh, we have a distributed communication backend and a training engine. And uh, uh, we have some security privacy APIs to help you to run some differential privacy modified computing security allegation. And for communication, you don't need to care about the underlying details. You just call send, receive. So it's kind of message passing uh, APIs to help you to wrap any kinds of federated learning algorithm. And also we have model tool, data tool to help you to launch federated learning experience very quickly. And we have an application layer uh, that's, uh, we call it a APP ecosystem. I will introduce the detail later. We have also a cross-platform layer to make it happen in IoT and mobile device. Uh, and also a migration layer to help you to migrate from single machine to uh, dispute your computing and even for signal setting. On the right part, actually, um, collected component to have the MOPS system uh, to is the platform, Edge Cloud platform, to have the system to directly schedule the library into different devices like the server. Uh, like the cloud server or your self hosted server, and even some urge devices. So uh, that's a multi talent system. Uh, multi -talent system. Uh, we use some serverless techniques techniques to save the cost for GPU aggregation, and we also have. Uh, uh, in our side, it's complex, but for user experience, we simplify it. A complex workflow control to help you this this best package to or urge devices. Yeah, so uh, next, this is the uh, mobile architecture. Right? So, so here, I, actually, you can read the slides on paper later. So, uh, so the main goal here, I think, I, I think we need to focus on the demonstration. So, I just introduced the architecture a little bit. So, in this architecture, we have a training engine that were wrapped by uh, JNI. So, by JNI, it means that you can uh, call the online training algorithm by using Java language. And we, read, we wrote, wrote it in C language. And we also have some memory optimization, federation optimizer, and a C version screw application too. Yeah. And, and for the application layer, we have the, uh, some components to connect the uh, M ops. Yeah. So this is a high level design. And of course, we have some UI APIs to simplify the experience. Yeah. So uh, here is the it, uh, API, uh, the most high level API. So recently we were released a, a low level API for you, for example, the Java level API and the even C API to help you to customize the algorithm for Android smartphone. 
So in high level Java API, it's very easy. You just uh, uh, create, uh, if you are familiar with Android, you can uh, create application in the application on grid. What you can do is just uh, initial fat edge manager. So we call it fat edge manager, the high level API plus, and then you initialize it, and then you set uh, your data path, then that's it. Uh, if you want to uh, get callback information from the progress of this uh, training progress and accuracy and loss, what you can do is to set a listener and to check, uh, set a listener and get a uh, feedback. Yes, here's are other APIs, for example, the own training progress listener. Yeah, you can read out uh, code for details. Mm. Yeah, next part, I will move to MOPS. I think that's more uh, the funny part to make it happen in real world. Yeah. Before that, do you have any question for the uh, high, high level architecture overview here? Okay, let's move on. Yeah, so for MLs, this is a, a workflow. Uh, so let me tell you how easy it is. So first you run, uh, you write once on your laptop. So the way we write code is, uh, is exactly the same as what I just demonstrated the code here, right? Uh, for example, you want to customize your model and data set, you just finish the development here. So here, let me show you an example of how I finish my uh, customization. Uh, here example is, let's see. Yeah, so this is a customization example. Let's see. Uh, if you go to the main function, uh, the difference here is that we provide a trainer and an aggregator. So by the trainer and aggregator, it means you can uh, easily to customize your local training function. For example, the abstract uh, class is client trainer. And we also, uh, for the, in the client trainer, what you will need to implement is uh, uh, model parameters, how we get it, how we set it. Um, and also, uh, we provide some function for you to customize like on before training and after local training and and the training function is your flexibility you can do whatever you like and and also maybe sometimes you need to test on your local device uh, here is an example that you can add further add differential privacy laws here for example you finish your training right and after training what you hope to do is to uh, for the model parameters you want to add laws here and, and then you uh, uh, update the parameters uh, with DP logs. So uh, by this way, uh, researchers can customize in different location of the origin flow in before training, after training. And also for aggregator, it, have, uh, it has similar design. Before aggregation and after aggregation, we can do whatever we want. Um, for example, here, before aggregation, what we can do is enable the attack or enable the defense because some defense uh, happened before aggregation and uh, after we get finish aggregation we may also need to add central differential privacy for example the global model you want to add some laws so uh, the client side when you receive the global model it may not uh, leak the privacy of the other client right so this is a central dp and for aggregation you can customize with different aggregators so here, the aggregation function is the abstract function. Uh, you can uh, customize different aggregator, for example, fed everything, fed box, fed uh, OPT, and maybe your own design function. What do you need to do is just customize this function and plug it into this aggregation. And, and then all the rest part of the system, you don't need to care. We, we already finished it, yeah, right? So you can see that in order to finish a new version, you just need to write a few function rather than building an entire system. Yeah, for, so for be, before aggregation, maybe sometimes you add some attack. So the way uh, we do it is by enable it as some um, configuration, still configuration. You can see uh, the code here is the same as what I just mentioned, but a little bit different that you want to customize the trainer and the aggregator and plug into Fedema Runner. Uh, for DP, let me show you an example. You don't need to write too much code, just uh, add one function, one line code to, fin to add the B DP logs. So for configuration, for example, the central DP, you just add a DP block of parameters. You specify whether you want to use DP, uh, what kind of DP, central DP or local DP. 
and other hyperparameters here, what kind of the DP laws like Gaussian or Epsilon, right? By this way, you can see the way we customize it is, is very simple. We just customize the uh, before or, or after training or before or after aggregation. Uh, let me see. Yeah, do, do you have any question here for this uh, customization? Yeah, uh, we, we do have some examples like a tab here. It's still the same code, you just need to configure it. Uh, yeah, for this customization, let's look at how it looks like. We are going to write a customized trainer. So the way I look, uh, I, I, I do it is that I just uh, inherent a faster class, a uh, strat class for the client trainer. Let's say you want to do something uh, after local training. For example, you want to do model compression, right? You want to compress the model and change it, uh, make it a sparse tensor, and then do transmit, tra do communication. You can just uh, take the uh, data. I mean, sometimes maybe you may need data, but some, most of the case, you just need a model. For example, you want to uh, have this self model. What you need to do is just uh, operate this model and then return it. Then that's it. You just customize one function. You can have a model compression. For the rest of the system, you don't care about it. Yeah, for training, for example, sometimes uh, this is very important because sometimes for different applications like NLP, computer vision, graph learning, they may have different neural architecture, different loss function. So we give we give the highest uh, flexibility for researchers to customize local training measure. So this is the, exactly the same way as you do uh, centralized training. For example, a civil researcher may already have the centralized script. To train their model, so don't they don't need to change anything. They just wrap their function here, the training script function here. Then you can make this training happening on a local device, and we finish the aggregation for you. Yeah. So you, you can see the script exactly the same as the central training, just follow the local epochs iteration and different batches, and you want to test. Yeah. So that's the uh, customization part. Let's say, so now let's say we already. Uh, understand the customization and we want to try uh, train the model in our ML platform. So how easy we can do it. Uh, so let me move to this example. Uh, MLs. Yeah, this example. So for this one line code, uh, you, you can you can customize whatever you like, like trainer or together. And, and the way we do it is that we first build a package uh, it means it will wrap your customization code, the AP, uh, the user level code you get better based on FedML. Uh, once you uh, run this script, so essentially this script is called FedML build. Once you run this script, uh, it will generate an ML package, like the kind package and server package. So after that, if you have the package, uh, then now we can move to we write once, right? So I just already introduced how you write code once by customize trainer aggregator. Now you want to deploy your code to any kind of device you want to run anywhere. So the way you do, just build a package like the script I just show you. You can have the server package, client package. So what you need to do next is just operate it by FedML uh, MLOps platform. So let me show you uh, some simple uh, UIs and then uh, operate in a live demo. So first you can go to the uh, my application. You can create an application. For example, today I want to train a minute with logistic regression. Uh, I already built a package as just shown here. So these two package, I, I get it. I just directly upload here, right? And then I save it. I, I want to use synthetic data rather than private data. If you want to use private data, you may need to specify a, a private pass. And this should be specified client by client, right? Because different clients, they may be that erogers and data may be stored in different locations. And next page is that once you already uh, finished the application development, what next is to invite collaborators. For example, in this room, we can invite some collaborators to train on their laptop. And once, once we build a group, like this way, you can see here are two persons in this group. Each person has different number of UIs. So in each account, actually, you can bind any kind of device as you like. You can use a single device to bind different data signals, or you bind the, just one data signal and collaborate with other collaborators. So it's very, very flexible. Uh, so now, 
me show you some yeah examples here so you see this is my account yeah uh yeah this is Fatima Chaoyang yeah this is account uh it's account number is 305 so if you look at uh so we provide guidance here so this guidance is exactly the same as I just introduced including the building package measure how to create group and how to select device so let me go through uh how we uh, collaborate with others. So the first thing you need to do is to find a login, right? You type the command still on your data sign -off. For example, here, uh, this is my local computer. I just type find my login 302. This means I combined my device to my account. So this is my account. And also another way you can specify uh, ID. So this is your IDP key. So these two are equal. We, we use the lamper because we hope to simplify the uh, command input experience. You, you, you can even remember your snapper as your account to collaborate with other, others. Yeah, once you combine, you, you can find your device here. You can press this fresh button. You can get the device. You, you see, I, I test a lot with, with, with our engineers and uh, customers. So you see, I have a lot of device in different uh, locations. Uh, you can see the device in Japan, in Europe, and in California, Canada. So, uh, so here, let me show you an example that we train across uh, four nations uh, for, for different areas in the, over the world. And also here, I have a lot of collaborators. You can see, uh, we can easily build any kind of group. So when you create a group, uh, you can specify who are your collaborators and build a group for, with them. So you can see in this group, there are a lot of uh, collaborators. Uh, we, we can train. Uh, models uh, together. Uh, after you have a group, what you need to do is to create a project. For example, in the project, you can specify which group you would like to use and what the project lane. So here, let me create. A, uh, let, let me check the rounds we already finished in, uh, in another one. Let me see. Yeah, let me check. Uh, show you the running status. Right, the, uh, what the run looks like. So for example, this one, uh, it has a training across Japan and Hong Kong, right? But the server located in California. Yeah, this is a very realistic setting. We hope to enable these two cities to collaborate to finish some training tasks. Uh, and, and we have running status to show you uh, how many runs and how long to finish the training and, and also some training curves. So this is the object action model. You can see the training uh, lost and bounding box loss and, and also for system this is very useful for example this one uh japan in the japan machine it train uh per round training times of 20 seconds uh, but for hong kong node it costs 24 seconds so this is also system curious and uh as, as Tini just asked oh, uh, by this manner actually we can analyze the system curiosity to see what's a gap, what's a whether the communication cost is a gap is, is a gap. So as you can see here, the communication gap is not that big, but the communication maybe the uh, maybe you, you have to think about a measure how to make the uh, computation evenly distributed across device. Yeah. Oh, only five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I think I almost done all the introduction. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me finish the introduction for the for this part. Yeah, oh, five minutes, right? Okay. Yeah. So for the model, you can direct download it and maybe surf it on different servers, and and here you can even have a logging, uh, distributed logging in different machines. So this is a feature not provided by other MLOps platform. So you, you can see what happened in different machine. Um, I, I'll also show you another case that, uh, let me see. Yeah, so this is the MLOps. Since time is limited, let me uh, quickly move to APP ecosystem. So this APP ecosystem, uh, Oh, maybe I forget one key part. It's uh, how to create a ROM. So let me show you. So when you create a ROM, you can select the device. For example, here I have device in uh, Europe, in Canada. 
and also the public server, you can make it public server or just private server. For private server, what you need to do is just type one line command. Uh, for example, I uh, let's say you want to launch your server on your laptop. What you need to do is just get login and slash S. So S here means you want to launch your server there. So by this way, you can see your private server here, then you can uh, directly select the server as a aggregator. So this is very helpful when some customers want to uh, deploy their server in their self-hosted environment. Yeah, you, you can see this is logging successfully if I refresh the UI. Then yeah, this is the server. If you check the ID uh, T7, yeah, exactly this one. So by this way, I can use my laptop to have the aggregation from Japan and Hong Kong. Yeah, and, and you can see we have a group of users and we can select different devices from different users and and then build the run in there. Yeah. Okay, so next let's move to application ecosystem. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, I already introduced how we develop the uh, right, life, uh, right application and run everywhere. But you may have a question, how we can enable so many applications in the real world? Right. So actually we provide this as the APP ecosystem. As you can see here, we can run YOLO v5, not just like minutes for the regression we, we just demonstrated. You can also do NLP tasks like test classification uh, and, and X-ray and even graph learning and sometimes on device alarm detection, whatever application you can, uh, uh, you can plug into our ecosystem. Uh, so the way, the, the secret that we can support so many applications is that we have the flexible APIs like the trainer aggregator and also the flow API. So you can customize whatever model, those function and training measure there. Yeah. Uh, uh, let, let me open one application as an example. For example, the YOLO, uh, YOLO V5, which is very helpful in smart camera setting. Uh, when you open this, you can also find the source code that read it online. But if you don't like this user experience, for example, you don't like to, uh, you, you can simply check the, uh, the model catcher. Then I want to check the model catcher here, like the TF version, what it looks like. But if you don't like this user experience, it's okay. You can open the GitHub link. So everything is open source then you can customize your, uh, this application according to your uh, demands and, and deploy it with our ML to uh, many Earth devices. Uh, and also another important feature, uh, which is very helpful is that you can import this application. For example, if I click this, it will import to ML's platform. So here it shows already imported because I, I clicked many times, but you, it's already in my uh, application next to it to Octopus. So this is a cross sign of setting. Uh, so by this way, you can see, um, let me see. So by this way, you can see the application already, already import to um, my application. So here the green button means you get this application from the market. Uh, the black one means, uh, so this, this locked one means you already, you develop by your own. So we distinguish whether you get from market or you, that's your own application. Uh, another benefit is that what, let's say you already have an application you want to share to the community. For example, today we, we finished the demo of analysis, right? You want to publish it, you just click this button and, and specify. So here we, we, we ask you to specify the GitHub link. If you have the GitHub link, and then you can share it to the community. And uh, so people can uh, collaboratively contribute this application to enhance it. Yeah, so this is a uh, the way that we support diverse applications. So you can see here, I, I tried many uh, NLP, medical AI, different tasks, yeah. And the final part is that uh, under this application, we try to develop and support more realistic data sets like this uh, floppy data set, which is called Sino FL data set. And uh, we collaborate with Oking, which is another uh, federal learning startup. Um, we collaborate with them to provide some realistic medical AI data set. And you can run uh, smoothly on the FedML AP, AP, uh, ecosystem. Yeah, the final part is that uh, we, we have Flow API, uh, like the, in the Flow API, the flexibility that as I just mentioned, you want to customize whatever uh, origin flow as you like. For example, the light segregation one may be quite different from bad average. And also, uh, you may have a uh, special demand when you when you run the origin flow, you want to add some message during the flow, right? So we, we hope this can be easier 
to implement. So our previous version is very hard to build such customization because we make the fed everything like always and uh, fed very on the line, on the line and the dirt code is very dirty. There's no such uh, low level API to support it. And also when you call, you have to do uh, code to always flow. You have to set send message, receive message. You have to uh, to match different message ID or course client and server. So in order to make this easier, we have a flow API. So here is a quick example, just go view of it. Yeah, uh, we can finish very soon. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let me see. Yeah, under this beauty folder, you can you can find the communication backend and flow. So here is a uh, test example. Let me show you how we how easily we can fix the fed algorithm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just finished this one. So, uh, if you are uh, using this flow API, you can uh, specify uh, specify client and server class. In the server class, you have initial global model in client, and then you want to uh, initial the global model on the client. And then you want to train many rounds, right? And then you want to do local training and the server wants to do server aggregation. And finally, you want to do an evaluation. And you build this flow by using these few lines. And what you need to focus is just to focus on the function for each flow step, right? For each flow action, what you want to do is just write function and, and then collect all, all these functions as flows. And by this way, you can simply finish uh, any kind of uh, APIs or uh, any kind of API algorithm. Yeah, so this is the one. Uh, so previously, I, I hope to have a live demo. You can see uh, we have different peoples from all over the world. We can train a model together. Yeah, yeah. And finally, this is some link that you can use for uh, for further reference. Reference. Yeah, here's the link, just a link for today's slides, like highlyuir.com, MSS. Uh, yeah. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for the nice talk. I'm going to switch to the power of math. I don't Oh, sorry, so I mute myself. Sorry. So um, the next, the next uh, speaker is um, Professor Yilan Chen, and the Professor Yilan Chen is a professor at the EC department at Duke University, and he is also the director of NSF AI Institute uh, for Age Computing, leveraging next generation networks. Prior prior to joining Duke, he, uh, he is a faculty member at the University of uh, Pittsburgh and also have worked in industry. So uh, Professor Chen's research uh, focuses on new memory and story systems, machine learning and neural morphic computing, and uh, mobile computing systems, including federated learning systems. He is also the recipient of several uh, awards, prestigious awards, including NSF Career Award, 
ICML SIG doc, uh, Outstanding New Faculty Award. And he is also a fellow of ACM and IEEE. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Chen. Okay, thank you so much for the um, introduction. You. Yeah. Oh, you can now hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me share my slides. So, um, oops, let me see. Can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, let me try to put on the full screen. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, hello everyone. You know, I, I'm so sorry I wasn't able to um, join the conference in person because I'm teaching this semester. It's uh, more than 100 students in my section, so I, I, I couldn't travel, but um, um, yeah, but, but I still feel very um, um, honored to give a talk in this uh, workshop. Um, I, what I want to talk about today is actually regarding the scalability and also heterogeneity and also the privacy of federal learning, how we're able to solve, you know, all these uh, critical challenges. Um, to give uh, people a little bit of offline about what we're going to talk about today. So we will talk about the efficient and heterogeneity aware of federal learning, including you know, two works we published last year. Um, uh, which uh, are called the Lottery of Federal Learning and also FedMask. So each of them are, are solving the challenges in the communication cost and also computational cost in the federal learning with the support for the personalization. And we also have the privacy and efficiency, uh, and privacy enhancing and robustness improvement in the federal learning, which are another two talk um, about uh, uh, defense against the privacy leakage and also the uh, poison attack. So let's talk about you know the lottery federal learning, which is uh, the um, 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 the personalized communication efficient federal learning, which we published last year in ICC. It is important on edge computing. I'm pretty sure everyone you know are very familiar with the federal learning, so I'm gonna go through all the details. But uh, one thing I want, want to emphasize here is we need to contribute uh, the data from the local clumps, you know, to the global uh, server and we do aggregation. So this uh, communication generates a lot of cost over the networks in general. So which become one of the ma major challenges in the federal learning. So here's the one example to show uh, the total communication cost will be the product between the uh, communication round, which we're going to perform it, we're going to perform on the network, and the number of the parameters, you know, per um, uh, this uh, per, per round, we're going to transfer, and also the average cohorts of the uh, cohort length of each parameter. For example, if I want to transfer the holding point value, we probably need a 32 bits to transfer, or even even more. So one case study I show here is if uh, we are running on VG16 on EMT night, you know, to, if we want to convert in you know, our model, we need to take about 9,000 rounds. And for each round, so we need to transport 138 million parameters. And each parameter will be the 32 bits. If we add all of the, this together, the total communication cost will be close to uh, 500 terabytes. So that's be very, very uh, challenging. Um, Issue here. So, okay, so um, an, an, another important challenge here is a statistical heterogeneity. So, people are aware of this in many of our applications because each client will face very different types of the data or the different properties of the data. We call this a difference, uh, this a difference as a non identical distributed lower, uh, the data. So um, the device are frequently generate such a non-ID data, which uh, dramatically harm you know, the traditional federal learning framework. Uh, one example here to show if we have ID data or non-ID data, then, then the difference between these accuracies will be uh, about 40%, so which is very significant. 
Okay, so the prayer hours actually already start uh, to address those issues. For example, in the communication cost, you know, the natural ways to solve this will be uh, reducing the communication frequency and the compressing the local updates. For example, the sparsity or of the neural network and also do some efficient encoding like quantization or even just simply compress the data we're going to transport over the networks. And also, people have been addressing the challenges of the uh, heterogeneities. They're going to mitigate the divergence between the local uh, model and the global mo model, like the FAT pro uh, props, to make sure the activation vectors across the multiple layers are more similar. Okay, that's uh, uh, going to uh, address the heterogeneity without sacrificing the personalization performance that much. Um, but you can also come up with many personalization methods, uh, such as the mental learning, multitask learning, and transport learning, which you know, all address the personalization cost issue. So limitations of the existing work is, you know, there is, uh, uh, there were actually very few, you know, works you know, trying to address the both challenges simultaneously. And the hypothesis here is, you need to have a lot of, uh, uh, communication card to, to uh, you can generate a lot, a lot of communication card to transfer the da data between the client and the server because the more representations you can try and transfer from the client to the uh, server, then uh, to, to a, a better way to um, understand the, uh, the uniqueness of the data on each uh, client, and we can address this heterogeneity. Um, but on the other side, if we don't want to do this, then we need to do a lot, a lot of low local uh, fine tune or or the trade training. That's what you, you maybe um, in, increase the computation, uh, computational cost in, in the in the in the device. So and also, you know, um, many framework did, did not consider the realistic federal learning, such as uh, non ID or the small number of the samples on each client, or the data biases and so on. So uh, lottery federal learning was proposed in you know, trying to improve the uh, uh, communication efficiency and achieve the personalization and the non-ID side. For the non-ID side plus the personalization, we uh, look for uh, a solution inspired by the device specific lottery ticket some night or called the Lottery Ticket Network Hypothesis, or the LTN. And the concept of the LTN is, is uh, follows. We have originally have our large neural network, and we have a subnet of this large neural network, and each device will have a different subnet. So the differences of this uh, the sub subnet will represent you know, the personalization on those clients. That's how we're gonna address this. And also because we have a smaller size, of the neural network, you know, in the subnet, uh, compared with the original neural network, and so we can also address the communication cost. We only communicate the parameters of the subnet between the device and the central server, so that's the advantage of doing this. So, the design of the lottery uh, federal learning will be the follows. You know, we first are going to download, you know, the subnet from the server, and the server actually keep have, uh, you know, keep all the copies of the DD of the, all the subnet. And we prone and, and recite the subnight, you know, if the accuracy of the subnight is, is below, so it's actually above the threshold because we don't need to have such redundancy to guarantee a higher accuracy of the neural network. And we are, we are going to change, you know, to, and we're going to, we're going to prone the neural network onto, you know, the accuracy of the subnight is just a, a barely meet the requirement. We're going to perform the training using the local data and then retrain the neural network again. So, the first. so um, by, by doing so, we want to make sure we'll have the minimal required you know, sub and sub night neural network in the local clients and all, all, all also that to minimize the computing cost. And the uh, so personalization will be like this we will consider the non ID data distribution across all the clients. The LTN of each client should not be significantly overlap between each other. Otherwise, you know, there's an, the non-ID assumption will not be held. So the uh, we have an aggregation a strategy. A strategy uh, is performant 
you know, uh, only on the overlapped I element among each LTN while keeping the rest of all non overlapped element unchanged. And the, the philosophy here is for those non overlapped elements, they usually represent the common interest of all the clumps. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that point. Only for the overlap, you know, the element among the different LTN that will show the uh, will show the sorry to take back. And the rest of the non overlap element actually represents you know the personalization uh, interest. But for the non for the overlap the element among the different LTN show the common interest you know, from the uh, clumps. And we only need to worry about the aggregation on this particular uh, element. So we do some evaluation on this. So what we, we have done is we have limit we have limited training data, only 10 to 40 samples you know, on each device. And we are only two classes of examples on each device. That's what well represent the statistical heterogeneity. So the no device has all the classes okay, that we need to we, we need to trim on. And the data will be very unbalanced, which means data volumes are different across the classes on each devices. That's usually the case because usually there's some majority task that each device can deal with with some side task. So the baseline will be the local training for sure, with uh, fed average for sure, and also the LG federal learning, which includes the global mo model and local fine tune the method of address, you know, the personalization with, you know, some complicated kind of task. So we have a two uh, evaluation matrix, including the inference accuracy and also the commission cost. So we will basically, um, marry those two measures to see how we can make the compromise between those two. So the way we, we perform training on the CPAR-10 for 2,000 communicate, communication rounds and the accuracy increased by generally 13 to 15% compared with the LG fed average at the, at the, at the ratio here. So that's a big increment. And the communication cost reduced by 34 to 53% compared with LG fed average because we are transferring the smaller size of the neural network. Um, so if we look at you know, the result of increasing the number of samples per class, you know, the interesting is the interesting part is we actually reduce the communication cost. Why why we have this? Because you know, if we are able to use a more the larger number of the sum sample to train the neural network, we actually can make the convergence of the neural network faster. And in, in such a case, we don't need to transfer the many many uh, uh, parameters between the client and the servers. And the, the, the neural network actually is prone more aggressively. So we have a fewer number of the parameters transfer between the uh, server and the, and, and the clients. Another thing is about the unbalanced data, which means that we observe the different number of the parameter, number of the samples per class. So in this case, you know, if we uh, if we set the unbalanced ratio, which is uh, you know 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 here, which means the number of the examples per class is actually one to two or one to four. You will observe, you know, the reduction or the degradation of the accuracy um, when we increase the unbalanced rate. Okay, so uh, and also we increase the conversion cost. So that means the un unbalanced data, which we're going to uh, harm the performance and also the efficiency of this uh, of our design, or in gen general, or the federated learning uh, design. So. So, so after we talk about, talk about this, you know, if we move to um, another topic, which is with the Fed and Musk, because we care about the communication, we care about you know, the, the personalization, and then we also care about the com computation cost, because those are the, uh, the pack package we need to deal with you know, in the federal learning design. So we come up with something we call the hydrogenous uh, masking technique to reduce you know, the, the computational cost. So how we uh, how we do this? Um, the, 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 the mask is actually not, not new, you know, to, for people to reduce the com, com, to reduce the computational cost in uh, the uh, in the neural network trade trade training. Think about it. We have very large, you know, well initialized neural network, you know, for the different tasks. It's more like you know the the tasks are running on the different uh, clamps. And we may have the, the mask, which, uh, which include only zero and one, you know, element in the, the network, 
with the same topology as a very original initialized neural network. And only the parameters whose corresponding mask element is one will be uh, retained and, and, and calculate and perform the calculation in, 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 the, in, in the task of the clumps. For any other location of these parameters in the network, if the mask of element is zero, we'll fill them out. So we're not going to allow them to participate in the computation. And because we have a large number of the, of the uh, candidates you know, of the mask, for example, the total n, n is the number of, of the words in this design. So is, there is a possibility we can actually, actually we can always find out you know, the mask, which you know, can well adapt to the task on each climb. And this mask will be the, will be the one used to uh, guide, the, guide the execution of the task on each climb. And we only need to transfer the mask between the climbs and the server to perform the aggregation which is uh, 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 on the uh, global server, so which is the goal of this uh, fed mask. So let's see how we can do this. We'll learn a heterogeneous and structural sparse and bi binary mask because we want to make sure we have a good com combination between the accuracy and also the combination cost. And we we'll only communicate the binary mask, which represent you know, the different needs on the different clubs. And the binary mask will be element-wise, you know, applied to the frozen parameters to generate the personalized uh, structure spots model and the server, and then send back to the clamps. Now the question becomes how we can do the aggregation for this binary mask. So the idea here is if we see the overlap mask on some terminal, this terminal example here, then we are going to do the aggregation on both masks. But if we have one mask of, if the mask of one channel is prominent in one device or one clamps, then we're not going to perform the aggregation because we will basically see a lot of all the uh, 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 zeros on this mask. So we don't, we don't work on this. We still you know, keep original mask you know, to the original clamps. But number here, if we have the for channel one, you know, they have a both mask, then we do aggregation. For the channel three, only one device has a mask, and then we don't do the aggregation. We still inherit you know, this mask. And this is another detail to say how we can perform the mask, right? So we have a different heterogeneous binary, binary mask on the different clients. After we, 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 we send this mask to the uh, clients, so then we do the poor personalization. We fine tune the mask, you know, so that, uh, so that we're, 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 we're uh, fine tune the, the, the so we are, we are a, 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 a able to you know, adapt to the local task. And we actually run the ES permanence you know, um, using the real um, uh, test of that, which include the different embedded GPUs or a Raspberry Pi or laptop or cell phone or something first. And we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're, uh, we're going to merge the, the, the output. So we have uh, four data sites, uh, EMNIS, uh, CPAR 10, we have a, uh, 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 HR, HAR, uh, uh, Shakespeare, we have a different uh, baseline. I want for you to focus on the BN Fed average because they're running on the bi binary neural network with a Fed average, which will offer the very similar uh, communication cost and they also send the binary neural network, but they are not going to compare, they're not comparing with us in terms of the accuracy. If you look at the result, you know, the right star show the accuracy and also the communication time trade-off, and we actually can achieve very high accuracy with a very low communication time, or which means you know very low communication cost. But the binary BNN fed average, you know, which the um, I would say the brown uh, um, the the dot base shows the, the low accuracy with also low communication cost. Yes, so they can save the communication cost but accuracy will not be acceptable. Any others, so they actually make the good trade-off between accuracy and uh, communication cost. So they, in general, uh, suffer from the large communication cost that we want to achieve high accuracy. Um, but more than that, you know, if you look at the inference speed and the energy savings, so we can achieve 1.5 times, you know, speed up on the inference time and also 1.5 times the energy saving. And uh, the 
um, the, the phantom mask model reduced the memory footprint a little bit because the majority of the, uh, the we got to reduce re, re, reduce the, the use of the memory by using the binary neural network. But BNN dash uh, by the average also have very small you know memory footprint because everything will be the binary. But again, they're not be able to achieve very high accuracy here. Okay, so. No, we will talk about that uh, efficiency in terms of the communication, the competition, and also the heterogeneity. Now let's move our focus to the uh, pri pri privacy leakage. So why that become important? Because you know, privacy preserving was actually the major motivation for the federal learning. I recently worked at basically show sharing the model updates or the brilliance basically can make the federal learning more vulnerable to the inference attack. And the existing defense approach, you know, either incur, you know, the significance of the communication of overhead or the uh, large accuracy loss. So our work trying to propose a defense approach against the model inversion attack in the federal learning um, by uh, observing that the data representation leakage from the gradients is the essential cause of the privacy leakage in the federal learning. So we try to review the review the essential cause of this uh, leaking pri private information and develop an efficient defense against this, this model inversion attack. So if, let's look at you know, how the data representation is going to leak the information. Because in the federal learning, we have a less you know, to, 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 to data on each class. You know, we actually have a smaller batch on each class. So data representation are less entangled, it, which has give us the opportunity we can restore the original data. Image is just one example. If I have ground truth on the, on the left column, if we do the whole group uh, going attack, and then we link that to, to our uh, to our adversary, then we're able to recover everything out. So you have only the convolutional layer gradients, you know, the leak, and then we're not able to recover because you know the super will be you know, hiding by the later layers or the fundamental layers. But we also have a data representation of the gradients, and then we can restore the original information very uh, uh, efficiently. So allow us to implicitly can we construct this input data using the representation is the issue. And we're trying to uh, defend this, but the number of the batches and local training epochs you know, are both small. And make you know these challenges even ha ha harder. So how are we gonna do this? So we're basically trying to reduce the, the we're basically trying to reduce the possibility uh, of the privacy information leakage by increasing the difficulty of reconstructing the input, you know, uh, images or the data with the uh, take here so through the proper term, you know, data representation and the raw input access. So that both of them should be this dissimilar. That should be quantitative, a quantitative measure we can um, we we can achieve. And also, we're trying to maintain the federal learning performance. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make sure the perturbed data representation and the true data representation without perturbed perturbation will be very similar, because that is the information we want to carry during the transmission. So we have the two goals. One goal is to maximize the similarity between the reconstructed one and what the original one will be the maximize, uh, or sorry, will be the will be uh, minimize the I I occur the this the minimize the, the dissimilarity between uh, the perturbed data and the original data because we don't want to change the original that much. So we can actually formulate the defense formulation as we show here. And here we have a different choices on the P and Q, which show how we can quantitatively merit the dissimilarity and the similarity. Here we're picking a P equal to two, which is the, we show the MSE of between the reconstructed input and the raw input, like in uh, image, for example. While we set a Q equal to zero, but we count you know, how many non-zero number we, we have. So because so that we know the number of the parameters that will uh, be the decide the communication cost. Okay. So Q to zero show that exactly the number of the parameter we need to deal with. And then we can have a certified robustness and guarantee as we show here, which means 
we have a statistical, oh, sorry, it's a mathematical bound, you know, which can derive from this robustness. So let's look at the, um, uh, let's look at the, the, the evaluation. We have a non-ID C part 10, now the amnist. Okay, we try to evaluate the dissimilarity between the input or, and a dissimilarity, uh, a similarity between the, uh, between the original feature of the input and the dissimilarity between the reconstructed you know, image and the original image. And we have an attack method called the deep leakage you know, from gradient attack, the DRG attack, and also gradient similarity attack, a GS attack. And we have a defense baseline could be the deep group gradient compression or the differential privacy, both of them impact the input the performance, input the robustness of the design. And the right side show if we have a you know um, different MSE with a dissimilarity, we're able to um, we are able, able to achieve. And how we are make the trade out to the ag accuracy. The so basic want to want to maintain the larger IMSE while still be able to maintain the high accuracy. And certainly, that will be the only the black line can do this. And in other you know comparison a compared pack technique, when you are increasing the MSE, will dramatically in, in, drop you know uh, degradate the uh, uh, model I accuracy. So that's some something we try to uh, we try to try to show. So the last topic is IFL WBC a white blood cell. So the try to enhance, enhance the robustness against the model poisoning attacks. Poisoning that was not an issue if we only have uh, one, one or two clients you know, to perform the uh, poison attack. The point that will become more significant if you have more uh, uh, other walls will participate in such an attack. So current a server-based defense cannot guarantee the robust busting. So when the attack is very strong, which means have a, a many or even majority of the uh, clients, you know, will be the uh, will will perform the quantum attack. And if a server-based defense fail to defense the uh, poison attack, then the attack effect will remain in the global model for subsequent rounds, even without more attack occurring. That's actually something. We found out be very interesting for the long lasting effect. Okay, if you uh, you are successfully attacked by you know the one round, actually this attack will be be there for quite a while, quite quite a few rounds until the effect is gone. So our work is trying to re review why the model poison attack the effect can persist in the global model for the subsequent round and propose a defense to mitigate such a long lasting model poison attack. So and let's look at you know, what we have what have done. This is a long lasting model poison attack in which we perform it. The server based of defense the field to defense them because if we see the drop, the drop will actually drop to the end and then wait for quite a few while to, uh, until they come back. Yeah, so the attack's effect re re remain in the global model. So attack's e effect on the parameters of e AEP specifically you know, re represent the such effect. And the long-lasting attack effect residence in the kernel of the Hansen matrix during the local training. We will somehow to fill up this kernel of the Hansen matrix, so we may be able to uh, you know, um, defense this long-lasting attack. So how can do this? We have each client, you know, acts as a white block cell in the federal learning system. Mitigates, you know, the poisoning attacks and the effect that is not defended by the server during the aggregate. And the goal one will be maintain the uh, binary task performance. Loss of the local binary task should be minimized. And the goal two to prevent, you know, AEP from being hidden by. Uh, the kernel of the Hansen matrix on the DNA devices and the rank of the Hansen matrix should be maximized. We can, that's why we have two goals. One is going to minimize something and maximize another thing. Well, of course, we are, we are very good at you know, doing this, right? So we're going to perform you know, the, the data side on the fashion on this and the C pattern, which I did not show here. So the import hyperparameter, including the 10 clients you know, participate in the training for each round and five of them as a malicious. So they, this uh, become very rare case, but it could use dream case, but it could happen. And we don't have a good solution to solve this before. And we have a four different defense based baseline for the coordinate median aggregation, coordinate trimming, the median aggregation, the local differential privacy and the global 
or the central global, uh, central differential privacy. The results, results are very simple. If you look at the red line, the IFL and WBC, right? So, um, so if we have this uh, WBC, we have actually can save you know, this uh, uh, eye accuracy very much. Uh, following the ingress of this uh, this uh, uh, stretch we perform it by the, the by WB, by the WBC, you start to see improve the, you know, the, the effectiveness on this. And if you, if you see an attack, you know, on this um, um, model, then the long lasting event will be gone because they don't need to wait until so long you know, to bounce back to the original level. That's another advantage. How we actually improve the misclassification if confident on this. The evaluation looks like this. You know, we have a, a the, the certain division of the noise, okay, which we add this uh, noises on this uh, image, uh, image to see how we can protect this. And only inject the perturbation to the parameter space where the long lasting AEP resident instead of performing all the parameters like a DP uh, method, we, we, we do the target. You know, uh, rescue on those, those deep. And you can see that uh, after the mitigation run, you know, the BNA's accuracy will keep in increasing. And no matter what, the better learning with the WBC, the white blob cell, will always give us the best result. So, to recap, you know, what we talk about today, and then my time is all, almost done. Uh, we introduced a two efficient and heterogeneity aware federal learning method, including the latter. But uh, IFL and also bed mask. The both of them actually trying to minimize the uh, communication costs between the client and the server without you know, sacrificing the pro the personalization on, on on the clients. So the key here is we need to find out a way where we to transfer the personalization method to the cloud server in, in, in uh, efficiently. And also we have a privacy enhancing and a robust uh, federation federated learning, including the source sort here. That is about how we can apply the perturbation on the input so that we don't allow what we don't, you know, um, we, we don't worry about people are able to do the reverse engineering on the input. Also talk about the federal average of WBVC to reveal why the model points and attack are going to last very long and how we can solve this problem by perturbing the input or the noise. So I know you know that ten years as mentioned you know I'm I'm leading a AI institute which is Asana for the AI institute for the edge computing leverage next generation network. So we're able to leverage the next gen generation network to uh, to design the next generation edge computing uh, device with AI and other devices. So we have a seven campuses participating in this account, this uh, project, including uh, uh, due to the lead by including Yale, Wisconsin, Michigan, Princeton, MIT, and NCNT, and five industrial collaborators: NTNT, Microsoft, Motorola, Adobe, Micro, and the Finance. And we have four, you know, the research thought, including networks, you know, now computer system, AI, and the services. Uh, for more information, you can look at our webpage, which I listed here. It's basically very simple, asena.duke.edu. I think I will uh, stop here, for, and I will be able to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yiran, uh, for a nice presentation. Any questions from in-person uh, audience? There are questions. Hello, um, Alan from UT Austin. Uh, you said in one of your slides, data representations are less entangled in federated learning. Could you mm -hmm. please detail on what does that mean? Oh. Because I didn't get it. And, and also what are the implications of this data entanglement? Okay, uh, it's a very good question. Once you entangle it, it basically means uh, if we don't have federal learning set up, right? We well, usually train the neural network as a you know, batch, and then we update the neural network and calculate the gradient or transfer. But if you have federal learning, usually we have a smaller number of the samples per batch. Um, and all, all, also we, the local training epochs will be also fewer than we usually do, you know, if we don't have a federal learning size set up. And we don't 
a plan, you know, the, 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 the impact of this data that much before we send out, you know, this uh, gradients or any other information to the server. So that make us easier, you know, to redo the reverse engineering on this uh, data based on the data representation or the gradients back to, you know, the original input. So that's what we call the less entangled. Yeah, um, uh, you can you can see the way blending those information, the impact of the information of this data data less. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other question? Uh, so no questions. Let's thank uh, Professor Chen Iran again. Okay. And, uh, thank you, Iran. So Let's move on to the next uh, speaker. So our last uh, keynote speaker today is uh, Professor uh, Wu Taoying. Uh, Professor Ying is uh, now the director of uh, Decision Intelligence Lab at Damo Academy, uh, Alibaba, US. Before joining Alibaba in 2019, uh, he was uh, uh, professor in UCLA um, Department of Mathematics, and he received his PhD in Operation Research from Columbia University in 2006. Um, what else um, research interests include computational optimization and its application to signal processing, uh, machine learning, and other uh, data science problems. And he received numerous awards, including the Career Award and the uh, Alfred, Alfred uh, Salon Award, and also the um, recent uh, informs uh, Balas Prize Award. So without further ado, let's welcome our uh, talk. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Tinch, and uh, thank you and all the other co-organizers for inviting me here. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. There we go. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here to speak about some limits, fundamental limits of the current uh, work on communication compression uh, for distributed learning and or federated learning. Uh, this communication compression becomes even more important when you go federated. Um, I'm coming from uh, Damo Academy of Alibaba US and uh, we, we have several offices in the US and of course the, also offices in China and the, one of the main locations in Seattle, uh, we're in Bellevue and talking from Bellevue. And this is joint work with a uh, former um, uh, intern and now a PhD student at UPenn, Ximeng Hua, and our colleagues from the computer vision um, uh, department, uh, Yiming Chen, and my colleague in our lab, uh, Kun Yuan. And uh, you know, Qingmeng and Kunyan made most of these slides. Very nice work. Um, so basically, machine learning is facing, especially distributed machine learning, is facing three challenges: non-convexity, massive data sets, and huge models, which all require we go distributed, um, so we can uh, train a model faster. I use a little bit of mathematics to. Um, to explain what, uh, how we set up the problem. Um, so CIs are mean samples uh, of each of a set of, of data within a data set at each node. Um, the objective or the training cost of that node, um, training cost of that node is Fi, and we use many nodes, we use n nodes um, to do this training. Okay, so local data set, can be different. Um, if they're very different, then we say there's a there's data heterogeneity. Now, this is a standard vanilla um, parallel stochastic gradient descent, which is the you know, bread and butter of today's uh, deep learning. And so many workers uh, will take gradient stochastic gradient samples, and then they send the gradient samples to the server, and the server apply. Uh, congregate uh, these stochastic gradients from local uh, workers and apply a certain step size. Okay, so um, though it can be represented this way, there's a central parameter server um, because it handles the global parameter 
and there are many uh, graphic cards, maybe those in the same machine, same workstation, or maybe those uh, connected uh, through Ethernet in the uh, data center. And when you go federated, uh, they may be distributed through, uh, through the internet. Now, uh, formal, let's formalize it a little bit. Um, when you have N such work, uh, workers and each round of communication going to take O N. That's because um, N workers have to communicate with the server, and the uh, server also have to broadcast the updated parameters back to the workstations. And unlike like I'm speaking and all of you are listening, you know, even there's a like two, you know, twice as much audience, it doesn't affect my speech speed. But unlike that, in in data center. When you do broadcasting, you actually um, the broadcast actually cost O n when you have n workstations. So this um, this aggregation and the broadcast of both take O n. Um, and then every node, as I mentioned, every node um, will send the uh, full model if you, you don't compress it. And this full model has a dimension d. And then of course this iterate this have to go. Uh, for many iterations, the total number of iterations will also add to the to the to the cost. So, um, so a a conventional wisdom is, and if you double the um, number of GPUs, um, and then you should roughly um, reduce the time by a factor of two, which is actually not the case, um, and you always perform perform worse. So we uh, wrote a package called Blue Fog. Although the package was was aimed at decentralized optimization, it can still do um, this parameter server uh, and, and worker server worker kind of uh, communication. Um, and this package used um, the latest uh, the communication toolboxes from NVIDIA, and we tested on Amazon's top tier um, networks and uh, top tier workstations and networks. And this is what we got. The empty box is on um, is double every, when you when you double the GPUs. So an empty box represents IBU linear speed up. The actual speed up is less than that. As you go higher and higher, the the ratio between the red and the the white gets smaller, which means the communication has eats up the speed up. And this is uh, this is the case where communication to computational ratio is relatively small. Um, when you standing like a, when you trading bigger models and the, uh, and using larger data sets, uh, or you go to a slower network, uh, the communication ratio is going to increase, and then it eats up more of the speed up. Um, so addressing communication does not just mean you have a faster uh, faster training, but also means how you would be able to scale up your training, how you would be able to scale scale up your model, which also affects the quality of your model. So addressing communication is very important. And give you a um, a high level summary of the different approaches that we today can use to save communication. Then first thing I, I'm gonna briefly mention decentralized communication, which remove a center. And then um, with joint work with uh, Professor Chen over there, we also did something called lazy communication. So we skip some communication. And then the main topic today is actually communication compression. Um, if if you if you have to communicate the the, the model, uh, the model parameters, how can you use quantization or sparsification? to communicate less, but not hurting the quality of the training. So let me first use one set of slides, two, maybe two slides to, to, to briefly mention decentralized optimization. So the word decentralization means you get rid of the center. And uh, decentralized optimization traditionally uh, was, uh, was developed by people in, um, in remote censoring. Uh, where the sensors have limited communication range, so every sensor can only communicate with those sensors that nearby. 
Um, therefore, they form like a wireless communication form a network, form a graph. Uh, in the data center, it's a slightly different case. In the data center, every node here, which is a dot represented here, can communicate directly with any other node. However, communication incurs a cost, especially all nodes communicate to the single central node. So what we do is instead of doing a sum of the stochastic, grade, sub, stochastic subgradients, we, uh, we let the models get mixed up. And hopefully through this mix up, the model gonna, gonna converge to the same identical model. And what we, instead of doing a standard uh, standardized optimization, we um, come up with this uh, very important Beautiful idea, which is called exponential two dynamic communication. A few things. First, every node is going to communicate to another node. They're going to send information only to one other node, and um, and then these nodes are not doing this, are not communicating with the same node. Therefore, these n communication only take a one time rather than o n time. So no bottleneck. But second of all. It's important if you just keep doing this, it won't be efficient because information takes a long time to get mixed up in this uh, in this network. So you have to switch neighbors, switch uh, switch partners. And the way we switch partners um, is uh, motivated by um, by this you know, dynamic exponential two kind of uh, communication. So um, long story short, uh, you will get huge speed, speed up over centralized communication. And theoretically, the, the information delay of this one compared to like a one iteration centralized averaging is only log of n. So if you have a, a 64 nodes, uh, the delay is four iterations. And this delay has very little effect on stochastic gradient descent. And in the end, um, the, uh, the blue is the decentralized. The red is the uh, Harawat, which is the uh, state-of-art framework for centralized communication. Uh, decentralized can uh, give you better speed up. However, still not the ideal speed up, but better. And the, by the way, the, the software is open source. Every, everybody can try. Uh, let me now briefly mention another idea called lazy communication. And it has this history of development. What it basically does is, um, just skip communication. Uh, some nodes can skip communication at certain iterations. So I just you know don't send you don't send the the, the server my latest cast the gradient. So skip that. Um, back in 2015, like six and uh, five six years ago, and people were doing like skipping every tau iterations at fixed intervals. And then um, about four years ago, um, we were doing uh, adaptive. You know, that we have a, a rule, have, we have a condition that controls the, uh, the skipping and prove that this actually saves communication. Uh, and then recently uh, in proc skip, uh, lazy strategy also proved to save communication in a slightly better case. So this also was good. But main topic today is by far the dominant um, and most popular approach of saving communication, which is compression. Um, so let me illustrate compression. Um, at the abstract level, what people do is instead of sending the stochastic subgradient, and there's a compressor applied to each of these stochastic subgradient that can be sent, sent out. And this compression will reduce bits or reduce, um, reduce uh, the, uh, the entries in the vector. The C, the compressor, is applied to um, before every workstation sends out information. One approach is called quantization, uh, which basically use fewer bits in the extreme, just one bit for every vector instead of say eight bit or 32 bits. Another idea is called sparsification, where this represents a vector with one, two, three, four, five, eight entries. And then you only send the largest entry and skipping some of the smaller entries. And this is called sparsification. You send sparse vector. So both work. Now, um, there has been since the early works about um, which has started to appear about four or five years ago, there have been extensive uh, number of um, 
um, improvements that, that, uh, that has been done to compressions. Um, long story short, there are different compressors. So how you pick out the most important information to send out. And then this compression, this compressor have to integrate it into the distributed algorithms. So, which means you compress different things. Initially, people directly com compress the model parameters, and then people start compress the gradients, and then people start to compress the residuals, and, and then um, they can even do error feedback su su such that you know what kind of compression causes what kind of errors, so you can, you, can, you can reduce the error. You can also do uh, upload compression, you know, workstation to, uh, to server compression, and you can also do bidirectional when the server sends back the model, you can also compress that. So which generate a sequence of work and almost the community. And the earliest work already had a citation over, over 1,000 in just five years. Now, um, so every, uh, every you know, few weeks or new algorithm come out. Now, how do we understand the performance of these algorithms? Are they near the best possible? And um, if there's more to improve, where should we look at? What direction we should look at to improve it? Now, this is the meaning of doing some kind of lower bound work or like a, you know, um, um, like a performance guarantee kind of work. In order to, to, in order to answer this question, we have, to, um, we have to formalize the problem where we're gonna work on. Um, in optimization, there are different function classes which represent different difficulties of optimization. A typical class that people use in uh, distributed learning is this class where the function, the local functions are leafies with a parameter L and the cost function, uh, the, the starting point uh, of the, the starting model uh, has a object variable that's bounded by delta. So larger L means the problem is more difficult. Larger delta also means the problem also more difficult. And there's no assumption of convexity because usually uh, the model we train are not convex. And because we, um, all these training algorithms are essentially based on gradients or, or, or subgradients, we have to say something about the subgradients. Uh, the assumption is we're, we're going to use stochastic gradients or subgradients where the stochasticity um, is due to the sampling of the data. And we assume that, which is a reasonable assumption, that the samplings are biased and the variance of the sample is bounded by, um, by sigma square. So uh, we have to remember sigma means the variance, because later on the bound is going to have sigma in it. We can also look at compressors. Now, there are so many compressors and so many ways that compressors are integrated in algorithms. And if you look at all the proofs, and we see almost all the, actually all the latest, all the state of the art compressors are used in the literature and in their analysis, we only use two properties of that compressor, not other properties. We only use two properties. The first property is the unbiasedness property, which is very reasonable. It says X is the original signal and C is a compressor. After you apply this compressor, and by the way, the, 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 the best compressors uh, with the, at least the best theoretical performance are, are those random compressors, mm -hmm. uh, randomized compressors. And it says that, well, this compressor should, on average, um, give me the signal itself is always unbiased. And then we look at the variance. The variance is proportional to the signal you want to compress on. And the uh, amount of variance is uh, proportional to, to omega. So remember this constant omega. Yeah. But in the extreme case, identity is just no compression and identity um, give you zero variance. So this is not the only class. And there's another class. Uh, oh, by the way, there, there are two examples. The earliest work, which five years ago, um, published in NeurIPS, uh, was uh, introduced this random quantization. I won't go into the details. 
And the one year later, um, and this, I think this work was from, uh, actually this work from people from different places. And this work was, was from, from Tencent. Um, and this work do random sparsification, randomly pick out the, uh, um, the, uh, the components to throw away. Um, so these are two, two early examples. And there's another class, which does not have to be unbiased. However, if you look at the variance, the variance have to uh, appear to be a contract to, to be a contraction. Um, the residual, the compression residual should be a uh, contractive, contractively proportional to the uh, signal itself. So this is a relatively weaker condition compared to the uh, unbiasedness condition. Once again, identity operator has no has a perfect contraction ratio, um, and you're going to see some recent, more recent um, compression an algorithm using such compressors. For example, uh, this EPFL uh, people have come up with this idea that maintaining the largest k entries or, or randomly largest k entries, zero zeroing out the rest, and they came up with the, uh, another. Uh, technique that's called the random sketching using matrices. Uh, you, so, so you ran, randomly downsample um, a matrix, a, a vector. And this is also a compression. So basically there are different ways to be unbiased and different ways to be a contraction. And if you look at their analysis, they did not use a specific way they achieve compression or contraction. Um, but they use the fact that they are contracted, use the fact that they are um, a, a unbiased com compressor. So that's why we look at those properties. Um, and we want to understand whether this class of compressors, um, how this class of compressors is going to work. Finally, let's consider algorithm class. Um, compressor is going to work with the algorithms. Uh, in this uh, talk, we consider a centralized case. We have not been able to, well, we're doing something really generalizing this to decentralized. But so far in this talk, we're going to do centralized. And I um, assume all iterations synchronized. So you're going to wait for the last um, communication to finish before you start the next iteration. Um, so every worker may have a different compressor. And server may also have a compressor to compress its parameter that's sent back to broadcast back to the workers. Of course, when um, the uh, compressor's identity, there's no compression. If the worker's compression is identity, then the compression is unidirectional. That is only compressed when you go when you upload. Very importantly, in almost all the lower bound work. Uh, in optimization, there's this property of this algorithm. This algorithm, it's called zero respecting property. If you have a sparse vector for the sparse gradient or sparse um, sparse uh, parameter, you know, parameter vector, you cannot create non-zeros magically without making at least one iteration of uh, update. So each iteration of update, whenever you, you do an iteration of a update, that's the chance, that's the time you can introduce non-zeros to the uh, parameter, which is the case in practice. Okay, so, so let's look at the existing convergence rates from those papers or from um, we adapting their, their analysis and see what we get. Um, there are five, uh, the five algorithms with compressions um, that are, we're presenting here. And there are a bunch of uh, equations, uh, but don't be scared of that. So let me just mention how we read this. Uh, there are important parts. There, there are n, which is the number of workers. T is how many iterations you're gonna you're gonna run before you stop. And omega is uh, omega is uh, is one of the parameters of the uh, um, is the the uh, uh, it's the variance of the uh, unbiased con compressor and uh, sigma is the stochastic gradient variance and b only for this algorithm is because they assume some kind of a bounded gradient and b is the bound of the gradient they can either do um 
to unidirectional or bidirectional. And the type of compression of well, this guy is unbiased, and then for other guys are contracted. Okay. And there, there are multiple terms because they because they dominate when 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 the parameter is different range. Right? That's why we need more than one term. For example, like this. When t is a, when 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 delta is small, well, this term can dominate, right? But when t becomes large, so because you know iterate, uh, training often takes thousands of iterations, you know, tens of thousands of iterations. When t is large, well, uh, this t to the two thirds uh, are smaller than uh, than than this, especially when n is there. So later on, this can dominate. So it depending on like where. Uh, where you how far you have run your algorithm, different terms are gonna dominate the, the sum. That's why we need multiple terms. And there's something called the transition and uh, transition period. That is defined as how many iterations roughly you have to take before linear speed up can kick in. That is how many iterations you have to take before this end, before like so many machines running all together start to help. Um, and then this can be large, right? Especially when n is large, especially when delta is small. Okay, so uh, let's explain uh, the rate a little bit formally. When t is sufficiently large, then this term will dominate. Okay, and um, to guarantee, because when this term dominate to guarantee a small uh, small error, let's say error is represented by, by, by epsilon, the target accuracy, you need to take this number of iterations, which is proportional to the time you spend on training. Um, and whenever in the rate you see n and t multiplied together, that is linear speed up because you double n, you have the, uh, have the, the t. That's called linear speed up. Um, that is, you know, when, so it, when we equalize two terms, we roughly guess like how long it takes for this term to dominate the rest. Therefore, you can get linear speed up. No. Um, so, so linear speed up is roughly the, the, the region uh, before which the curve, the, this is semi log y, the error is log rhythmic, the iteration is linear. Um, when you roughly see this curve start to, to flat a little bit, this is sublinear. This is this is uh, no linear speed up. After you have linear speed up, um, you can um, you basically can can you know help help with increase the uh, number of uh, number of um, workstations. So this tra this transition period, how long is transition period re reflects the uh, performance of compression, and it's shorter the better. Okay, and there, there are algorithms uh, with additional bounds. I mentioned that. Okay, so what is the best we can get using those unbiased or contract compressors? And then we come up with this gigantic formulation, which um, means that we're looking for an algorithm from our algorithm class such that when they deal with this, all kind of compressors in our class, all kind of stochastic gradient oracles in our class, and all kind of functions in our class, the expected error, the gradient error is minimized. So in other words, given the class of functions and given the worst class of functions, the worst, well, worst function in that class, worst gradient oracle in that class, worst the compressor in that class, we seek for the best way of using those information to minimize the minimize the error. Okay, and so somebody that might come up and say, "Hey, why do you why do you soup over a compressor in the class? Shouldn't you design the best compressor rather than you know take the worst compressor?" So. Well, yes. Well, the goal is, of course, to find the best compressor and best combination of algorithm and com compressor. However, the the entire you know, community now have settled so far settled 
on the uh, compressors that satisfy either unbiasedness or the contracted properties. So if we do this and we find a lower bound that's away from the current algorithms, it means all well, the compressors are good, the algorithm are not good yet. If we do this and find a lower bound that's very close to what the algorithm can give us, it means, well, the compressors, we're reaching the limit of those compressors. Then if you want to break the limit, you have to look for more fundamental compressor properties. So essentially, uh, posting this problem and answering this problem means we're looking at the limitations of these, um, these um, the two properties of the compressors that the field has come down to, right? So, and we did the lower bound, which means we constructed constructed a, a, a counterexample. Um, and for that counterexample, this is the best you can do, no matter which algorithm you use. So let me read it. Uh, for the uh, smoothness and objective error, you no know, fixed objective error and smoothness, use at least two servers and fix the gradient on uh, variance, fix the uh, unbiased compressor variance, and do at least this number of iterations. Then I can come up with um, a set of loss functions, uh, some gradients to get gradient oracles, a compressor that satisfy from the uh, the satisfy from, satisfy the property unbiased property, such that no matter which algorithm you choose, the error has to be at least in this order. And there are two terms. This is transient. Uh, this is the uh, linear speed up kind of uh, um, approach. Uh, to convince you that this term, it does make sense, um, we reduce it to even one workstation and no stochasticity, uh, actually no compression, uh, with only stochasticity. And it matches lower bound in the non-convex stochastic optimization community. When we also kicks out stochasticity of gradient samples, uh, it recovers the deterministic non-convex optimization. So this bound at least could give you some confidence. We also have a bound basically says, hey, if you do bidirectional, uh, not just compress the upload, but also compress download. So this serum is unidirectional, now this bidirectional, and you get the same bound, which basically indicates that well, if this bound is tight, you doing bidirectional, you compress both ways, can do just as good as unidirectional. So you should do bidirectional compression. And we did the same for the other um, class of compressors, which is the comp contractive compressors, and get similar bounds. Um, well, so how, how far is these bounds from the existing algorithms? What, the, what people have um, proved for the existing algorithm. There's a gap. Um, <clears throat> the, the gap is, well, the, the gap can be huge. And um, if you look at the transitional complexity, which is how you, which is a T, basically T equalize the terms, you see a huge difference. There are in N cubed, where our lower bound is in, in linear in N, and there are have like higher order on um, these um, variants of the, uh, the contractive, uh, contractive compressors. And we, we have much lower order. So, we, so our bounds is much smaller. So it could be two, could go two ways. Either our bounds are too loose, too small, or their upper bounds are too, are, 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 are too high. So we went out try to create our own algorithm, try to achieve those bounds, and we nearly achieved it uh, with, some, with some log factors. And we achieved it with a, a, a simple uh, but new compression, compression strategy. Um, I, I don't think I really have the time to, um, I maybe, maybe, maybe I have, do have some minutes to, to explain the compression. So suppose this is the stochastic gradient you want to you want you want to send to the server. What you do is so take any compressor from that satisfying those properties, and this is how you should use that compressor. We're not designing compressor; we're using compressor property. First of all, you should do iterative compressions. To so you keep comp compressing the residuals, 
and then uh, and keep track of the residuals. And we use V um, to, uh, to denote the residual and uh, to actually to denote the initial vector. So initially this V is zero and uh, we, we subtract. So this is a residual, this is what we want to send, this is a residual and we compress it. You know, C is you know, containing some information from V. We send C to the receiver, for example, the, uh, the, 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 the workstation, the, the parameter server. And then we keep track of what has not been sent out. Uh, we actually, sorry, we tr keep track of what has been sent out. And then we keep compress the residual because this is the, what we want to send out, what we have sent out is residual. So you should iteratively compress the residual. Okay. Um, then if you do this, because you keep compressing the residual, there you have a geometric decrease in the uh, contractiveness. Uh, that's very easy to understand. And then how you should use the compressor in the algorithm. We do something clear to, uh, very similar to something called double squeeze, an algorithm that came up with, uh, that, that somebody can come up with three years ago. Um, and we made modifications. So this is roughly speaking double squeeze. Double squeeze, you compress, first of all, both, both ways. You compress the workstation to server. You also compress the server, server server's broadcast. Okay. And we did two changes. First, we replaced the single you know, one-time compressor by our iterative compressor. So we compress the residuals. Um, and then R can, you can design you know, how many times you, you keep compressing um, based on your, your accuracy. And then we also um, accumulate our batch gradient. So these are the two, two changes. Once you do these changes, um, um, then you can basically prove um, under a additional assumption, under additional assumption that's the, uh, the individual gradients have a bounded difference to, to the total gradient. Um, so this, this is essentially a heterogeneity um, and boundedness. Under this assumption, we show the same bound, except there's a tilde. Tilde means there's a logarithmic factor, actor logarithmic factor. Okay. Um, and so you match, you, you, you compare this upper bound to the uh, counter example given the lower bounds and they match. Uh, they match exactly with the same order and with all the terms. Um, so which means uh, we nearly match the lower bound. Which also mean, uh, well, if you look at this algorithm, this algorithm can actually work with any compressor that satisfies either the contractive assumption or the unbiasedness compression assumption. So it basically means if you only use those two compressor properties, this is the best you can get, at least almost so. You might be able to get rid of the uh, uh, this extra assumption. You might be able to get rid of the uh, after log factor, um, but you won't be able to significantly improve over this bound, which also means people should stop um, thinking of spending time in thinking how to com combine compressors with algorithm. They should start think about compressors themselves. They should, should design compressors use additional structures in the signals. Okay, so this is what this mean, what this what, what our work mean. Um, so if you put look at this table, uh, theorem three and four about this new algorithm we came up with, um, and then it does have much better convergence rate than what the existing algorithm have. And by the way, we're not claiming our algorithm have the best actual performance. We're not claiming that, but th this algorithm did our purpose. Um, this algorithm did show that. Theoretically, it matched the lower bound, so it cannot be too bad. So indeed, we did the numerical experiments, but first on these squares and then on logistic regression, and later on on, on deep learning. Uh, we, uh, during training, we look at how the results uh, decrease, and then we're, we match it the best. We even match the parallel SGD, which has no compression. Um, so in terms of number of iterations and number of rounds of training needed, it matches the best. It's slightly better than 
um, some recent uh, other like two or three year old uh, algorithms. And then we also did image classification on uh, CIFAR 10. Um, this is uh, deep learning. Uh, we look at now look at the uh, test accuracy. And then, uh, we have the best test accuracy, but not by much. I mean, it's a small increase, uh, improve. And then this is the, uh, you know, as training progresses, uh, this is the uh, evaluation of top one accuracy on the test set. Um, initially, we're not the best, but you know, as the training stabilizes and you zoom in, you find out oh, we're slightly better than the, than the others. Um, we, did, uh, we did additional tests and we did, you know, different, different quantization, uh, the best. We also um, then did a different uh, sparsity and we still, you know, does really well. Yeah. So uh, let me conclude. Um, I'm almost uh, I'm running towards 40 minutes. And so compression, first of all, is very important. Um, it saves you training time, save you cost of training, and can actually allow you to scale up, scale up, and therefore get better solutions. So it's very important. And we step the lower bound for both um, unidirectional and bidirectional, and for both um, type of compression properties that people have used in the uh, recent literature. And the lower bound is nearly matched by an algorithm, uh, which means, well, uh, in order to improve, to further improve uh, algorithmic performance, training performance, we have to explore new compressor properties. And, um, and we, uh, think these new compressors are not going to be totally new, but probably some modification of the existing compressors by looking at additional properties that people have not noticed. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. And, and this is the recent work we posted online and has been submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Overhaul, for the nice presentation. And uh, we welcome questions from in-person and the virtual audience. Any questions? Uh, yeah, maybe you can come here uh, to ask questions. Hi, I'm Tom. Great work. So um, the compression is very impressive, but I guess I had a question about decentralized, like uh, better learning. You, you presented that the first. So I'm wondering, how did you uh, average between your neighbors? You just got two neighbors for those green topology. Uh, is this just a simple average or something? Like, could you explain a little bit about that? Um, in this example, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, every node will receive information from one other neighbor. Um, and when they receive a neighbor, they have with its own number. So this is like a half, half averaging. Um, except at different iterations, you're gonna have different neighbors. Yeah, and I just wanna, okay. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead, it's, it's always happy. Okay, yeah, I just wondering uh, if that is the case, like it's the simple average, will the neighbors get converged into the uniform distribution since it's like, I mean, it's not doubling um, the um, Okay, so uh, in this paper, we have two versions. One version is not doubly stochastic, which I'm, what I presented here is not doubly stochastic because of the one way, right? So you yeah. send to your right neighbor and receive from a left neighbor. And there's a different version in the paper that's doubly stochastic. Um, and both version, on um, um, both version, we can prove that um, if n, the total number of nodes, is a power of two, let's say p's power of two, and then if the input does not change, if you just want to do a global one global consensus, then exactly p iterations you're going to get that global consensus. And then we also prove that um, if you embed this iteration together with an algorithm where what you wanna uh, reach consensus on change over time. And then at least on SGD, there's a proof, convergence proof. Yeah. Okay, got it, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question.
So, uh, Alan from UT Austin, I want to know for these types of uh, networks that are shown here for different iterations, are these the only ones uh, possible? Uh, or uh, no. what are the, how can you obtain other types of networks? Okay, so one other approach is, um, uh, is suppose you, you come up with, an, um, suppose you, you know, for, there's, first of all, there need, really there are needs for other type of networks. Uh, when n is not power of two, that's one, one case. And number two, when the underlying graph is not the communication topology, is not a complete graph. So it may have restrictions on who you can communicate with. Then a simple approach is actually to, to, to do this, something called expander graph, randomly use, in certain way, randomly sample a sparse graph. Um, and then you randomly pick out the one, one neighbor. There's a certain way you first get a random graph, and then you can, you can get like one peer random, a sequence of one, one peer random graph out of that. And you can still prove uh, things, but that's just more, way more complicated proof, but that can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's also a great question. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, another question for the upper and lower bound part. Uh, I noticed that in the upper bound of proof, uh, you add a, another uh, assumption on the hydrogenated with the difference between the local gradient and average gradient, but the, the lower bound does not leverage that, that assumption. Right? Yeah, that's exactly true. Um, and that's our proof, that's our the deficiency of a proof technique. Uh, we think, um, and the log, there's missing also a log. Uh, the log is not a deficiency of proof technique. Um, so but this is assumption. Is it possible that lower, lower bound can also leverage this uh, assumption on the bounded hydrogenation? Mm, we have not thought about that. Um, Basically, we need to incorporate this into our function class, um, but we haven't. Uh, and you have a sharp eye <laughs> to capture that. Yes, okay, yeah. So um, any other questions? No? Uh, if no other questions, let's thank Awata again for a nice presentation. Thank you all. Yes, and then we will move on to our poster session. So um, for audience who are in person, you can uh, using your uh, phone to uh, scan this QR code so that you can enter the gather time. And our poster session will be uh, during the 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So uh, we will uh, conclude our uh, in-person uh, sessions right now, and we will switch to the virtual um, poster sessions. And see you there in the gather time. Thank you. I want to see the QR code. Okay. Thank you, Wotov. I will uh, log out and uh, move to the virtual poster session.